speak, the presentation that I gave at the uh, Free Your Mind 2 conference. I'm going to give it here extended, in-depth, with slides, and I hope everyone uh, enjoys it and really understands that the New Age movement is something that works hand-in-hand hand with the control system. It is, in fact, simply another religion. And, you know, I get, uh, as a lead into this, I just get very, very, uh, I just have to laugh hysterically. You know, when people say, I'm a New Ager, I'm, I'm propagating New Age thought. Nothing could be farther from the truth. I've attacked the New Age movement, I think, on day one on this podcast and radio show. Um, uh, I've never been into the New Age movement, ever. Okay? I recognized quite early that it was a deception because it wasn't telling people about the control that is going on in the world and then propagating this ridiculous notion that if you understand that, pay attention to what's going on in the world, you're only going to get more control which is nonsense. This is to dissuade people from speaking to other people about what's really going on. And all the New Agers who believe this nonsense version of the Law of Attraction are doing everybody a total disservice in this world. So let me just start leading into this presentation with that statement. And if anybody thinks that I am a New Ager, uh, again, I'll just, go, I'll just say there's something wrong with your brain. Because you're not paying attention or listening to a word I've said over 143 podcasts. Or in any of my videos. And if that's what you think, you're a very, very dumb person. Because I've attacked the New Age movement relentlessly, actually. And there's a reason for that. It's because this is part of the polarization dialectic. And that's what I'm going to get into in this presentation. So... Let's, let's go, let's start, okay? This was originally given on April 27th, 2013, Saturday, April 27th, at the Free Your Mind 2 conference in Philadelphia. Um, all of the videos are still being worked on. Our, our video editor, Chris, is doing a great job with all that material, and we will be releasing the videos shortly. Please be patient. We want to do a good job on it. Um, so they will be forthcoming soon at what on, at um, I'm sorry, um, freeyourmindconference.com, the conference's website. So the title of this presentation was "New Age Bullshit and the Suppression of the Sacred Masculine." New Age Bullshit and the Suppression of the Sacred Masculine. I put the term new in quotes. So let me just explain that. Most of the places in the slides, you're going to see the word new in quotes. And there's a reason for this. There's nothing new about the New Age movement. This is a very old tactic. It's a very old religion. It's there for a reason. And it's very old. It's an ancient agenda. This is... One side of the dialectic, it's controlled opposition. It's something that is there to lean on the other side of the dialectic, which is the control system, and therefore provide a strong power structure like an arch so that people have a very hard time toppling that power structure over because you're putting certain people in left-brained imbalance and you're putting other people in right-brained imbalance. And you're trying to keep that polarization dialectic in place, which I call the mental schism. So let's get into this, okay? And I'll, I'll try to be observant about slide numbers, okay? There are 134 slides, individual slides in this presentation, all right? So slide number one is simply two people meditating, uh, you know, in a lotus position, which is kind of... Uh, you know, a poster, they're poster children for the New Age movement, thinking that's how you're going to create change in the world. Um, you know, again, the New Age suppresses the masculine. The masculine aspect is action. And just like religion, they want to tell you that action isn't required. Taking positive action in the world isn't required. We're just going to make just internal change and not do anything to influence change in other people. That's why so many New Agers just believe, I just have to worry about myself. 
You know, it's it's spiritual egotism. And people can't see it. It's the same thing as saying, well, I just need to worry about my physical needs. And I just need to worry about myself. Do I have a job? Do I have clothing? Do I have shelter? Do I have food? And, and, and screw everybody else. Well, this is the same thing on the spiritual level. I just got to know that I understand spirituality and then screw anybody else that doesn't get it. It's the exact same thing. It's spiritual self selfishness and spiritual egotism. And, you know... The, you know, not saying these actual people in this image, but it's possible. I'm saying this is a general archetypal image that I feel represents the New Age movement and the New Age community. That they're sitting there meditating, and don't get me wrong, I'm going to talk about meditation as something that is vital and important and can help balance the brain. So I'm not attacking meditation. Okay, I'm attacking people who think that's all that's required. I'm saying you're wrong. That's not all that's required. A lot more is required if we're going to heal the problems that are taking place in our world, in our society, than simply meditating in in a corner of your house. So slide number two was the uh, title slide with the words, uh, with the actual uh, presentation title and the information about where this was originally given. Let's move to slide number three. Slide number three shows the neocortex or the human brain, the highest part of the brain, the newest part of the brain. And we need to understand how the brain plays a vital role in consciousness. It's not where consciousness comes from. Consciousness exists regardless of whether the body exists or not. The brain is sort of the antenna for consciousness. It's sort of the um, receiver transmitter for consciousness. Through the brain, we express consciousness. A- and as we'll see, through the brain and the heart, we express consciousness. So it's a vehicle for the expression of consciousness. It is not consciousness itself. So people shouldn't get that confused in this slide because I'm talking about consciousness as being aware of patterns. The ability to recognize patterns, both within the self and in the realm in which the self operates. That's how I've always used the definition of consciousness. That's been the working definition for consciousness since day one on this podcast. So the brain is bilaterally symmetrical, the neocortex or higher brain, the human brain. It's bilaterally symmetrical. The left brain hemisphere is the intellectual part of the brain or what we would call the masculine hemisphere. And I put the symbol of the upright pointing triangle, which in the ancient world was known as the blade. Okay, It represents a blade or a phallic symbol representing the masculine in the upright pointed direction. Very simple archetypal symbol. The left hemisphere of the brain largely, and again, that neuroscience is a lot more complicated than this very oversimplified model that I'm presenting. This is a, it's this is called a model that is true enough. It's, it's a little neuroscience is a little bit more complicated than what I'm talking about here. But in general terms, the left side of the brain makes possible logical thought, analytical thought, scientific thought, and math, mathematical thought. Okay? Linear thought, linear progression, physical tasks and activities, logic. We're not talking about super big picture theory, uh, uh, big picture thinking and uniting patterns. We're talking about laser-like focus, concentration, logical thought, language, math, science. That's what the left side of the brain generally governs and makes possible in a human being. And that is what we would call the intellect. That is the intellect. Now notice that I didn't say that that's intelligence because I'm going to make the distinction between intellect and intelligence in a moment. Let's look at the right side of the brain, the neocortex. And again, this is review for those who have listened to this show. But again, I want to put on record and go into depth and make an extended version of this podcast because 
I have the forum to do this, uh, 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 this presentation, because I have the forum to do this in the form of this podcast. So again, I'm going to take my time and I'm going to go through this material and it'll take as long as it takes. So the right side of the brain, the right brain hemisphere, is the intuitive or feminine part of the brain. And I have it depicted here in blue with a symbol known as, in the ancient world, the chalice. This is an ancient archetypal symbol of the feminine womb. It was called the chalice. All right? So, you know, people have called it the grail because it's largely what is lost and not being actively used properly. It's been usurped. It's been taken over. It's been directed in wrong ways. We really get in touch with the true aspect of the sacred feminine, then we're going to understand what needs to be done. We're going to understand that action is required, and then we're going to work together with the left brain hemisphere to actually take that action and do what is required to reverse the trend that we're seeing take place all around us. So the right hemisphere largely governs create creative thought, creativity, artistic tendencies, Okay, holistic thought, being able to see big picture, the big picture, patterns, really coming into awareness of patterns that are taking place, especially historical patterns as well. It's about compassion, nurturing, respect for other people, understanding what rights are, Extending rights and freedom to other people, not intruding on them. Because you have compassion and you want people's rights to be respected. So all forms of compassion, nurturing, moral understanding is largely governed by the right brain. And really, to be honest, that's governed by the prefrontal neocortex on both sides, right behind the forehead. It's often why people depicted the third eye being the spiritual center of the being right on the forehead. And again, people say, well, it's the pineal gland. It is the neocortex, the prefrontal cortex at the level of the pineal gland because the eye within the pineal gland activates when we balance these two brain hemispheres, comes online and truly activates the prefrontal cortex, which is where that's the moral center of the brain. That's where morality is processed. So the ancients were depicting things that they knew about the brain symbolically. When the chalice and blade come together, they form the blazing star the seal of Solomon, the sun and the moon, because the left side of the brain is the sun, the masculine. The right side of the brain is the moon, the feminine. You put them together, it becomes the temple of Solomon, sun and moon together, sol, mon, sun, moon. That's the awakening of the third eye, because now the brain is communicating across the corpus callosum between the brain hemispheres, And then the prefrontal cortex is truly electrified and awoken. And that's where morality is born. That's where the true objective knowledge of right and wrong is integrated and processed into the being. So let's move on to the next slide. What controllers want, any form of a controller, that understand that this is how conscience is born through a balanced brain, what they want is to keep people in schism, in a mental schism. And this is also a a spiritual schism. It's a schism with the heart. It's a mental, emotional, psychological, spiritual schism. And a physical one, because the two hemispheres of the brain aren't operating together as they should. So it's a schism on all levels. It's polarity on all levels. This is slide number four. I simply referred to it here as the mental schism, but again, we need to understand it's mental, psychological, physical, emotional, and spiritual. But for simplistic purposes on a slide, I wrote the mental schism because it largely does relate to the brain. 
As the brain goes, the whole being goes. And this is why there's such an attack on us through food, through chemicals in the food, chemicals in the water, chemicals in the air. They want to destabilize the brain because that's how they keep their control system going. Healthy people with a healthy brain aren't going to be controlled because both parts of the brain, the part, the part of the brain that governs compassion and the part of the brain that deals with action, right action and self-defense are going to be working together. So you're going to have a moral person that's willing to take action even up to and necessary of defensive use of force, which is what we're going to talk about later in this presentation. So mind control works by continuously dividing these two parts of the brain, all the qualities that are, that are active in these two parts of the brain, trying to keep them walled off and separate from each other and not coming together as one. So you want to keep either or both parts of the brain in chronic imbalanced in a chronic imbalanced state so when the left side of the brain is chronically overused and we're not using any of the functions of the right side of the brain chronic left brain imbalance which is continuously engaging in intellect only tasks and activities and functions okay it will lead to certain conditions and before i get into that i just want to say true intelligence is born from uniting the, these two hemispheres because we have the intellect which is the intel part intella part of intelligence and then g e n c e comes from genere in latin meaning to create that's the creative side of the brain so when People think, oh, scientists and doctors and lawyers are so intelligent. No, they're intellectual, maybe. They can process large amounts of, of data and, fa and so-called facts and figures and things like that. They could do math well, verbal arguments and things like that, but they're not really intelligent. They don't have true intelligence. It comes from intellect and gents, the creative aspect of the mind the artistic, the nurturing, the compassionate side of the brain, which many of those people do not have developed. And therefore, they don't really know the difference between right and wrong. When we put them together, that's when we develop true intelligence. So a dominator, a controller, one who is at the helm of the control system, of course, wants a polarization effect. They want people imbalanced toward one brain hemisphere or another. I call this polarization dialectics. Okay, you're keeping things apart. You're creating that arch structure that is very hard to break down because you have some people here who are on the left side dominant and they're becoming like controllers and then you have the other side that is right side dominant and they're they're exercising slave think they're going into slave think thinking that uh, uh, the, this control system can never be brought down or we deserve this etc you know and just thinking like a slave who believes that he's the rightful property of the master would think so that's how the perpetuation of the control system works you keep one aspect of the population in left brain imbalance and they become control freaks and secondary psychopaths. And then you can keep the other side in right brain imbalance. So let's talk about what these states of imbalance look like. The intellect, the masculine side of the brain, the left brain hemisphere, if it's continuously engaged and the right side of the brain is not engaged, when you're in chronic left brained imbalance, this will lead to things like rigid skepticism. Okay, not, not real science, but just out of control, rigid skepticism that becomes like a, a religion. Okay, you're not willing to look at the evidence even. You have a, actually have a belief system because this is the protocol. This fits in with what, you know, the scientific community is saying is possible, even if there's evidence to the contrary. So rigid skepticism. Scientism. Again, this is science as a religion. I like Rupert Sheldrake's talk about this and the book that he's written about science acting as a religion in the modern day. It's no, no, no different for all the people who worship science, you know. And again, I realize this information pisses off everybody because most people are in one of these states of brain balance, imbalance or another. 
the people who worship science and think it's the, it's the be all end all, you know, they're in a form of left brain imbalance. The people who you know are all super religious and think that they their religion is the, is the totality of the truth, they're in right brain imbalance. This has nothing to do with science or religion. This has to do with truth about what is and what is going on within us and around us. And that's not, that can be known. And that's the knowledge that's worth pursuing. That's the knowledge that is most worth pursuing. Knowledge of self and knowledge of what is taking place in this, the, the realm in which the self operates. If we don't know that, we don't know anything. All other pursuits of knowledge are secondary to that. Not to say that they're not worth pursuing at all. I'm saying knowledge of self and the universe are worth pursuing first. And the knowledge of self has to come first. And understanding the brain and how it operates, the general ways that it operates, you know, you can get lost in the details and the specifics because there's so much about the brain we do know and don't know, more about it that we don't know. And I'm going to get into this in future shows. I promise people I'll be getting into the origins of humanity, the origins of the control system, the origins of evil, the origins of psychopathy, and you know, telling that horror story. And a lot of people aren't going to like that. And it's, it's, it's going to maybe even shut some people down. But I've prepared the way with all these 140 some odd podcasts and now it's time to start speculating a bit about what may have led to the cause, cause of this human condition that we're in. This sick condition. Because until you can acknowledge the condition, you know, many people are not even ready to hear what the causal factors may have been. Because of what it's going to force us to reevaluate our entire belief system about what happened here in the ancient past. And what has traumatized us to the extent that we are traumatized that we can't seem to get out of this condition. We have to bring that trauma to the surface and that has to be done by looking without fear into what may very well have occurred here. So back to the slides. The, these polarization dialectics or mind control techniques work by keeping people in one form of brain imbalance or another. So continuing with what the intellect out of control leads to, rigid skepticism, scientism, science as a religion, atheism. And again, what I'm talking about here is just thinking that man is the highest power in creation. If you want to really boil it down, that's all atheism is. You know, there, it's a belief system that there's nothing other than man. That we're the, be- the best and brightest, we're, we're the highest source of intelligence in all of creation. And atheists don't believe in natural law. And there's nothing to believe in in natural law. They, they reject that notion that there is an intelligent guiding force that not only created the universe, but is actually governing the decisions that, that we're being given the result of of the free will choices that we make by this dynamic, governing, intelligent, creative force. They they don't want to accept that. You know, because man could just do whatever he wants unchallenged. And right and wrong are just constructs of man's mind. You know? And it's it's sick. It's sick thinking. It's totally left brain imbalanced. Someone who thinks like that is ill. They may not know that they're ill, but they're ill. You know, there's a force that sets the galaxies in motions, in motion. There's a force that sets the planets and the stars in motion. That force is the same force that ultimately governs the consequences of behavior. That, that people think they're separate from those laws? That there's laws governing everything that's operating in creation except them? Everything else is governed by law, except man. You know, man can make up whatever he wants whether it's right or wrong, do it, there's no consequences. Good luck with that. And this is what many atheists think. I'm not telling you to go believe in some religious god. What I consider as the creative force is something so infinitely more complex and majestic and intelligent and creative and powerful than anything that any religion has ever spoken of that, that concept that I hold in my mind, that what religions have brought it down into is an insult to that force. 
And make no mistake about it, no man or group of men is it. We may be a tiny, infinitesimally tiny part of it. That's not to say that we're not an important part of it, but, uh, you know, basically what atheists are claiming is that man is the authority. You know, that, that there's no higher power that's governing what we're doing here. Well, I think that's extreme short-sightedness, it's arrogance, it's ego run unchecked, which is what the left brain is all about. And when we engage in these chronically left-brained dominant ideologies that have no bearing in truth, it leads to authoritarianism. Because if there's no higher power than man, then hey, man can do whatever he wants. We can get to make up morality, that's a construct of man that doesn't exist in nature, you know. That's what people, most people think. You just do that experiment. Go ask people, is there such a thing as objective right and wrong that exists in nature? Or just ask them, they don't even understand what the word objective means. Just say, if all humans suddenly disappeared from existence, there was no earth, let's say. The earth just vanished along with everybody on it. And there was nothing where, where the third planet from our sun and our solar system was in a, in a flash, in an instant. Would right and wrong still exist? Most people will tell you no. That it's dependent on man. They'll actually, they actually believe that. And this concept more of moral relativism is what has led to the current police state. And this is what people have to understand. They need to understand it. If they want to get out of the police state. For some reason, people seem to love being kept pets. You know, they want a police state. That's the most amazing thing about this whole thing is that people actually want to be free. Well, get, don't want to be free. They actually want to be enslaved. Well, guess what? That's all well and great. But please take that somewhere else because there are people here that do want to be free and you have no right. You have no right in your ignorance to be allowing this police state to come on unchecked and therefore putting people that don't want to be in that cage with you in there with you. Make no mistake, you have no such right. You have no such right. People who think, oh, people have the right to think anything they want, including that slavery is okay. Absolutely wrong. You have a right to think anything you want as long as you're not advocating that other people have violence done to them and be held in slavery. Once your thoughts go there, you have no right to think that. And I'll tell you what, there are people who will openly come out and admit, I don't care if there's slavery. I'll do nothing. Members of my own family admit this. And seem to be proud of it, wearing it like a, a badge of honor. See the police state coming on and say, I don't care. And these people have children. They have grandchildren. And, and people don't think people are sick, that this is an illness. That this is an illness born of total imbalance of the brain and the heart? We need to understand it's an illness. So that's what happens if the left side of the brain is in balance. Let's move to the right side of the brain. Okay? The feminine side of the brain, the intuitive part of the brain, the creative part, what happens when it becomes chronically dominant? chronically imbalanced. We're constantly using those aspects of the brain, but we're not exercising the left brain. We're not thinking logically. We're not looking into truth discovery methods, of which the scientific method is perfectly a valid one. You know, we want to just let other people do whatever they want, never challenge them. You know, never openly say, hey, what you're doing is wrong. You have no right to do this. Not standing up for ourselves, not standing up for our rights. Believing in anything. Any new age mumbo jumbo that comes down to pike, I believe it and I start trying to practice it. You know, this is all forms of right brain imbalance. So this state of right brained hemispherical imbalance can lead to total naivete. You're not streetwise. Okay? being very naive like a child. And that's what the, the whole nanny state control system wants. They want people who think like a child and treat other people like children. 
You know, when, when the left brain's dominant, it causes people to become like masters, thinking that they're somebody's pa parental figure. When the right brain's in balance, it causes people to act like child, children, thinking that they're someone's property or, or ward, you know? Blind belief can be brought on by chronic right hemispherical imbalance. People will believe anything. Religious extremism. You know, the whole religious worldview is largely born in the right brain. And, you know, part of this is thinking that God is controlling everything and there's no such thing as free will. I had somebody tell me there's no such thing as free will, that we don't have free will. I said, you're absolutely wrong. We have free will. We just don't have free will without consequence. You have to exercise free will, choose, make a choice, and then act. And if you chose the right action, then the consequence will not be suffering. If you chose the wrong action because you didn't know the difference between right and wrong, the consequence will be suffering. That's how natural law works. Natural law is the deterministic component of creation. Like gravity, it's, de it's determined. It's operating. You're not going to stop it from operating. You're bound by it. Doesn't matter whether you believe it or not. Doesn't matter whether you know about it or not. It's very cold and impersonal. Natural law doesn't care about you. People want to think that the boundary conditions of this universe is so are so loving and caring. They're not. They're impersonal forces that the Creator set into motion and then doesn't interfere with because they're the perfect boundary conditions for the, the acceleration of our evolutionary development once we recognize that they exist and that we are bound by them. They're not prison conditions. They are there to help and guide us. The boundary conditions called natural law that are existent in the universe. Though, though That's the deterministic aspect of creation. This war between determinism and randomness is also dialectics. Both are present. Again, I talked about this on day one, or, or the second show. The deterministic component of creation is natural law. The randomness aspect of creation is free will, which we are gifted with. Because the Creator does not interfere with our choices. We have free will to act how we will. But, it is governed by the deterministic aspect of creation called natural law which is the governing dynamic of behavior. Again, the, the people who are so naive don't think that there's free will, and they, they don't think that there's natural law. As if everything else in creation is going to have governing principles to, to set it into motion and guide it, except human behavior. That's completely, um, you know, uh, not affected by, by law. That's exempt. So this religious extremism as part of right hemispherical imbalance you know, uh, comes largely from this determinism that people believe in. That, oh, God controls every aspect of creation including free will and free will is an illusion. No, free will is not an illusion. People who want to think that want to give away personal responsibility to choose right action over wrong action. And therefore, they want to say, I don't have free will. You have it, just like you have an arm, a heart, a head, whatever. It's yours. You, 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 know, you, you can't pull your heart out of your body and still live. It's yours forever. You can't take your brain out of your head and still live. So you can't give away your personal responsibility. You can't take that away from yourself. Uh, it's an illusion to think that you can. It's yours and you're stuck with it. Get over it. Grow up. And this is the problem, that, that people actually believe these things. They actually believe that there's no free will or that there's no natural law. The people in super left brain imbalance don't believe that there's any such thing as natural law. The people in super right brain imbalance don't believe there's any such thing as free will. And these things play off against each other. You have people like Stephen Hawking in such left brain imbalance thinking that he's intelligent. He doesn't have a drop of intelligence. Not a drop. 
Stephen Hawking is a super intellectual, maybe far beyond anybody else in the world, but he has not a lick of common sense or, or real intelligence. Not a lick. And I'd tell that to Stephen Hawking's face. The book he just wrote, talking about in the very first chapter that there's no such thing as free will. That free will is dead like God is dead. I mean, you got to be joking. And people look up to this guy and think he's intelligent, that he's smart. Not a drop of intelligence. You got no common sense there, Stevie boy. None. I don't care how intellectual you are. That's not what intelligence is. You don't understand how it works and you think you do. Because you are a worship, a worshiper at the altar of scientism and the primacy of matter. Hey, we'll look deeper into the core of the atom, the nucleus of the atom, and we'll find all the secrets of the universe. Good luck with that, Steve. Enjoy what you get. Because you're not looking into the place that's the only place you're ever going to find that answer and that's the human soul. So, continuing with what right brain imbalance is, is it leads to slave think. When you're in this state of mind, naive, like a child, believing anything, okay, you are apt to accept all kinds of erroneous claims by dominators and controllers. And therefore, you will go into the state where you don't exercise your free will, where you don't exercise your rights, and you just accept, 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 accept. And this is key to this whole presentation, is understanding this part of the brain, the imbalance generated by the right brain. When you're chronically in the right brain and never are engaging left brain functions, you'll never stand up for yourself. You will accept slavery. And this is what the New Age is all about, which is why I say I find the New Age movement infinitely more dangerous than Satanism. When people are reeled in by Levian Satanism or Satanism a la the Temple of Set and other schools of ideology such as that, it's dangerous. It's a very dangerous ideology. But let me tell you something. At least Satanists don't think that they're slaves. They, they want to be the masters. You know, not that I'm saying that's right either, but I'm telling you, if everybody thought like that, that we're all masters and we're all kings and we, I don't want my rights trounced on, um, the world might get a little bit ugly, but um, it wouldn't be as bad as having the super form of right brain imbalance when you won't stand up for your rights or even think you have any. You know, I'll, I'll take I'll take people who believe in Satanism in the modern day, the the, the mini me version of Satanism as I call it, not the, the super elites, you know, Satanism and Luciferianism. I'm talking about people who buy into the uh, the um, interface at the ground level, at the level of the public that is called Satanism. The recruit the recruitment system. I'll take those people any day over the New Age movement. And what the, what the New Age movement doesn't understand is this is put, their religion is put into effect at a higher level by the Luciferians that are ultimately controlling the whole planet. They're the ones who are putting these erroneous notions about the laws of attraction and natural law and spirituality into the world so that real spirituality will never actually be fostered. And therefore, their power structure will never be challenged because they're holding people in right brain imbalance by propagating this new religion, this quote-unquote new religion. There's nothing new about it at all. It's a, it's a eons-long strategy. And they've been doing it for thousands and thousands of years. Putting people into right brain imbalance through religion. And this is just the new world religion. That's it. The old religions aren't working anymore. They need to come up with something new. That's all the New Age movement is. Hence, quote-unquote, new. Because it's just another religion. And religion means to buy or to tie, tie up, tie out of the way, hold back, thwart from forward progress. We'll get into that in a moment. Let's move on to the next slide. When, when these two parts of the brain come together, 
That's what this slide was about. That's when the true all-seeing eye is ignited. The blazing star, the all-seeing eye, the true spark of the divine within us. That's born of true intelligence and conscience. The heart uniting with the mind. The mind, intelligence, the heart, conscience. This is bringing all of these different aspects of the human together as whole, as a whole. We're not divided anymore. Becoming a true individual means you're, you're, you're whole, individuated, non-divided, not separate. You become one with your self, with the higher aspect of the self. And only when we do that are we truly activating the heart as well. So I don't want people to think this is just about the brain either. This is about activating care within yourself. What you care about, what you pay attention to. And that does feed into the law of attraction. Not the way a lot of people think it does though. Let's look at slide number, that was slide number five. Okay, slide number six. Again, Simply explaining more about mind control via brain imbalance, let's look at the other structures of the brain. We're talking about the neocortex, which is supposed to be the executive command function of the brain. It's supposed to be the command center of the brain. This is where we're supposed to be guiding our actions from. When there's a specific form of brain imbalance, one of the other two complexes within the brain exerts what you could probably just simplify and call executive control. In other words, this other complex within the brain sort of takes over and becomes the ruler of the individual. When in fact, it's not supposed to be acting in that capacity. It's supposed to be acting when it's needed, okay? And it's supposed to be in balance. These two other parts of the brain are supposed to be in balance with each other. And when, when one side of the neocortex goes into a form of chronic imbalance, we'll see, as we'll see, one of these other parts of the brain become chronically dominant uh, among the whole triune part of the brain, the whole triune complexes within the brain. So these three complexes are the human brain, the mammal brain, and the reptile brain. And all of them are important. None of them should be downplayed. They're all necessary for our growth and development and interaction here in the physical form. This is what we need to understand. It's not about destroying any parts of these complexes of the brain. It's about using them in their proper aspect, in their proper role. And again, this is the temple, the so-called Temple of Solomon. That's why you always see three stages to any initiatory mystery traditions. It's a reflection of these three parts. It's a reflection of the three components of consciousness, thought, emotion, and action. Thought. Governed in the, the higher order thinking of the human brain. Emotions. Largely governed in the limbic system. The mammal brain. The mammalian brain. And then action. Movement. Survival instinct. Governed by the R complex. All necessary components to function and to express consciousness. None of them should be the, the two lower parts of the brain should not be chronically dominant. So let's explain how they become chronically dominant. They're there to perform a vital function, but they're not to rule the house. The house needs to be ruled by the human brain in a state of balance. The higher brain, the neocortical brain, or what is actually really known as the telencephalon. But that's the whole gray matter part of the brain up on top. The neocortex is actually the outer area in which neural activity largely takes place. So when the left side of the brain is in a state of chronic imbalance, what happens is the limbic brain, the mammalian brain, the brain that governs emotions is shut down. That's why a dominator doesn't have any compassion or emotions. The part of the brain that actually sends out the chemicals and the neuropeptides that help us to experience emotion in the physiology is not working properly. It is basically largely shut down. It becomes suppressed. So chronic left brain or masculine dominance creates suppression of emotion 
and eventually roots us into the reptile brain. The executive command function center of the brain stops being the higher brain. It stops being the the human brain or the neocortex and those command functions get rerouted. And now we're being ruled by the R complex or the reptile brain. That's what a dominator becomes like, a reptile. Instinct, action only, survival, my way, hoarding, authority. I'm going to take what I want because I can. I'm going to do what I want to you because I can. This is somebody who's sick in the left brain. They're trapped in the left brain. They've been firewalled off from the other half of themselves, the sacred feminine component. They've been cut off from their emotional qualities because the actual limbic brain is damaged. It's not functioning electrically properly. It's like a computer that part of the logic board is broken. It's not going to function properly. These people are ill. They're sick. They literally have brain damage. I'm not saying that physic I'm not saying that metaphorically. It's physical brain damage that is provable. So what happens in the opposite instance? What if the cr- the right brain hemisphere is chronically dominant? What happens in these three major structures within the brain, these three complexes? Again, this is a very simplified model. The brain's actual operation is a bit more comp- a lot more complex than this. But in general, this holds true. I'm not telling you this is all there is to know about neuroscience. I'm telling you this is the most important thing to know about neuroscience because it generally gets the picture of how the brain operates in a big way to people. And yes, this does hold true and this is how the the qualities of the brain function together with each other. <clears throat> when the right hemisphere is chronically dominant, the opposite happens. Okay? The, the, the same thing happens in the sense that the neocortex stops acting as the executive command functions of the brain, the command center of the brain, as it is intended to be when it is in a state of balance. When the right brain hemisphere is chronically imbalanced and that's where you know the only functions that we're using and we're not using the left brain the the r complex loses its power that's what becomes suppressed so the survival instinct is suppressed the person won't stand up for themselves or their rights and the kind of executive function of the brain gets shunted to the limbic brain or the emotional part of the brain and this person becomes ruled by fear They become ruled by their emotions. It's the kind of person who will take offense to everything you tell them, try to tell them. It's the kind of person who gets scared real easily at the first thing that they hear that's unpleasant. The person that doesn't want to look at unpleasantries taking place in the world. They think that by ignoring them or putting their head in the sand, somehow that's magically going to go away. They bought the new age, total new age bullshit notion that, um, you know, by by paying attention to something and becoming aware of its existence, you're somehow magically giving it power over you. Which is total nonsense and could not be further from the truth. So the chronic right-brained dominance, the feminine side of the brain, creates the suppression of our survival instinct. And it eventually roots us in the mammalian brain in which we are ruled by our emotions. And you'll notice, if we're ruled in either one of these other centers, these other complexes of the brain, either the reptile complex or the limbic brain, what are you largely incapable of doing? Thinking clearly with the higher part of the brain that governs higher order thinking. So you're never going to understand patterns that are taking place. You're not going to know what's going on within you because part of you is broken and needs healing that you can't even see physically. It's not a physical injury, but it's, it is a physical injury. It's not a physical injury that's easily seen because it's inside the head, in the brain. 
And because people know nothing about how the brain works, they don't understand the majority of people are walking around with brain damage. And I'm not saying that metaphorically or symbolically. I'm saying that very literally. So we don't want to be ruled by either part of the brain because when the left brain is chronically dominant, the person becomes somebody who thinks that they're a master of other people. I call this master think. When the right brain is chronically imbalanced, you end up with a population that won't stand up for their rights. They don't have enough self-respect. They don't care about themselves enough to say, no, this is wrong. It's not going to continue, even if it comes to the point where I have to use physical force to stop this. And that's called a willing slave, ladies and gentlemen. Somebody who will not stand up for their rights is a willing slave. I don't care why you're doing it. Whether, you know, just because you're a coward and you can't develop conscience, you're ruled by the emotional part of the brain, and you don't have any true self-respect to stand up for yourself and say no. And that's what the New Age movement is all about, making more people like that. That's why they want to propagate it as the New World Religion, because they want people in this slave-think mindset to accept slavery and to accept other people as their rightful masters. And you need to see no more evidence of this. Go to a New Age Expo. I don't care where the New Age Expo is in your area. Just go to it and ask the people there, do you think government is legitimate? The concept of government. And almost every single person will say yes because they're good little willing order following slaves. Who don't understand their sovereignty and think that they're spiritual. Think that they've come into some spiritual knowledge because they can sit in a lotus position and meditate for four hours a day. Well, that isn't real spirituality. Real spirituality deals with freedom. And anybody who is a so-called self-help person, a so-called guru, a so-called new age teacher that is not teaching people that the goal of spirituality is true freedom, sovereignty, and a balance between the brain hemispheres understanding both the non-aggression principle and the principle of self-defense is no teacher at all. They are a deceiver. They are either a dupe who has bought a deception and is now propagating it unknowingly because they're not in a place of true knowledge and you shouldn't listen to them if you have any discernment. Or they're a direct deceiver who's peddling this bullshit deliberately to try to deceive other people and turn them into people who are have slave think operating inside them of them okay so let's move to the next slide this brain imbalance toward one brain hemisphere or another this is slide number seven now is the goal and the dream of the dominators of this world of the occultists so i want to just tell you a brief story when i was involved in satanism and i was attending satanic rituals at different locations largely in Pennsylvania and Maryland some of the higher level Satanists or what you might call Luciferians I don't know if they were that high up in the hierarchy but people who were like you know whose house the ritual was at or you know friends good friends of them or people who were coming into uh, be a guest and a, 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 you know witness the activities of the grotto. We're, we're telling people that they were very influential in the publishing community for the New Age. And telling people, wait until you see the information. And I'm talking about, we're, we're talking about here the um, mid-1990s mid 1990s telling people about all the books and all the information that they were going to be publishing and peddling through the so-called new age movement and they said we're we're behind this we're doing this because it's pushing people into the form of imbalance that we want to push them into i didn't understand it at the time because i was still in their minds i was still in the mini me satanic mindset this form of Satanism that is pushed to the the uh, the public, 
Again, it's a recruiting center. It's a, it's, it's recruiting grounds for psychopaths, for people who have psychopathic tendencies, which at that time, yeah, I would admit I did have tendencies toward becoming a secondary psychopath. My brain was messed up before I was able to heal it. And they were telling some people in you know, side conversations after the ritual because somebody brought up you know, what New Asians think and believe and openly telling people we're responsible for a lot of that material. We're putting it out there. And I believe them because they said, wait until you see what will be coming out in the next few years. We are going to give people completely erroneous notions of the laws of attraction. We're going to give people completely erroneous notions of how people create their reality. Because they know how this works. They know natural law. They know how it works. See, these are people who are so hateful of the fact that natural law exists. They look at it. Their worldview is, we're in a prison because we can't do whatever we want unchecked completely. We want to be able to kill, rape, pillage, murder with no consequence to us at a soul level or even in the physical domain. No consequence. That's their goal. Their goal is we want to be God. We want to be the creator. They're trying to usurp the position of the creative force in the universe by taking down natural law and replacing it with their law. That's what the Luciferians and the Satanists are attempting to do. They want to topple natural law. And they're actually very successful and very close to being able to do that. Which is why I don't underestimate these individuals at all. And I have respect for them as an enemy. And so should everybody else. Because they're the most intellectual people walking in the world. While I wouldn't say that they have true intelligence, so few people do on either side of the, the spiritual battle. Um, they are very intellectual and very well-read individuals and they do understand natural law. They know that it's in place and how it works. And that's why they're trying to insulate themselves from the consequences because they're trying to become God. And they do that by getting other people to carry out their behavior for them. They don't actually do the action. And therefore the karmic brunt of the consequences is not theirs. Again, people need to understand who bears the brunt of moral culpability, the order giver or the order follower. Well, these Satanists, more likely than not, never actually did physical harm to someone else. They're getting other people to do that dirty work for them. And hence why they call the military and the police their dogs, because they're on the chain and following the command. They'll sit when they tell them to sit. They'll speak when they tell them to speak. Eat when they tell them to eat. Attack when they tell them to attack. Therefore, they consider them their animals, their pets. They, they're two phrases that Satanists in my presence, when I was involved with this, called the military were our pets and our dogs. That's it. Never referred to them as military men, military women. Never referred to them as the armed forces. Never. Our dogs Never said the police department, the police forces, the law enforcement officers. Never once referred to them as any of those things. They called them our dogs. Because that's what they think of people who do that, that job. They are our order following dogs. We have them well trained. And also told me, you think you're going to tell people and they're going to accept that from you? They said if we came forward and told them that we're their owners, they wouldn't accept it from us. That's how perfectly programmed they are. And they're right. They were right. I can admit when I w I'm wrong. I'm telling you, they told me exactly what the truth was. So in a way, I don't really have a lot of built up anger and resentment and hostility toward them. Okay, because they are honest about what they're doing. They're very honest. It's a lot different than a person who says, I think I'm doing the right thing. And yet they're, do they're carrying out the work of these psychopaths, these madmen. I have a lot more bitterness and resentment against those people because they have the gall and the audacity to say they're doing something that's right. And they don't know the first thing about right. 
to somebody with a totally black, sick heart that wants to do evil and is telling people the truth about how they're doing it, I actually have quite a bit more respect. As, as and, and guess what? I don't really care what you think about that. I don't care whether you think I'm wrong for thinking that way. I can respect that level of unity in consciousness. So I don't have a lot of ill will against them or want to see anything bad happen to them because they're not the ones who are doing it. <laughs> they're not the ones taking the action. The police are. They're the ones who are following these lunatics' orders because they're in a state of chronically imbalanced brain hemispherical action. They're both imbalanced in the left and the right brain because the, the police want to follow orders. That's right-brained imbalance. They're imbalanced in the right brain as well as the left. Their brain's just totally destroyed. They want to be somebody's master, but they're someone else's slave at the same time. And that's what evil really wants. They want everybody to be a master and a slave simultaneously because they just want the perpetuation of master-slave think in one form or another. They want the perpetuation of slavery. So these people told people in these grottos that we are going to be putting forward tons of deception. We're going to flood the market with deception about these concepts so that people can't discover the truth about them. And they did it. They didn't just say that they were going to do it. They did it. And I'll bet you they threw a lot of this information right into people's hands and say, here, put this out. This is what people want to hear. You'll make a killing. You'll make a ton of money doing it. They were behind it. Guaranteed. Guaranteed a lot of these new age gurus who write all this crap that they write, they're not even really writing it themselves. They've been given the idea, like a planted a seed, and then, you know, the the the... Dark occultist steps back into the shadow after giving them the idea and then they pen, pen the, the deception. That's how it works. But they said that there would be a huge massive influx in New Age thought that was a total deception telling people erroneous notions about how the laws of attraction work and how basically creating your reality work. And people have swallowed it hook, line, and sinker, and they need a, a hose and a funnel to shovel it down the gullet fast enough. That's how naive these people are. Which it always makes me laugh hilariously when people call me a new ager. I don't know what you're listening to. You're in the twilight zone or something. You know? You know what it is? It's, it's what I call the five-second commenter. They watch five seconds of a video clip about something that I said, immediately related in their mind, have never listened to one podcast in its entirety, and then, boom, let me make my ill-informed comment from this completely erroneous, thin slice, because I don't have a brain that recognizes patterns, so I'm going to actually look at this tiny little five-second or 30-second thin slice, and I'm going to say I know everything there is to know about everything this individual has ever said and call him a new ager as a result. It's a bunch of clowns. A bunch of total clowns who don't know how to think. And think they know something when they know exactly nothing. So let's move on. The way their mind control works, these controllers, is through one simple concept that I've already basically introduced. It's called dialectics. We're on slide number eight now. Dialectics are false choices. You're giving somebody a limited set of choices that are not the only choices that are available to them, but you're telling them that's all that exists. So they will make a choice that is a false choice that leads to the same place that you wanted them to go all along. The mother who wants their child to just take eat a helping of vegetables at dinner and the child doesn't like to eat his vegetables says, do you want carrots or do you want peas tonight? 
and the child thinks, oh, I'm being given a choice. I can make this decision for myself like a big boy. Let me take the carrots because I like them better than peas. They're a little, you know, they're a little better tasting to me. Well, the mother didn't care what he chooses as long as he gets a, a help a serving of his vegetables. And that's it. So th that's a dialectic. And that's what we're seeing with government. That you're presenting somebody a choice that always leads to being ruled. And ultimately to being killed or have violence done to you. So this picture here is a little political cartoon about Republicans going one side, Democrats going the other side, and it's a cow being led to the slaughterhouse. It doesn't matter which way he goes in, it all leads to the same place. The illusion of free choice when it comes to a dialectical choice. That this doesn't mean illusion of free choice at a mass cosmic level. That's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about controllers want to give people a choice that they say is a choice, but it's no choice at all. It's a false choice, which I, the words I put there on slide number nine, false choice. That's what dialectics should be seen as. You're giving someone a choice that isn't a real choice. They're not really exercising choice to choose something different. It's like saying, do you want wine, beer, or whiskey? Well, if you don't want alcohol, you don't want any of those things. You might want some seltzer water. You might want some filtered water. You know, you might want a cup of tea. There's other choices than those three things which you're being presented with. Say, do you want wine, beer, or whiskey? Well, I don't want any of those things. Well, you have to choose between one of them. That's a dialectic at work. Dialectic as a word comes from the Greek preposition dia, which means through or by way of. And the Latin noun lectus, which means choice. And that's how dialectics operate, by way of choice, by giving people a false choice. And as we're going to see, the New Age movement is another one of these dialectics. It's a false choice. Well, it's saying, well, you didn't like these religions, you know? You didn't like Hinduism, Taoism, Buddhism, Shintoism, Christianity, Islam, Judaism, etc. You didn't like any of those. So, uh, here's another choice. And they're telling you it's not a religion. But it's a religion. It's absolutely a religion. And there's a lot of people trapped in it. A lot of people are trapped in it. They don't even understand it's a trap. They've bought these notions and they're tied to them. And that's their belief system. And it doesn't matter if evidence can be shown that it's not true. I'm tied to that belief. It doesn't, it doesn't have to make sense doesn't have to be practical in the real world. That's a belief. I'm sticking with it, and that's it. So let's move on to slide number 10. And we'll start to look at how these mind control dialectics work in the world. There's two overarching dialectics, false choices, that they want to keep people in. For the chronically left-brained, you have to continue to be believing in government. Government is the first dialectic. It works through the left brain and binds the right brain out of the way. Because it's all about being a dominator, okay? It's all about maintaining control over other people. And compassion doesn't really really enter into this. Creativity certainly doesn't enter into it. Government creates nothing. Government exerts control through violence over people who disobey it. Whether what they're commanding is morally right or wrong, it doesn't matter to them. It's called our way or the highway. If you don't obey, violence is done. And anybody who doesn't see it as that simple, you're wrong. You're not perceiving things properly. There's something wrong with your brain. I don't really care how much offense you want to take at that. Go right ahead. That's the truth. Government works through the left brain. It binds the right brain out of the way. It is based upon the erroneous and dogmatic belief, not reality, not truth, but a belief. Okay? So, and as such, it is also a religion. Government is a religion. So see, when, when it really boils down to all of this, the, the whole problem is belief and religion. This is what they did to people in the past. They dissuaded them away from looking into truth. 
and tried to convince people truth doesn't even exist, you cannot really ever know. Solipsism in general. So formulate a belief and an opinion, and that's what you want to hold on to. When it's all nonsense and it's all religion, we got to throw opinions away. we got to throw beliefs away. The only thing you need to believe in is that the truth can be discovered and then go out and do it. Because it's there and it's staring us in the face and we're ignoring it. And as a result of that ignorance, we're, getting, we're already in a cage. Not going into a cage, we're going into the slaughterhouse next. And let me tell you, a lot of people will resist it. And there's going to be slaughter on both sides if we don't wake up. Because they're not going to put the American citizens into the slaughterhouse easily. Not without consequence and not without resistance. You can bet your ass on that. So it's based on this dogmatic belief. A belief. A religious belief. Dogmatic belief is religious belief. That there is such a thing as authority that is vested in certain human beings, which give, gives to those human beings special rights, quote-unquote rights, they're not really rights, but they think that they're rights which others do not possess. They, people who believe in government believe that certain people have rights that other people don't have. And I don't care how you want to twist it, word it, or justify it, that is what the belief in government is, the belief that some people have rights that other people don't possess. When the truth is, everybody has the same rights because rights do not exist in the perceptions of man. They exist in nature. They exist objectively and independently of man in reality. Therefore, a right can never be turned into a wrong and a wrong can never be turned into a right. So, next slide is slide number 11. The left brain form of imbalance eventually creates psychopathic tendencies. When we stay in this state, we become at least a secondary psychopath. Now, I'm not saying you could become a primary psychopath. I'm saying, yeah, that's what we become, a secondary psychopath. Even in people who are not born psychopaths, a born psychopath is called a primary psychopath. They have psychopathy from birth. There's something broken in the human genome that actually creates born psychopaths in about 1% or less of the po- I think it's less than 1% of the population. That number is not accurately scientifically determined. But I would place the number at less than 1%. However, secondary psychopaths probably comprise over 10% of our society. And I'm being generous. I'm being kind in saying it's that low of a number. It's probably a lot higher than that. I'm trying to give people, not, not, not make people totally shut down and, and saying that my guesstimate is around 10%. So this form of left brain imbalance creates psychopathic tendencies, leading some to the belief that they have the right to rule over others through violence, that they can do violence unaccosted, that they can do violence unchallenged. Because they have special rights that other people don't have. I can do this and not be punished. Whereas somebody else does this and they'll be punished or jailed. Like the nerve of these sick psychopathic thugs that dared to, try to, that dared to put me and my wife in handcuffs for speaking. And communicating to people with information. They think they have a right to do that. When if somebody tried to do it to them, they'd call it assault. Well, that's what was done to us. They're the criminal. They assaulted us. They don't have any special rights that other people don't have to say you may not speak or peacefully engage people with information just because they're wearing a uniform and a badge. It doesn't give you a, a right that doesn't exist for another person. Are you insane? Is anybody insane for even believing that that could be? To believe that claim is a form of insanity. Anybody who believes that claim is themselves insane. That themselves, their brain is broken and not functioning properly. 
So let's look at the opposite dialectic, the dialectic that plays off against the left brain form of the dialectic. This is the right brain dialectic, which is called religion. Slide number 12. Religion is the opposite dynamic in the mind from government. Okay? Government is a religion, but it works through the left brain. Religion itself works through the right brain. That's why people who believe in government are, are imbalanced toward both sides of the brain. They, they, uh, people who act within the, the capacities of quote-unquote government are really imbalanced toward r both sides of the brain because they believe they have rights that other people don't and, and they also believe in the religion of government. They believe in its legitimacy, which couldn't happen if you weren't also imbalanced in the right brain hemisphere. So they're sick in both parts of the brain because government is also a religion. And that comes from right, belief in religion comes from right hemispherical imbalance. And this is where the large majority of the population is also in this form of imbalance. Yeah, we're in balance toward the left brain hemisphere too. But more and more, you look at the dynamic, people accept some form of a religion and control system. That's what religion is about. Accepting control. Not believing that you are, not knowing that you are sovereign. You are not a slave. That's what the word sovereign means. From Latin, super and regnum. We'll get to that in a moment. In a moment. Religion works through the right brain and binds the left brain hemisphere out of the way, the logical functions. Because with religion, you want blind faith. You want naivete and blind faith, which are hallmarks of right brain imbalance, which is what everyone who believes in government accepts. They accept, accept its claim of authority. I define religion in this quote that it can all be summarized that if we give up our free will and our personal responsibility to perform right action, some deity, government, guru, extraterrestrial race, or mystical force will save us from ourselves. <clears throat> we just have to give up our free will and personal responsibility, two things that can't really be given up. See, this whole thing is an illusion. And this is what people who believe in religion, including the New Age movement, believe. Again, I told you, somebody just told me that there's no such thing as free will and, and kind of debunks personal responsibility as the way out of this mess. Thinking that we can somehow be rescued from this condition without accepting free will and personal responsibility as something that we have to hold for ourselves, never attempt to give away and use wisely. Because that's hard work from where we're at. No, the Andromedans are going to rescue us, ladies and gentlemen. Don't you know that? Oh yeah, the ships are just, they're hovering in orbit, wait, waiting for the word from the, the commander from the, their home base. Yeah. Mithra's coming down to save us, one of the ancient per Persian sun gods. Don't you know that? The return of Mithra is imminent. Just like the return of Jesus is imminent. You know, the this, this sun savior is going to come and rescue us from ourselves. Now, we don't have to learn the actual teachings of morality. We don't have to learn how natural law functions. You don't need to do a, do a bit of real digging into the self. Now, there's going to be an external savior. Yeah. Yeah, right. Sure. Good luck, folks. You have been punked. You have been taken for the clown that you are wearing the big red floppy clown shoes. Okay? If you buy into any of that nonsense, I feel horribly sorry for you. This is the same thing people believe. Oh, you only need to believe on Christ as, as the Savior and that's it. You're saved. I mean, how could people possibly even be that stupid? No, because that doesn't involve any personal responsibility to act correctly. You're not putting the, the, the teachings of Christ into effect in, in your life, if that's how you think. 
And they'll be the first person to support government. Quote in Romans 13. It's called a fake-ass Christian, is what it's called. Yeah, and notice that book, that, that quote comes from the book called Romans. Okay? The authorities of their day. Yeah. Now, the Bible was never tampered with. Don't worry about it. It's the completely undiluted word of God. Yeah. And it's meant to be taken literally as well. This is a child's view of ancient writings. A child's view. That's why they believe in a religion, because they're a child. Again, the hallmark of right brain imbalance is naivete like a child. And believe me, I know there's even a lot of people who have listened to my show, who hear me on other radio shows, they're in this state. I'm talking about you. Some people have grown up and understand how this dialectic works, but not many. <clears throat> Let's move on to the next slide, slide number 13. Right brain imbalance creates blind acceptance and collectivist groupthink. Again, blind acceptance, naivete, and blind belief. Collectivist groupthink. Leading to a condition in which willing followers will readily submit to, quote, authority. And this is where they need to keep the population in this state of right brain imbalance, believing in religion like the New Age movement, believing in religion like government. This is really the key, is the coming out of this kind of right brain imbalance and not be susceptible to going into the left brain imbalance either to maintain balance between the brain hemispheres because we will not act as slaves readily submitting to authority and acting as cattle in total collectivist groupthink, which is what so many quote-unquote liberals act like, you know, do anything the government tells you. They want a bigger state. They want a nanny state. But we won't go into the form of left brain imbalance where, oh, we need to, you know, be the policeman of the entire world instead of being an example. And that sends us into left brain imbalance, which so many neoconservatives are in. I'm going to talk about different groups of people and how they're in one of these forms of imbalance or another in a little bit. So let's move to the next slide, which is number 14. When you put both of these things together, when you put government together with religion, now you have a totally imbalanced mind. The psyche is completely imbalanced toward both the left brain hemisphere and its form of master think when left unchecked and the right brain hemisphere left in a state of chronic imbalance believing in religion with the naivete of a child blind acceptance <clears throat> submission to authority and going into slave think that creates a total mind in chains the whole mind is all bound up and padlocked and the key is creating balance. The key, which I, I deliberately depicted the keyhole as green, lies in the balance between the two hemispheres of the brain. The color green is the frequency that exists between the two extremes of visible light frequencies of red and blue. The red's fre frequencies are toward one end of the visible spectrum. The blue frequencies are toward the other end of the visible spectrum. But green sits at the very middle of the visible spectrum because it is the color of balance. That's why it exists in nature. That's why the best foods for you to eat are green. <clears throat> it is the color of the heart chakra, the Anahata chakra in the Vedic tradition. It's the center point of balance in consciousness in the physical world as well, in the world of light. So, the key to unlocking that is balancing the brain hemispheres, not falling into either of these forms of brain imbalance or both. We have to use the whole brain and become a whole person, and that's how we will get it out of chains. It's chains. When, moving on to slide number 15, when the individual units of consciousness expressing themselves on earth individual people are all in the, are largely in that state of consciousness by which the brain is bound because it's in these two forms of brain imbalance we will get a world that is bound in chains 
This is the concept of the principle of correspondence, one of the principles of natural law. That as the microcosmic units called the people go, so goes the whole society, the macrocosmic unit. That's how a police state gets created. You have to imbalance people's brain in the ways that I just explained. And that's how you could put an entire race of beings into a prison. Which we're not heading toward. This is the state of humanity now. We're in these chains. <clears throat> the next slide, slide number 16. To clear this up once and for all, and I, look, here's what I'm going to say when, when, about this. If anybody sends me an email about this, I will delete the email immediately without reading it, and you will be blacklisted. I will blacklist on the server your email address so that no message that you ever send me again will ever be seen. You will be typing it and wasting your time for no reason. I'm going to preface this slide, these next two slides, with that comment. If anybody sends me an email attempting to debunk the etymology of this word after I do these two next slides, your email, if I just get the notion that that's what you're trying to do in the email, it will be deleted immediately without me reading it any further, and your email address will be blacklisted because I do not want my time wasted with bullshit. And nonsense. Don't waste my time like that. Okay, I, I am busy. I have things I'm actually doing. Unlike most assholes sitting at home trying to debunk an, etymo an etymology. I have better things to do with my time than to write to somebody when the world is in a police state to try to debunk an etymology. Which, first of all, is true. And I'm going to explain deeply and take some time to actually explain the reason it's true. And again, I don't care if this podcast goes for six or seven hours. I told people I would extend cer certain podcasts since I'm using this, for this type of a forum that certain things that I will want to go into and explain in depth, I will take my time with. So if you have to listen to it in sections, fine. So... Let's look at the actual word government. The etymological roots of the word government come from Latin. The Latin verb gubernare, okay, now there was no V in classical Latin. So the sounds, the consonants that the, the letter V come down to us from were P and B. You could see that they're similar in the phonetic way that you actually uh, make the sound with your lips of P, B, and V. All right? So in Latin, English words like govern, right? The, the V would not have been a V then because, again, there's no V in classical Latin. You would see it rendered as B or P. So just like in the word sovereign, there's no V in Latin, the sound would be a P, super, okay? And that becomes sover in the word sovereign. In the word govern, the word in Latin would be gubernare, G-U-B-E-R-N-A-R-E, -E, gubernare. The, that's the infinitive form of the verb. The first person, uh, present tense, is guberno. Guberno, gubernare. And again, in certain Latin texts, texts in the modern day, you might see this rendered as guvernare because the B and V are interchangeable phonetic variants of each other. So if you look up guvernare, G-U-V-E-R-N-A-R-E, in a, in a good Latin dictionary, it will tell you that this word was rendered classically as gubernare, G-U-B-E-R-N-A-R-E. -E. For those who have never studied Latin, they wouldn't understand any of that. 
I, however, have studied it pretty intensively. So the word gubernare means to control. That's uncontested, and that is where the word govern comes from, to control, Con- to externally control someone else, to govern. So this is where we get the term gubernatorial. A gubernatorial election comes directly from the verb gubernare. Gubernatorial means related to a governor or a controller, a governor of a state. And when people elect these people who think that they're authorities, that's called a gubernatorial election, the election of a governor. The second part of government, ment, M-E-N-T, is where the, the morons of the world want to hotly contest and endlessly debate the etymological root of the word meant, meant of the, the, the part of the word meant in any given word. Okay? Not just government. Th- this word, this p- root uh, um, component of a word, meant, a suffix, comes from the Latin noun mens, M-E-N-S. It's where we get the word mental from, M-E-N-T-A-L, mental. Because the word mens means mind, the mind, the psyche. Okay? So, why would they use the term mens as the suffix to mean the state of or the condition of. Every word that has the word meant at the end of it, the word meant, the suffix meant, you tack it onto something to mean the condition of or the state of. So bereavement is the condition of bereaving something. Containment is the condition of something being contained. And you can go on and on and on with all words that end in M-E-N-T. It's the condition of or the state of. Understood. Well, why would the people who structured the English language have made the word that means the condition of or the state of based upon the Latin word mens, mentis, which is the mind. And this directly relates to another principle of natural law. The very first principle of natural law. The universe is mental. Everything in creation that exists in the universe must, by law, have existed first in mind. Mind is the root of of everything that manifests from it. Everything must flow from mind. The universe flows from the mind of creation itself, from the creator, from God, if you want to call it that. Fine. Every single condition that exists flows from a mental condition first. I'm speaking into a microphone, which is a piece of technology. This microphone had to exist as an archetypal construct in the mind of a human being before the technology ever came into manifestation. So the condition of this microphone existing is a result of a mental, a pre-existing mental condition and a mental construct that thought about the need for such a device for the capture of the waveform that comes out of a human being's mouth when he speaks and converting that into into information that can be recorded and then played back. That happened. That state happened because it was first held in the mind. Well, a state of control can only first come about when that idea of controlling people occurs in the mind. And it is perpetuated through the control of the mind 
which is exactly what the word government means. The verb to control is at the beginning, and the, at the end, the word mind. So you can say the state of mind that leads to control, or you can say actually controlling the mind and therefore creating the control that manifests as a result of a controlling of controlling the mind however you want to look at it it's still valid that is a valid etymological breakdown of the word government and it more clearly helps people to understand that any noun that we use that ends in meant means the condition of or the state of because that condition or state had to first exist as a mental construct. Hence, the makers of the English language deliberately chose the noun mens as that suffix. I mean, I don't see how anybody can have such little understanding of language as to not comprehend that easily. Because people don't study language. They, they haven't looked into linguistics a day in their life, let alone looked into ancient languages to find out where words that we speak on a daily basis came from. So, look, I... Personally, I don't care where else you want to go to argue this point. Don't do it in my email box. I'm not interested. I don't think I know or have an opinion that I know where this came from. I know it. I don't want to hear it anymore. Okay? You want to think that that's my belief. I don't care if that's what you think. I know where the word came from and what it means. Because I know why the people who chose that suffix chose it. Because they understood that first principle of natural law. That everything that exists is a product of the mind. A manifestation of mind. So, do not send email contesting this. If I don't care if you believe that that's not the case. Go believe whatever you want. Do not put an email into my email box because, it, it, first of all, to, to blacklist the email takes me literally one second to do. I got a script. I paste it into the script. Boom, it's done. It's gone. It takes no time from me. You're not taking any time from me. You're wasting your own time doing it. Because your email will be blacklisted in a second by me and you'll be wasting time writing emails that I'll never see. Never see. So you want to blacklist yourself from the email box. And I do read my emails. I don't have time to respond to all of them. I get like 75 to 100 emails every single day. So I can't respond to every one of those emails. I'd be doing nothing but responding to email. I occasionally will respond to one here and there. But if somebody sends me information trying to debunk the etymology of the word government, you will be blacklisted from my email forever. In one second. I'm not interested. I have better things to do with my time. I've wasted too much of my time already, even in this presentation, explaining this distinction. So let's move on. So slide number 17 simply puts up the word mind control on top of this picture of the Congress building to help people to understand, yes, indeed, the word government does in fact mean mind control. Let's lay this to rest once and for all. That's what it means. You have to be under mind control to believe in it. Slide number 18. The whole concept of government rests on the belief the religious belief called authority. If you believe in this belief, you are a member of a religion. Your religion is government if you believe in authority. Whether you know that or understand it or not, you're a religious follower. Because government is also a religion. This all comes down to getting out of religion. The mind control that is religion. Authority is based upon a concept called jurisdiction. That where you are born, you are a subject of the laws of that place. The, the man-made written laws. And everybody will tell you, oh yeah, you're subject to jurisdiction. And they don't even know what the word means. 
They've never even looked into the origin of the word. Jurisdiction also comes from Latin roots. The noun jus juris in Latin. Again, in Latin there really was no J. So actually in classical Latin, uh, I wrote it down as J-U-S, but it would be actually written I-U-S. And juris would be I-U-R-I-S. The the genitive form. Jus juris means law. It's where the word, the English word justice comes from. The second part of jurisdiction is diction. Now, diction in English simply means speech. That's what the noun diction means. Now, we get the word jury from jus juris in Latin. Second part, diction, comes from the Latin verb dicto dictare. Dictare means to speak or to say. So what jurisdiction actually means, based upon its etymological roots, is to say the law, to speak the law. Literally, it means the law is what we say it is. We speak the law. Literally, that's what it means. We say what the law is. And again, this is the notion that man is God and man is the maker of law. We are the authors of law. We are the makers of law. Forget the law that exists inherently in creation called natural law, the laws of morality, the laws of God. No, we make the law because we are God. There's no higher force than us. Right and wrong are constructs that exist in our mind and we get to determine what they are. Not to discover them and live in harmony with those laws. We're going to write them. We're going to make those laws. We're lawmakers. We have jurisdiction. We say what the law is. And then we punish anyone who disagrees. Doesn't matter if our law is out of harmony with natural law. That's the word of God that is man. That's it. And people in religion don't understand this. People who say, I have a religion. I believe in Allah. I believe in uh, Yahweh or Jehovah. I believe in in God the Father of creation. And you would dare to say, man is the lawmaker. I mean, you got to be kidding. I mean, that's direct cognitive dissonance. You're saying God is the lawmaker and we have to follow his laws. And then you're saying, I believe in government. Well, this is the whole concept in the Bible that you cannot obey two masters simultaneously. You either know and understand the laws of creation, which are natural law, about the difference between right and wrong, and you live that in every moment of your life, or you believe that man is the lawmaker. Man is God and his laws are are the laws of, of the universe. Because there's no such higher power as man. And this is what anybody who believes in authority believes. Whether they know it or not, whether they accept that or not. Man is not the authority. Man is, there's no such thing as jurisdiction. Being born into a certain area doesn't mean you're bound by the man-made laws that are written. Regardless of whether they're in harmony with nature's laws or not. You are only bound and can never be unbound and are eternally bound by the laws of morality. That's it. And those laws always have consequence. Whether in this life or another form of existence and consciousness. You're never going to escape those consequences. It's an impossibility. It's like trying to say, I'm going to jump off this cliff and you know, with absolutely no mechanisms for assisting me to counter the law of gravity for a time, and I'm not going to hit the ground and nothing's going to happen to me. Well, good luck. Believe that all you want. It'll never make it true. Just like you could put your hand in a stove, you know, over a stove, and you think it's not going to get burned. Good luck with that. Keep it in the fire for a little bit and find out what happens. It's a law. You're not going to get around law. Cosmic law is always in effect. Once we start thinking we're the maker of law, we're going to write down what laws are and say you're bound to that because we said so. We say what the law is. You're under our jurisdiction. That's man saying he's God. 
And don't tell me that's not what it is. That's exactly what it is. And this whole cycle, this whole lesson is all about, it's the creator showing man how much he's not God. Make no mistake about it. You want to know what the whole lesson here is right now on earth at this time in history? You're not God. You could sum it up real quick. Three words. You're not God. Get that message through your head. You may be an individuated, individuated unit of consciousness within the body of God, but you are not God itself. You, you are not the lawmaker the nerve of, of a, a Jewish person, the nerve of an, an Islamic person, the nerve of a so-called Christian saying that this is your religion and you don't know the first thing about any of them. If you think man is the lawmaker, you have your head up your ass if that's what you think. All right, I'm just going to start saying it totally, plainly, simply, and I don't care who doesn't like what they hear. It doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is, is it true or not? Get out of the whole emotional mind control dynamic. You don't like the way truth is presented. Oh, he's too bitter for me. He's too vitriolic for me. It's the same kind of people that can't hear a word somebody like Gerald Salente says because he gets riled up in saying it. I love the guy. You know, want to know why? You want to know why? He's telling the truth to people. Vitriolically. But nonetheless, it's true. I can sit, I can sit there and listen, listen to uh, Gerald speak for an hour because I, I, don't get, I don't get offended emotionally when somebody's saying what's true. I only care about the content of what they're saying. So I can listen to somebody scream through a bullhorn all day long as long as what they're saying is true. The notion that you have to sugarcoat truth to get people to accept it is the problem. This is what the New Age is trying to say. This is the problem that people accept that and believe it. The New Age movement won't call anybody on their bullshit and tell them that what they are doing and believing in is wrong. And hence the wrongdoing goes on unchallenged because they want peace. They value peace more than they value truth. They don't want to rock the boat, but they don't care that the truth's being buried and with it their freedom. No. No confrontation. No confrontation. And if the truth goes down the drain as a result of no confrontation, oh, well, so be it. No, you could have done something. And you're sitting on your ass doing nothing. Again, what this all boils down to, moving on to slide 20 now, is slavery. That's what this is. The concept of authority that some people are the masters. Who make up the rules, who say what the law is. And other people have to obey them. It's called slavery. I don't care whether your notion of slavery is just the ball and chain version and you think that's the only form. You're wrong. The concept of authority is slavery. The concept of government is slavery. The concept of taxation is slavery. The concept of prohibition is slavery. The concept of not being allowed to exercise your rights because somebody else tells you you can't and they, they're saying you have to obey them when they say you can't exercise that right, is slavery. You're living in it. We didn't defeat slavery because we defeated the ball and chain version of slavery. You're still in slavery. The concept of authority, quote-unquote authority, is an illusion it is not real. It is an illusion. It is based in belief. It is not based in nature. It is an illusion of a diseased psyche. In other words, a diseased and imbalanced mind that is based entirely in violence and built upon the erroneous and dogmatic belief, 
not truth, but belief, that some people are masters who have the moral right to issue commands, while others are slaves who have a moral obligation to obey the masters. That is what government is, that is what authority is, and there is no better definition for slavery than that. Some people are masters who have the moral right to issue commands and other people are slaves who have a moral obligation to obey the master's commands. That is the very definition of slavery. And if you can't conceive of the notion that this is what slavery is by definition, again, I will only say there is something wrong with your brain. You need need help. You're sick. You're, You're not just not... It, it, when people say, you say uh, that something's wrong with me or I don't understand because I don't get it. No. I say that because it's true. That one thing means another. One thing actually means another thing. You can understand where a person's brain at, is at by the nature of what they say they believe. So if somebody says, I believe in authority, I automatically know you're not mentally well. You're sick. There is all, I know immediately upon you conveying that information out of your mouth and saying that you believe in that, that there's something physically wrong with your brain, that you are existing in that state of brain imbalance. Your brain cannot be well. It's an impossibility. You know, if some, if someone can't pick up something that weighs a pound, their muscles cannot be operating properly, you know, because All human beings have the capability of picking something up that weighs one pound, unless there's something wrong with their physiology. Well, the same thing is true. If something, if somebody really understands what slavery is, they cannot support it. If somebody has a balanced brain, they know what slavery is, and they know that it's based in the concept of authority. So anybody that believes in authority cannot have a properly functioning brain. It follows logically. So again, get as offended about it as you want. If you want to do something to get your mind well, learn that all forms of authority in government are slavery and always have been. You need to break down the conditioning that has led you to that erroneous belief system. And that's all it is. It's an erroneous, religious, dogmatic belief that has no basis in nature. It has no basis in the real. No basis in truth. Because what you have to accept to believe that notion is that people are slaves, rightfully. That the concept of slavery is something that is right and should continue indefinitely. That is what everyone who is a statist believes, whether they know it or not. They may not even be consciously aware of that. And everyone who is a statist has brain damage in some form or fashion at some degree or another. Some may be very sick and some may have you know just a little bit of illness still present and maybe are in the process of working their way out of it but everybody who believes in statism or what i'm going to call archon archani or archonism is at some degree mentally ill they have not healed their psyche so let's move on to the next slide slide number 21 What everyone who does not acknowledge that government is slavery does not understand, and what they need to understand that everyone on this planet is, regardless of what is believed, okay, is what's on this slide, a sovereign. Everybody who believes in authority does not really fully understand this concept. And a lot of people think that... This is a dirty word of some kind. He's claiming to be sovereign. How dare he? Imagine that. Because they don't understand the meaning of words. They don't understand where words they are speaking came from. The word sovereign is derived from Latin also. The adverb super, and again, here we see this phonetic... um, um, su- uh, su- um, what's the word I'm looking for? We see this f- uh, phonetic um, 
changing, a um, substitution. That's that's it. Okay, this phonetic substitution of v, the modern v, in the ancient world, in ancient Latin, there was no v. Okay, so that sound is represented by the p, p, in place of v which we just saw in the previous example looking at the etymology of government, a B in, a pla in place of a V. So again, P and V used interchangeably in the ancient world in many cases to represent the sound in modern language, such as English and other languages, that we represent with a V. Because that V sound didn't exist in their language. So sovereign, the first part, S-O-V-E-R, comes from the Latin adverb super. Super means above. The second part of the word reign, so you're putting them together with one R. Okay? Sovereign. Sovereign. The second part, reign, comes, to, comes from the Latin also, the noun regnum. Regnum means rulership or control. It comes out of the Latin rex regis, the noun meaning king. Rex regis or regis is the noun for king or ruler. And then regnum, which comes out of regis, regis, regal, okay, means rulership or control. That's the king's rulership. His reign is what it comes down to in Germanic and then English language. So this is based in the Latin regnum, meaning rulership or control. Externally, direct rulership of others, meaning I'm the king, you are my subject. I make the law, you have to obey what I say, my jurisdiction over you, because I'm your ruler and you are my subject, my slave. When we put these two words together, sovereign, it means above rulership or control. One who is not a subject or the slave of another. That's it. So in the next slide, 22, I just put the word, the words not a slave. That's what the word sovereign means. It means not a slave. If you ask every person, just go and do this experiment with your family members. Just ask them, are you a slave? And none of them will want to admit that they're a slave. They'll say, no, I'm not a slave. And it, it, the correct response is no. Because regardless of what anyone believes or even what the condition is of other people believing that they're masters and other thugs um, supporting the masters in their claim that they are the rightful authorities, that doesn't make it true. So, are the conditions of slavery in place? Yes, but that doesn't mean anybody is a rightful slave. There is no such thing. Never has been, never will be. Isn't now. The concept of a slave and a master of a slave is inherently illegitimate because it's inherently immoral because it's based in violence, which is, out of, which is in direct opposition to natural law, to moral law. Therefore, there is really no such thing in creation, legitimately, in nature, in reality, as a slave that doesn't exist. No one is a slave. No one ever has been a slave. No one ever can be a slave. Can be. It's an impossibility for a slave to actually exist. The people who were taken from their homeland in Africa and brought over here immorally to this land during Civil War period and before, they were kept as slaves. That doesn't mean that that's what they were as people. It's not saying the conditions that we call slavery didn't exist. I'm saying that in reality, those people are not legitimately slaves. Never were. There's no such thing as the le legitimization of slavery. They were free then even though they were being held, other people believed the condition of slavery was legitimate and they were being held as if they were slaves. What I'm trying to express is that that can never be true in reality. 
It never makes it true because people do this immoral behavior. It doesn't mean that they have a legitimate, a legitimate claim on that person's body. In fact, they were not their property. Never could be their property. They could only claim that and other morons who don't understand freedom could accept that claim. The people who helped them to take those people into slavery, into bondage. And unfortunately, and it's true, and many people don't want to admit that it's true, when generations, new generations had come up, yes, the people who were directly taken over here from Africa knew that, that they were being held as slaves against their will. When they had children and new a new generation came up, they were so brainwashed by the people who ran the plantations and factories where they were put to, in the manual labor and the indentured servitude, brainwashed them so well that they actually accepted the claim of slavery and believed that they were the legitimate property of their master and like l thought that they legitimately should be punished for running away, trying to get away from that deplorable, immoral condition that they were being held in against their will and thought that running away would be stealing themselves from their rightful owner, that their body was the legitimate property. Yes, that did exist. People who want to ignore that and say, no, they, they even knew that they were slaves. You are incorrect and you are ignoring historical fact. Many slaves who were being kept on plantations in the South during slavery period in the Civil War era here in this country and before that, uh, and long before that, actually believed that this was a legitimate claim. Now, many of them did not as well, but that doesn't mean that many of them did. Many of them bought the notion that this was, was legitimate and should continue. That's how brainwashed through the lack of education that they were given. They weren't allowed to read books, engage in philosophical discourse. They were whipped and put to work in a field. I mean, the, the, the nerve that anybody believes that this is ever legitimate. And you know what we have today? We have a population that still believes it's legitimate. Just because they have a harder time seeing that what the conditions we're living in are still slavery. You know, they want it to continue because they don't want their personal responsibility. And I'm tell I tell, tell people this, and they get angry and defensive and mad and want to lash at me when I tell people when the slaves were released in America, officially... Many of them did not really want to go off and make a life for themselves and be free. Because of course, they almost all of them didn't really know how to read or write, had only manual labor skills. It's true. What kind of a life at that point, at that level of ignorance that they were kept in, would they eke out? And it's a very scary situation. They almost preferred the comfort or the, the comfort isn't even the right word. It's the familiarity of their chains to the unknown aspect of actually governing their own life. And again, I'm not attacking any group of people or race or anything like that. I'm saying that this is the mental mindset that when somebody's been held in captivity for so long that develops. It's, it's Stockholm Syndrome. You identify with the con your condition, your oppressive condition, and with your masters and, and owners, so-called claimed masters and owners, and that's what people want to continue in their ignorance. And yes, that is also historical fact that many slaves took that mental attitude upon their release. I'm not, I'm, it's not an attack. It's, it's historical fact. I'm not attacking anybody. I'm telling you how it w actually was. And of course, many of them did not take that position and absolutely wanted to go to work making a, a real life for themselves and caring for themselves and building a family and you know learning and growing as individuals. Many took that attitude. So I'm trying to say both of these attitudes are still alive today, alive and well. And there's a problem with one of them. One of them is not based in right. It is always wrong because you are supporting for whatever reason you're doing it. Oh, the government provides this assistance to me. 
Oh, the, uh, my child's in a government-run school. It's free education. I wouldn't have to pay for an education. I don't care why you're doing it. No matter what reason you're doing it, it's still support of slavery. It is the support of slavery, whether you understand that or not. And all I'm trying to say is that at all times and places, slavery is immoral and illegitimate and should be ended. That's another thing. A slave master wants people to accept, you're better off with me. I take good care of you. You don't want to be on your own, do you? Oh, you'd have to make hard choices. You'd have to, you know, do other forms of work that you're, you're totally responsible for what you get. You know, here, the master is the one who's responsible. All you're to do is to just listen to his commands. And that's why police do what they do. They think that they can hand over their obligation to think. It's a moral obligation to think for yourself. It's more than just personal responsibility. You have a moral obligation to think for yourself and make judgments about what right and wrong behavior actually are based on knowledge of right and wrong. And then an obligation to choose the right action over the wrong action. What a person who wants to be eternally kept as someone else's slave or pet wants to do is to try to give away that personal responsibility to make that free will choice themselves they want to hand that to think that they can hand that to someone else and it can never be done you can only claim that you're doing it so what we're really looking at here is all of the things that are holding us back from being truly free are is some form of a religion and again, this is not to say that there isn't something such as a positive form of religion as well. There is true religion. There is false religion. And I'll briefly go over both of these concepts. Okay, Religion, again, let's break down the word. I'm going to do this a lot. I, I do do this a lot because it's so important to understand the words we speak and where they came from. Why the people who structured the English language chose the ancient language words that they chose to structure modern language. They weren't doing this arbitrarily. It was a very deliberate design to try to get people to understand what the words mean. The word religion comes from Latin, the verb religare. So ligare means to tie. Religare means to tie back. Because the prefix re means back or again. So when we put them together, religare means to tie back, to hold back, or to thwart from forward progress, to bind, to hold back. So what is false religion? And this is the definition of false religion. To tie back, to hold back, to thwart from forward progress, to bind. What is it binding? What is it holding us back from? What is it tying us back? In what way is it thwarting our forward progress? Well, it's tying us back from truth. It's giving us beliefs in place of truth. It's saying, well, this is a belief. This is an opinion. It's as valid as knowledge. No, it's not as valid as knowledge. Knowledge isn't based on opinion or belief. Knowledge is based on truth, which does exist and is discoverable. <clears throat> so what religion holds us back from is forward progress in consciousness, in our understanding of ourselves and the universe. This is why it has to go. It has to go. All religions. The only religion needs to be truth. That's what we need to be tied to. That's what we need to be bound to. What the truth is. Not what a religion says is true. Or says you should believe. But what is actually true. Because you determined it. You discovered it. And the main thing that unites us to that is the understanding of natural law or morality. When we understand morality, we become united with truth. We are bound back to that which is true. Because <clears throat> when we fall away from morality, we have fallen away from the truth. 
about right and wrong. <clears throat> so what I call religion is a control system, a control system of control that is based in unchallenged dogmatic belief which holds back the progress of consciousness. That is the definition of false religion. When we make truth our religion, we undo all of that. We undo those belief systems. We go with the truth wherever it leads us and we unite with it. And then we move forward in consciousness and we become freer. We want to ignore the truth going into a deeper cage. As the mind goes into a cage, society goes into a cage. The principle of correspondence. Moving on to slide number 24. So, what is the New Age movement? What kind of a religion is this? What is it attempting to do? What kind of a mind state is it attempting to hold us in? On slide number 24, I have a, again, that archetypal depiction of the New Age movement with the people uh, sitting on the grass meditating. And I call the New Age movement the last cul-de-sac before the gold mine. And I have a street sign of a cul-de-sac, which means no outlet, no way out. A cul-de-sac is a dead-end street with no outlet, which retards the flow of transportation. Okay, It gets you going around in a circle. That's what a cul-de-sac is. Many re- researchers who are informed have called the New Age movement the last cul-de-sac before the gold mine. What that means is the gold mine is where the real spiritual knowledge is at. And what that knowledge is, is knowledge of natural law. In conjunction with knowledge of how the psyche actually operates and the things that we just talked about about the brain. They don't want that knowledge out. They don't want anybody understanding that that's how it works and then working on themselves and other people to heal that imbalance because that's the end of their control system. And if you understand natural law, which is the macrocosmic laws of creation, in conjunction with that, you really cannot be controlled. And you're acting within right. You're standing in righteousness and defending right. So, on slide number 25, I put down what I call natural law. That I'm sorry, what I call the New Age movement. <clears throat> and what I call it is the last religion before the gold mind. This is a religion that is set up deliberately to hold us back to thwart our forward progress in true awakening. I call the New Age movement a spiritual cul-de-sac, a spiritual dead end with no outlet, which retards the true awakening process. It slows down or holds back the true awakening process. And that, what we are awakening to is that there is no such thing as authority. That's what the awakening process is about. And anybody who's not talking about the control system in the New Age movement, anybody who's not talking about authority being an illusion, anybody who's not talking about the ultimate goal of the spiritual journey being true freedom, here on the ground, not in some fantasy land, not in some life to come, not in some you know, other planet that we're, or, or dimension that we're going to t- get taken to or ascend to, right here on the earth, right here on the ground, where the work needs to be done. So that's what I look at, at the New Age movement as. It's a religion. When the other religions haven't worked and people haven't bought into those religions, you need to get them into one of these other religions. Government and the New Age movement are those two modern religions. Because before they just told you, oh, we're the intermediaries of God. You know, this is your religion. You don't accept that. Our word is law. And that worked for a long time throughout human history. Until it stopped working. Now they had to come up with new religions. Called government and called the New Age movement. 
So what I'm going to do here for the duration of this presentation is I'm going to present 10 overarching main new age movement deceptions or distortions of true teachings that come down to us in a completely distorted way through the new age movement. Now, great advice for anyone is that if you are going to present something that is negative to people, always talk about the solution. That's why I didn't talk about all the negative stuff going on in the world and not give solutions to people. I put out months worth of, worth of solutions, practical, hands-on, everyday ways that we can do things differently to make a different manifestation come about. So when I present these New Age deceptions, I always counter them with what I call a New Age correction. So first will be the deception, and then I will follow it with the correction. So let's start with New Age deception number one. We're on slide number 26. New Age deception number one is ignore the negative. And I put negative in quotes because they're the way that this word is being used is as, again, a dirty word. That you should never look at what's wrong in the world. That that's going to bring you more of what's wrong. And this is nonsense. So I put a picture of monkeys doing the traditional hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. You know? We don't want to hear what's wrong, we don't want to look at that, and we don't want to say it to others. I don't want to learn what's wrong by hearing it or seeing it, and God forbid I don't want to tell other people the problems. This is the problem, that so many people buy into this. Don't ever talk about religion or politics. Don't talk about the negative, that'll bring more of it to you. That is not, not not how the laws of attraction operate. And anybody who buys into that total nonsense has bought a bill of goods. And the bill of goods you bought it from was from a Luciferian. A dark Luciferian, I should say. You bought it from people who were in the dark occult selling you a bunch of crap nonsense that has absolutely nothing to do with how the real laws of attraction work. You want to learn how the real laws of attraction work? Listen to my podcast about natural law. Come and attend a natural law seminar in Philadelphia. And you'll learn the real laws of attraction. Not some watered down, namby-pamby, nonsense version peddled by Satanists. Trying to get naive people who haven't grown up and haven't become streetwise to what's going on in their world. Believing in, and hanging on every word that they peddle. And it's disgusting. So let's move on to slide number 27. This deception works like this. New age, many new age deceivers want to convince you that you quote unquote give power to something that is harmful simply by putting your attention upon it and becoming aware of its existence. Therefore, you should never pay attention to or talk about anything that is quote-unquote negative. Ignore the negative. <clears throat> and again, this is not how the laws of attraction work. You do not bring more things that are negative by talking about what's wrong in the world and telling people that this should not continue and it should be corrected. How you bring on more negativity is by refusing to do that. By ignorance, by ignoring what is actually there and what is happening and what is taking place. When you ignore that and you refuse to acknowledge it, you refuse to acknowledge truth, what is actually happening in the world, you refuse to talk about why that is happening, of course, the causal factors that led to that condition and that behavior, and you refuse to tell that to other people by speaking that knowledge into existence, that's why you're going to get more of it. That's why. 
So I depict in slide number 28 now the, the concept of ignoring the negative as putting your head in the sand like the, the proverbial ostrich. I'm going to ignore reality and not acknowledge how it actually really works. I'm going to be told by people that I think are gurus or spiritual teachers. Ignore what's really there. Don't really talk about that. Oh, you'll just get more of that if you expose it. No. You'll get more of it if you don't expose it. If people can't see what evil actually is because they aren't talking about it, that's why we're getting more of it. It's exactly what's going on. Anybody with a modicum of common sense left in their brain can understand that. We're not calling anybody on their wrongdoing. We're not raising our children in a moral capacity. We're not telling them, no, this is wrong behavior. Look at that. That's what you shouldn't do. That's wrong. No, because we're told, never say, no, don't do that to people. Only tell them what they should do. Nonsense. The problem is, people aren't morally raising the young and telling them what is wrong, what is not a right. You need to know what rights are not in order to know what rights are. The apophatic inquiry method is always going to be more powerful than trying to tell somebody, here's what you should do. Do this, do this, do this. You need to explain, here's why you shouldn't do this because of what you'll be manifesting and creating in the world even for yourself. Because we are all connected and we are all tied together. And this is the reason, this is the underlying causal factor why you should not behave that way. Why that is an immoral behavior. And people are loath to do that work as we're going to talk about later. So, what I said in the presentation originally when I gave it at the Free Your Mind 2 conference is when you're on your knees in this position, please take note that you're, when your head is in the sand, you're on your knees with your ass in the air. In order to put your head in the sand, you have to be on your knees with your ass in the air. Bowing down and accepting authority and getting ready to take it in the rear end. Okay? That's the position that you put yourself in when you ignore something. It's, it's, al it's almost like it's, it's amazing that the body works out like that. In order to put your head underneath the ground, the only real way, you know, unless you're completely standing upright on your head, but to do that willingly yourself, you have to be on your knees with your ass in the air. It's almost synchromistic that that's how the body would be designed. Like God is telling you something. I designed the body in such a way so that in order to put your head underneath the sand, you got to be on your knees with your ass sticking up. It's beautifully poetic in many ways for people that can you know appreciate that little bit of irony. So, mo moving on, um, well actually, not moving on because we're going to stay on this uh, one aspect of um, the, the deception. But this is bullshit. <coughs> that is bullshit. The whole notion that we should ignore the negative. This is New Age bullshit number one. Slide number 29 has the bullshit button. I'll add the sound effects in for it, you know in the editing of the podcast. It's just unbelievable that people think that they're going to... that people have been convinced into thinking that you're going to generate more negativity by talking about the things that are wrong that need to be corrected in the world. And this is why New Agers, these cowards won't talk about the control system, won't talk about the illegitimate nature of slavery and government. They won't talk about the abuses, the endless train of abuses of this government, the police state that is not encroaching, it's already here. And they think they're going to help people to get out of it. They think they're doing a service to people. 
by ignoring an entire body of information that is real, that is true, that is happening. No, I beg to differ, ladies and gentlemen. The people who think that way are the ones who are creating and perpetuating the manifestation of that dynamic. So let's correct this erroneous claim that we should ignore the negative. The New Age Correction, number one. Seeing the negative for that which it actually is creates an ability within us to steel ourselves against its harmful effects. In other words, you have to know the causal factors and the harm that is imminent as a result of those causal factors. How did you go awry? How did you get to this condition? How did you get to this situation? You need to look at that. You need to look at that shadow material. That's not there to be ignored. You'll never understand the solution unless you deal with that shadow material. This is about going down into the nested subconscious psychological areas of the human psyche and bringing up that trauma to a conscious level and working with it and healing it. But people are loath to do that work because it's not easy. So when we do that, we are stealing ourselves against the harmful effects of this negative situation. And possibly we can even avert the effects entirely. If you see something coming, you can take action against it. You could do something that is positive and powerful, empowering, so that you will not be affected in a harmful way. When you ignore it, it's going to blindside you, like a tornado that you don't see coming. The next slide, number 31, refusing to look at critical information just because it makes you feel uncomfortable or scared is willfully choosing to remain in a state of ignorance, ignorance, and therefore to remain unconscious, unconscious. The people who think they're so awake in the New Age movement, you're not awake at all. You're totally asleep. You are unconscious because you are not talking about what's really taking place in the world. You're living in a fantasy land where everything is happy-go-lucky and nothing is bad. Some Look, I'm going to go and directly insult the, this person because, quite frankly, they're a jackass who deserves to be insulted. Okay? A woman who attended the Free Your Mind 2 conference, and I don't really care who this offends, her personally, I don't care. I'm going to say, when I see a jackass, I'm going to call them a jackass. Somebody who attended, and, and you'll see it on the films, and, you know, because, because she, she asked, uh, you know, made a comment at the um, Gathering of the Minds um, discussion panel that there's no such thing as a negative experience actually said that there's no such thing as a negative experience everything is just an experience the the level of naivete and illness that someone has to be in to have their mind worked into this state is so staggering that like i said the, the, to the Satanists and Luciferians who told me they're going to be putting information like this into the world through the New Age movement, all I can say is, wow, I can't even believe you got it done. I never would have thought it possible. You know, I mean, congratulations are in order in some, in some ways. Like, I would shake your hand as an opponent. Not because I really respect your, your level of mental sickness and illness and psychopathy, but I wouldn't have even thought it would be possible to make someone's mind that dumb. To dumb someone down to that level and simultaneously get them to think that they know what real spirituality is about. I mean, just brilliantly well done is all I can say. That's all, and, and I feel horrifically sad to have to admit that, but nonetheless... This is the level of deception that we're up against and how crafty it is and how well they're able to carry out what they say they're going to carry out because they have created people exactly as they say they're going to create them. This is a golem, a golem, an animated creature made by the dark occultist. That's what that person is. 
Let me tell you something, lady. Pedophilia is happening. And that's not just an experience. The murder of children is happening. And that's not just an experience. That's called evil. And you need to get through your brainwashed religious new age bullshit skull that evil exists and is operating all around us. Because you're not streetwise. You're a naive child who's bought something that somebody else sold you that you want to hear. You don't want to hear what the truth is. If you're in a rape room being tortured by dark occultists, you wouldn't be saying it's just an experience. Trust me. You wouldn't be saying that. So get over yourself. And get out of this nonsense ego trance that is the New Age movement that is feeding you lie after lie after lie after lie after lie. And telling you that it's spiritual. Telling you you're awake because you think that child pedophilia, rape, and murder is not bad. We're we're judging it. When we say it's bad, it's negative. It shouldn't be. It shouldn't exist. You want to talk about having your head in the sand? It's not in the sand. It's up your ass is where it's at. And anybody who promulgates that nonsense, that's where your head is too. No, because that experience hasn't been yours. So you you won't say that's evil and it shouldn't happen. And we should stop it by whatever force has to be used to stop it. Which is called taking right defensive action when somebody's rights and life are being violated. You haven't learned a thing about what spirituality is. You haven't learned a thing about what right and wrong are. So don't don't lie and tell anybody else you're a spiritual person and you know what real spirituality is making an asinine statement like that. Because you don't know the first thing about them. And I'll be the one to tell you that you don't. If nobody else will, I'll tell you that. And I just did. And I hope she hears it and listens to this. I don't know her name, but whatever. I don't really want to, to be honest. You know, and the fact that other people believe this bullshit, it's a disgrace. Let's move on to New Age Deception number two, which goes hand in hand with the first of never look at the negative, and that's never get angry. Never get angry. There's nothing nothing to get angry about. Everything is fine. Let's talk in these calm, soothing tones. Oh, the world is fine the way it is. There's nothing wrong. Don't get angry. Don't don't raise don't raise your voice. Never feel any any negative emotions. Uh, anger is negative. It shouldn't exist. There's no reason for anger to exist. There's no proper role for anger. I mean, people actually believe this nonsense. This is just total tripe. I just can't even believe people are that naive that they believe that there's no proper role for anger. If you couldn't experience... If you... If anger were not, were not there to be experienced, you wouldn't be able to feel it. There's a reason. There's a role for it. There's a proper role for all the emotions. All the emotions. Anger is there for a reason. I put on the slide, Never Get Angry, my favorite comic book character, you know, my favorite superhero, if you will. I never preferred the other superheroes who dress in costumes and, you know, necessarily look at themselves as quote-unquote defenders of the people like Superman and Batman. Spider-Man I thought was pretty cool when I was young, but uh, by far, the only character I ever identified with in my youth was the Incredible Hulk. If there is one comic book that I, you know, got into 
and thought that that character was the he was the man. It was the Incredible Hulk. And there's a reason. And there's a reason he's green. That's not an accident either. The Hulk was someone who wanted to be left alone. That's all the Hulk ever wanted. Bruce Banner didn't hurt anybody who tr would transform into the Incredible Hulk when other people refused to leave him alone. You know, you, you could even watch the uh, TV series, The Incredible Hulk, with Lou Ferrigno as the Hulk. The same concept arises there over and over again. This person wants to be left alone. He wants to be allowed to live his life in peace. And he constantly encounters people who won't allow that. And he tells them, don't make me angry. You won't like me when I'm angry. Because all he's doing is acting in a defensive posture. He's going on the, the attack only when he's been forced into a corner. And then he flips out, and people don't like what happens when he flips out. And I would suggest this is where America is right now. We are Bruce Banner on the verge of transformation into the Incredible Hulk. And let me tell you something. When the transformation happens, the people who have pushed us into this corner are not going to like the Americans when they're angry. And I would suggest to them to go study the French Revolution in detail. Because if you think what, the French, what happened in the French Revolution was, was bloody and violent, you have not seen anything compared to what is going to happen on American soil if people do not allow this control system of violence and slavery to deteriorate naturally and organically on its own. You're, you're going to be people are going to be wishing that the Incredible Hulk was tearing things up because what they're going to witness is going to be something so far beyond that that it's the likes of which humanity has never seen in history ever, and that's what I am again attempting to avoid. I am not trying to push that dynamic. I am trying to avert that dynamic by teaching people the difference between right and wrong and helping them to accept that they have been duped and they have been wrong their whole life. That they are under mind control and need to heal their hemispheres of their brain in conjunction with the heart to get out of that level of mind control and therefore stop supporting evil and slavery. So, I intuitively resonated with the character of the Hulk because, as they say, there are only two kinds of people. The people who want to be left alone and the people who won't leave them alone. That's it. There are aggressors and there are people who understand the non-aggression principle and that you shouldn't in initiate violence and coercion. There are the only two kinds of people in the world. That's it. And then there are people who think that the initiation of violence and coercion are acceptable when they are immoral. So the Hulk never initiated force, ever. He responded to it defensively when he was pushed to the edge. Which is why I intuitively resonated with that character. And the, the fact that he's colored green when he transforms is no accident either. Because that's the color of care. That's the color of balance. And understanding when forceful defensive action needs to be taken. When we care enough, when we come into a level of balance enough. Now he goes obviously way out of balance when he makes this transformation, but the concept here is that the green color is representative of caring enough to get angry enough to take right action. Even if that action has to be based in defensive force, which we're going to talk about later in the presentation. On slide number 33, this is what they would turn the masculine instinct into of self-preservation and defense when your rights are being attacked, when your life is being attacked. This is what the New Age movement seeks to turn it into. Somebody who is totally emasculated and is sitting there doing nothing, accepting. See, it's all about acceptance, which is right-brained. It's never about action. This is a theme that you'll see over and over and over and over again in the New Age movement. Always accept, 
never act. Think and feel, you know, maybe think, definitely feel, emotions are played heavily upon because that's right brain imbalance. The, the limbic system rules, so you become governed by the emotions. You're not really truly high, thinking at a higher order, at a, at a higher function with the neocortex, and you're certainly not taking action. So this takes away the instinct for self-preservation and the preservation of one's rights, making you a willing slave that will sit there when violence is being done to you. And I would suggest this is what protests are all about too. People sitting there when violence is being done to them, not acting back. It's also a testimony though to how far people are willing to let themselves be pushed because they don't want forceful confrontation. But at some point when you're being beaten with weapons and weapons are, uh, of war are being unleashed upon you and you're sitting there doing nothing, you're engaged in a wrongdoing. And I would suggest to you that the original founders of this country waged the first revolutionary war for far less than what's going on today. The police abuses and brutality are even less than what the founders said broke the, 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 was the straw that broke the camel's back and it led to Lexington and Concord. I would suggest we are under deeper oppression, far worse oppression now through the kinds of taxation that are going on, through the kinds of prohibition that's going on, through the kinds of usurpation of rights and free speech and police brutality and the complete and utter immoral uses of the military in this country. This country is a moral disgrace. A disgrace. There is no grace here. The grace of the Creator is gone from this country because we abandon His law, its law, the fo that forces law, whatever you want to call it, her law. We're not living according to the laws of the Creator. We're not living according to morality. We don't know, know the first thing about morality in this country. And that's why we're going and are already in the cage. So, to tell people that you need to become some milk toast, um, roll over when he's kicked dog that takes whatever abuse that is dished out to him by people who think that they're your owners is total bullshit. So let's correct this New Age deception number two. <clears throat> and understand what is the real role of anger. How is anger properly used? <clears throat> New Age correction number two, on slide number 35 now. I have a picture of a, you know, a bully or a fight happening in, in a, cl in a uh, school environment in front of lockers. While non-righteous and unchallenged anger, and we see so much of that in our youth, Anger is present, but it's not properly channeled. This is more of what they want. They want people angry, but not angry over the right reasons. Angry because, uh, you know, uh, you you said started this rumor about me. You know, infighting. Anger about, oh, I have a different political ideology or a different religion than you. Angry because I don't like the way you look or how you talk or whatever. People aren't angry over the right reasons. They're angry over nonsense. Over things that make absolutely no sense and are just there to divide people. So while non-righteous, non-righteous anger and unchanneled anger is counterproductive to individual development and collective efforts to bring about positive change, moving to slide 36, on the other hand, Righteous anger, righteous indignation, when channeled productively, meaning you don't just get angry and hold the anger there. You get angry and then you do something with the anger. The anger, the righteous anger, is spurring you on to action in the world. Spurring you on to right action in the world. That's called righteous indignation. It means you are going to do something with that emotion. It is there to be felt and it is there to motivate you, to move you forward, to take action. Not just to say, oh, that's terrible, that, that shouldn't be done. 
but to do something about it. To bring that knowledge and awareness to other people. When it's channeled productively, it can be a major motivation to create positive change in our world. But ignoring it and saying no one should ever get angry. Anger is an emotion, an emotion that should be purged. This is what New Agers believe. I'm telling you, it's not what I think they believe. I've had in-depth conversations with people who are adherents to this religion. Who have told me there is no place ever for any anger. Anger is an emotion that should not exist and it is we, we sh should work to try to purge it. Someone has actually said that to me. And I just have to look at them like, you are on drugs. You are on a bad drug called the New Age Movement. And you don't even understand. I'm not even saying that metaphorically. This is a drug. This is something that imbalances the brain chronically. It's like doing a, a, abusing a drug. One of the people who I do think uh, may have started in the New Age movement, but he understood how it was being used as, as a deception, and I really like his work, is Dick Sutphin. Dick Sutphin oh, uh, ha, has talked about the dangers of using a lot of these New Age techniques in a way that it shouldn't be used. We're going to talk about that when we get into meditation. But he talks about friends who are total New Agers, who their brain is like how, how somebody's brain is when they're on a heavy street drug and can't focus, can't concentrate, can't get anything done. The action has been removed. Again, the suppression of the sacred masculine. The sacred masculine is action. Taking action. Thoughts are the neutral component that underlie everything. The sacred feminine is the emotional qualities and then the sacred masculine is the actions, is our behavior. And that's what they want to ultimately cut off. They don't want people taking right action in the world, telling people about what's really going on, informing people. They want you calm and they want you sedate. Sedated. Non-active. Sitting there doing nothing. When you get angry, it can motivate you to proper action. And the image that I show here is a meme from uh, the movie Network, which I highly recommend. Because that's what... Howard Beale in Network is talking about, I'm mad as hell, I'm not going to take this anymore. I'm going to do something to change this. It isn't good enough to say I disagree with it. Thought and emotion give rise to action. If you're not, if they're not giving rise to action, you're not doing the proper things with your thoughts and your emotions. It's not about knowing something or feeling something. It's about knowing it, feeling it, then doing it. And again, as ancient philosophers have said, to know and not to do is not to know. If you claim to know something and you're not actually acting on that, you're not actually doing something with that knowledge, you don't really know it. You haven't really deeply integrated it. You don't know. You're just saying that you know. And that's what so many people in the New Age movement are. People who say that they know, they don't do, and therefore they don't really know. More on this correction about never get angry. You know, the whole statement, the meme, if you're not outraged, you're not paying attention. It's very applicable. If you're not outraged by what's going on in the world, you clearly cannot be paying attention to what's going on in the world. Because what's going on in the world is very negative and it should not stand. It should not be continuing. I told people at the conference, even Jesus got angry in the story. And this is, again, whether you accept it as uh, some sort of a historical account, I don't care. Or if you accept it as pure metaphor. The point here is, he was teaching how to, how to properly interact with people in the world in a non-violent way. But when people were robbing people, which is what the temple money changers were doing, they were defrauding people by creating a monopoly like the Federal Reserve. And defrauding people of their savings and earnings by charging them inordinate amounts of money on temple coins so that they were cleaning up. 
at the expense of everybody else around them because they just didn't give a shit about anybody but themselves. Well, Jesus didn't just stand there and say, oh, okay, I can't get angry about that. I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to point this out. I'm not, not going to make a big uh, you know, confrontation over this. No, he didn't say that. He recognized wrongdoing when it was happening and he took out the switch and whipped their asses because they had no right to do what they were doing. They were morally wrong and should be put in their place. Not put up on a pedestal and say you're the untouchables and you, you nothing can happen to you as a result of your fraud, your theft, your lies. It's the same thing going on today, ladies and gentlemen. And that's why it's that's what it's about. It's a metaphor for the human condition. What's still going on? It's not meant to be taken as a literal, single, individual, anecdotal story or historical account. It's a metaphor. You need to understand the, the in-depth underlying message that is presented in the, the fable or the allegory. But no, we want to stay in the babyfied literalism variant of the, of the Bible. Yeah, good luck with that. It's called being a moron and wanting to stay one. You know, because I'm going to take everything totally literally and never really understand the actual concept or the meaning. New Age Deception number three. We're moving on to slide number 38. We're all one, so it's all good. Again, there's nothing bad. It's just an experience. Like, like in her infinite wisdom, Miss New Age from the... the uh, you know, I didn't really get that angry until a few people brought that up to me afterward. Like, I, I heard it and I was like, oh boy, one of these people, you know, who, who just saw, sat and heard the whole Free, Free Your Mind 2 conference and obviously didn't understand a thing that was said. Um, uh, but, but when I, some other people, uh, especially Jay Parker, really brought that to my atten attention again, it really did sink in and like hit me hard. That what this person is saying is, you know, that there's no such thing as bad experiences, as evil being done directly to people. And this comes out of this notion that we are creating our reality individually. You know, oh, if you were raped as a child, you must have created that somehow. <sighs> that people could be made to believe this bullshit. I just, I can't even believe. I have a hard time believing that this is how malleable that the human mind, the psyche, actually is. That it can be distorted into that condition to accept that. I mean, that person has to be so mentally destroyed to believe that. Children are bringing on their own, own pedophile, you know, torture. Yeah, okay, right. Yeah, and you're not a total retarded person. I mean, let me tell you something. People with Down syndrome have nothing on people who think like that. You know, not, not to make this some kind of a trivi trivial or ad hominem name calling fest, but let me tell you something. I don't look at people with a debilitating genomic disorder as retarded in the same way I look at these people as retarded. I mean, they're not slowed down, they have a disorder, people with Down syndrome. The word retarded is not even as applicable. Somebody who thinks that innocent children who are being raped somehow created that because they're creating their own reality individually as the New Age nonsense teachings are trying to convince people, they're retarded. They're slowed down in their mental capacity and their understanding. That's what a real retarded person looks like. Somebody with Down syndrome was just dealt a bad genetic hand because of something that happened to the human genome, which we'll get into in future episodes. But somebody who thinks that, you know, children are bringing about their own totally violent experiences that are being done to them by someone else, and they think they understand how the laws of attraction work, they are retarded. Meaning they have been slowed down. That's what the word retarded means. Have, having been slowed down. To retard is to slow down progress. 
They have been retarded by this religion called the New Age Movement, which if you believe in it in that way, will turn you into a retard. So, there's no bad experiences. It's all good. Everything is good. Everything that's happening is good. It's just an experience. That's all. Many new, uh, moving on to slide number 39, many new agers tout the concepts such as right and wrong as dualistic, right and wrong or dualistic. Oh, there's no such thing. It's all an experience. There's no right. There's no wrong. I, I, I can't even tell you how many people in the new age movement have told me this and are open about it and are proud of it. When you talk about right and wrong, you're reinforcing duality. No, dunce. Right and wrong exist in nature. The reason that we're in the state of duality in is because that we're in is because we don't understand what rights are. We don't understand what wrongs are. And we're listening to idiots who are telling us that there's no distinction between those two things. So we never exercise judgment about those things and therefore we never actually truly come into conscience, which is actually exercising one con one's conscience is making a willful decision between the objective difference between right and wrong and choosing the right action over the wrong action. And more people than not are not doing that. They're not exercising their conscience for the very reason that they believe in this bullshit called moral relativism. Because that's what this is. The concept that right and wrong are dualistic and therefore they're invalid. They're trying to convince people that everything that happens is okay. It's all good. This is a form of moral relativism. The idea on slide 40, I put the words moral relativism up on the slide, that there's no such thing as right and wrong. Man gets to make that up. It's all just an experience. Nothing is good, nothing is bad, nothing is right, nothing is wrong, nothing is good, nothing is evil. And you know what that's called? It's called bullshit. <coughs> That's what it's called. It's called bullshit. Because if you'll believe that, you'll believe anything. That is just a total naive child's way of looking at the world. And they got people believing that they're somehow spiritually elevated because they no longer accept the, the dichotomy between right and wrong. And again, this is all about accepting that man makes up right and wrong. That's, about, that's what this is about. They're trying to peddle that notion of moral relativism in the New Age movement. They got it peddled really well in government that you could turn a right into a wrong. All you got to do is sign a law about it. You could take someone's right away. Turn it into a wrong that's punishable. Oh, and we can turn a wrong into a right. Oh, these people want to uh, do all this manipulation with people's money and ultimately it results in total theft, the degradation of their savings, the degradation of their investments. Oh, well, that's legal. They did it legally. We passed a law saying you're allowed to do this. So these bankers can't be uh, tried. They're too big to fail, don't you know? We could turn a right, a wrong into a right too, just as easily as we could turn a right like free speech into a wrong. And people believe them. They accept this as true. Because they are under mind control and have their head up their ass. And quite frankly, I'm totally tired of it. I'm tired of it. I don't want to live like this anymore. And in order to stop it, you need to get involved. You can't just say you know and that's good enough. You need to know it to such a deep level that you can communicate it effectively and start doing that to everyone around you. Regardless of what they think. Regardless of how they will receive the message. And the thing that's preventing people from doing that is fear. So the correction to this, slide number 42, New Age correction number three, it's not all good. It is not all good. And I have a picture of Jesus giving people the finger. Trying to add a little bit of comic levity into the situation, but it's actually very serious. That people think that there's no such thing as the difference between right and wrong and everything is good and it's all just an experience and you're judging by saying that action is wrong. 
This is what they want. This is what they're trying to do, to stop right action, which is speaking about what right and wrong are and telling people who are doing wrongs, you have no right to do this. You're wrong. This is morally wrong. It should not be allowed to stand. You should not be allowed to continue to do this. We're going to hold you accountable. They don't want that. They want moral relativism because then they can continue to get away with whatever crimes they want. Get people to accept that something is moral in one area and immoral in another area. The same thing, the same behavior. Oh, at some, one time that was that was immoral. Now we magically pass the law and now it becomes okay. Or at one time that was okay and now we magically pass the law and it becomes not okay. You know, you got to understand the laws of man are written in a way that it totally, totally expresses that the people who are writing this are moral relativists. They believe that there's no such thing as actual objective right and wrong. It's not based, man's law is not based on morality. It's not based on rights. They don't know what rights are. This is the whole problem. This is what human evolution is leading to, is the deep knowledge of what a right is by developing the deep knowledge of what a wrong is. You need to know what a wrong is to understand what a right is. Now, now here's what right and wrong are. The essence of right and wrong on slide number 43. There is an objective, definitive, natural difference that exists in creation inherently between right and wrong. Right is that which is true. It is based in truth. It is correct. We say that something is morally right and we say something is correct and we call it right for the same, for a, a good reason. They are one and the same. That which is based in truth is in harmony with natural law because natural law is truth. So to say something is correct, it's based in truth, it is right. Rights are based in truth. To say something is right and mean that it is moral is because it is in harmony with natural law. Therefore it is moral, therefore it is a right. When our actions are based in righteousness, they do not result in harm to others. That's it. If you're doing something that is one of your rights, harm is not being conducted to another person. Soon as harm to another person becomes involved, you don't have the right to that action. If you're physically harming someone, if you're defrauding someone of their rights, if you're defrauding someone of their property or damaging their property or their security in their place of in, in their place of living, you do not have the right. You are no longer in the right. You have crossed the line over to the other side called wrong because you're causing harm. Wrong, we use the term to mean both incorrect, you're wrong about that, it's not correct, and immoral. What you did was wrong. It harmed someone else. And there's a reason we use the word wrong for both of these in English. Because when something is not based in truth, it goes in opposition to natural law. Like authority and jurisdiction and government and false religion. So that's what this New Age movement is trying to obfuscate. It's trying to keep people from the simple understanding of this dichotomy that exists in nature. It isn't duality in the mind of man. Because right and wrong don't exist in the mind of man. They exist in nature. They're part of the natural world. They're part of the universe. They're inherent to the universe itself. When actions are based in wrongdoing, it leads to harm to others. It results in harm to others. Real simple. So when you say, oh, an experience isn't right or wrong, it isn't positive or negative, wrong. If an experience is in harmony with natural law, then it's right. And it should continue. It should be allowed to exist. It's, people should not try to shut that activity down. Because they don't have a right to shut down a right. Because in doing so, they'd be committing a wrong. When an experience is resulting in harm, when somebody's having a harmful experience because something is, somebody is causing harm to them, it's not just an experience. It's called a wrongdoing. It's in opposition to natural law and should not be allowed to continue to go on unchallenged. 
So stop giving me this bullshit that things are just experiences and they're not good or bad and they're not based in right and wrong. Nonsense. This is total new age bullshit. And you need to know the difference between right and wrong. That's what it's all about. That's why we're on this planet. Continuing with the correction to it's all good, when in fact it is not all good, the knowledge of right and wrong is conscience. Unless you really understand what rights and wrongs are, you do not truly have a developed conscience. So that woman who says it's all just an experience, does she really, is conscience truly born inside of her? The answer is no. And I'll tell you what, you ask, again, like I said, you ask people about, you know, go back in time, ask people in Nazi Germany, did, do you really have a conscience? Do you truly know the difference between right and wrong? They would have said immediately, right to your face, yes, absolutely, I do. And they'd be total liars. They would be totally lying to your face thinking that they're telling you the truth. And you know what? It's no different in the United States today. You tell people that believe in government that you truly do not really deeply in your own being really understand the difference between right and wrong and they'll get so offended that they'll want to do violence unto you. Because you're telling them you don't really have conscience. Common sense and conscience are not truly born inside of your being. You have not been born again. The second birth. The physical birth into the world of manifestation, into the physical realm, is the first birth. First birth. The true development of the knowledge, holding the knowledge of right and wrong inside of you is the second birth being born again into conscience into the definitive knowledge between right and wrong the word conscience comes from latin wow surprisingly you know people don't even understand how many words come from the latin language and greek as well as we'll see later the word con, the prefix con in Latin, when you tack it onto a word, it means together, with, together, part of. The Latin verb scio, schiere. Scio is the first person present tense, schiere is the infinitive. Schiere is what we base the word science on, the second part of the word conscience, con science. Schiere means to know. Conscience literally means to know together. And what conscience is, is knowledge. People don't understand that. When you tell them conscience is knowledge, people get confused. They think conscience is action. Conscience is not action. Exercising conscience is action. Conscience is knowledge, common sense, to know together, to know together, literally, to know together, schiere con, to know together, common sense, to be able to sense together, in common. It is the knowledge of the objective difference between right and wrong. The inherent and objective difference between right and wrong that is not subjective and is not based in human perception. It wouldn't matter if there was no human perception, right and wrong would still exist in nature. They are not constructs of man. They are based in what is. They are based in truth. They are based in natural law. They come out of natural law, which is the law that governs consequences of right and wrong behavior. So, on slide number 45, I simply put up there that that is what conscience is, common sense. People don't see it like that. They don't think of it like that because they don't understand the true meaning of the word. 
Moving on to slide number 46. Continuing with this New Age correction of it's all good. See, this comes from the idea that everything is duality. And thinking right and wrong, oh, good and evil, that, those are dualistic notions. Just like we think that spirituality is all about total transcendence of matter. The New Agers believe, oh, we're going to ascend out of this realm. Yeah, yeah, we're going to get seven foot tall light bodies. I've heard this one. We're going to ascend into angelic form of beings that, you know, are these, these light bodies and we're going to go to Andromeda. Yep, that's what's going to happen when we don't even understand the difference between right and wrong. Yep. Good luck with that. Let me know how that works out for ya. Okay? I mean, it's a child. Th this mentality is a child who wants to hear what they want to hear. Forget about what is or what's true. That's meaningless. I have my beliefs, and they get crazier and crazier and crazier, and what's real, forget it. I'm putting on these glasses, and I can't see the real world. These are my Andromeda glasses. You know? I see all the spacecrafts in the sky coming down to rescue us from our immorality when I put these glasses on. Don't you know? Yep. See, this whole notion comes out of the idea of the primacy of either spirit or matter. And again, here's another one of these slides that is going to upset people. Everybody. Everybody. Because most people are in this schism. That either one or the other is primal. One or the other is superior to the other. You have scientific materialists. That, oh, matter is primal. Matter is superior. It's the root of everything. You know? And um, we're going to delve into the world of matter by building bigger and bigger and bigger colliders to look for smaller and smaller and smaller particles. And we'll get down to the essence of what this all is. Because it's not infinity in both directions. No. We'll find the basic building block of everything. And it'll reveal all the secrets of nature to us because, hey, everything is this big machine. There's no free will. Oh, it's all big machine. It's a dead thing. And matter is going to unlock all the answers. Then you have the New Agers and the religionists. Oh, spirit is primary to everything. It doesn't matter what happens in the physical world to a point where, oh, you just need to believe something. Forget about what's going on in the physical. This world is, is transitory and it, it doesn't even matter what happens here. Doesn't matter. You know, it takes matter out of the picture. The actual happenings. What on earth is, is happening is irrelevant. So oh, that's all in the, in the physical domain and that, that's meaningless. So spiritualists and, you know, those who buy into religionism, you know, and the New Agers, all think spirit is primary to matter. And it's superior to matter. Matter is inferior to spirit. Just like scientific materialists believe that the matter is primary and it, it's superior to spirit. Or there is no spirit. And both of these views are totally imbalanced. One comes from the primacy of matter, comes from a totally left-brain imbalanced worldview. The primacy of spirit comes from a totally imbalanced right-brain worldview. What we need to understand on these two simple slides, if people could get, really get this, what's depicted on these two very simple slides, what I call the non-duality of spirit and matter, is that they are, they are one and the same. The spiritual realm is the physical realm. The physical realm is the spiritual realm. This is where it all occurs. This is where all the lessons are learned. You're not going anywhere else. You've got to be here now and get the lesson. Nobody's coming to rescue us from ourselves in our own ignorance. You're here for a reason. You're here to learn the lesson that it will help us to transcend this condition and actually be free. So we can go on to do incredible things and truly evolve. Then maybe we'll evolve into some other form at some future point way, way, way in the future. But we're not there yet. And I'm not worried about that now. Because I'm here now trying to do active work on the ground in the real world. Not thinking about when is Zoroaster going to come and rescue me? When are the, uh, uh, you know, um, 
Andromedans or the um, Pleiadians coming down in their big craft to transfer our minds into the big light bodies that they're promising us and take us off to a place where there's no violence and slavery. Well, that ain't gonna, how it's going to happen. This is all childish nonsense because people don't want to understand that hard work has to be done here. Deep understanding has to be developed here by reading, by working with yourself, by working with the shadow material in your own subconscious mind, which no one wants to do. By understanding the nature of the human psyche and in doing so we'll understand the nature of the universe. No, that self-knowledge is hard won. It is hard fought for and it is hard won based on where we're at. That's why so many people are loath to do that great work. We have to understand neither of these aspects of creation, spirit and matter, are primal to each other, are superior. Neither are inferior. They are all part of the one and the all. Again, you want to know where the spiritual realm is? It's right here. And the people who think there is no spirit, they're just equally as imbalanced. You know? That, that, the, that the material, physical aspects of existence are all that exist. Well, there is a spiritual domain, and it is right here. Spirit is not superior to matter. Matter is not superior to spirit. Get it through your head, folks. Understand these are one and the same. We need to understand that's where the duality that is destructive lies. In people thinking that these are two separate things. And warring over the primacy of either one of them. So, let's move on to New Age Deception number four. You can never really know. Oh, we started on this one on day one, didn't we? You can never really know. There's no such thing as truth or knowledge. It's all a matter of subjective opinion. You know, because perception is all that exists in the universe. Nothing can be sure to exist except perception. Nothing can be known about what actually occurred. Nothing can be known about how the laws of nature work. Nothing can be known about the self. Oh no, these are all just subjective opinions. Everybody's opinion is just equally as valid as everybody else's. That person's uninformed opinion is as good as this person's years of study and knowledge. Yeah, okay. Yep, and people believe it. And you know what these people are called? They're called solipsists. Solipsism is the religion they believe in. And this is a big part of the New Age movement. You constantly hear, all I know is that I know nothing. Well, let me tell you something, folks. Nobody's going to tell me that I know nothing because I know quite a bit. I don't know everything. I would never make such a ridiculous, nonsensical, and arrogant claim. But what I will tell people that I know just about all there is to know about is what is necessary to free humanity from the current condition that it's in. That I know quite a bit about. And I'm not afraid to tell people I know that. I don't think I know it. It's not a belief. It is not based on my perceptions. I have uncovered and discovered that knowledge and I know it. I hold it within me. In my consciousness. So don't tell me I know nothing or that I should be so humble as to say I know nothing. I'm not telling you that knowledge makes me some kind of a superman, but don't tell me I don't hold it. I don't know it. And and I'm not the first. I won't be the last. I'm nobody special for having known that. It's like saying you're special because you know the earth is generally spherical. You know, it's like a ball and it's not a flat disc. Well, it's knowledge. You're not the first, you won't be the last. You're nobody special for having known that. I'm nobody special. I don't have any superhuman powers because I know what I know. I'm humble about it in that regard. That doesn't make me some kind of a superman that's better than other people or has more rights than other people. It does make me a more moral individual than most other people. It does make me a more knowledgeable individual than most other people, and I'm not going to be so humble to say that's not true. It is true. 
That doesn't mean I have any extra rights than anybody else, and it doesn't mean I have any magical powers that I had to use to acquire that knowledge. I acquired it through hard work that other people don't want to do. And so they want to stay in their ignorance and therefore bind me and other people who have done that work into chains. And I'm here to let you know we're not going to accept those chains. You're going to have to take us out of physical manifestation because we ain't accepting those chains in the physical realm. It ain't going to happen. So I put here on slide number 48 this picture of, you know, this was a show. I don't know if it still is. It was called You Don't Know Jack. You know, some trivia show or whatever. But it's the, the concept that you can never really know anything. Let me tell you something. Satanists want to push this harder than anything else. And they consider it one of their sins. You look into the satanic sins. Just type that in. I've talked about it before on past podcasts and actually posted it on the podcast I did on Satanism. Solipsism is listed as one of the main satanic sins. Because they want to peddle this notion to other people as a religion. And and propagate it. They want other people in solipsistic mindset. But they don't they don't accept solipsism. They look at that as that's one of the greatest evils to think that there's no such thing as truth. No, because they have to learn the truth and hoard it and occult it from other people, from preventing them from learning it and therefore maintaining their hegemony and control system. Of course they know that there's truth. And they want other people thinking that there is no such thing. So they, while they consider solipsism a sin for them, they want to propagate it for as many other people as they can. That's how they can keep people in control. So slide number 49 explains what solipsism is and, of course, where it came from. Imagine this. It came from the Latin language. Wow, I can't even imagine that these words have all come from Latin. You know, people who don't have a Latin dictionary or Latin reader in their home, I don't know, what, I don't know what's wrong with you. Because you need to be devouring that stuff and understanding where words we speak came from. And you will look up roots of words and you will piss your pants that you did were not able to see that before. You won't even comprehend how could I have been saying this word my whole life and not really knowing what it means. The word solipsism comes from Latin. And it comes from the adjective solus, meaning alone, by oneself. No one else there, just you. Solus. Solitary, in other words. Okay? Soul, one. Solitary. Second part of the word, ipsi, ipsi, ipse, right? Comes from the Latin, so you have soul and then ipsism, ipsism. Soul ips, that's the root. And then ism is tacked on, meaning it's a belief system. All right, so the word, the IPS part of solipsism comes from ipse in Latin. Ipse means the self. So alone by oneself, all alone, nobody else there, nothing but you. It's all about me. It's all about my perceptions. There's no no such thing as anything that's objective. Anything that's objective. And the New Agers have bought into this. Oh, there's nothing outside of the self. Yeah, I get the notion. What What we're actually being within internally is what's creating the external reality that we experience collectively in the aggregate. But don't think that means that you are creating the universe, that you yourself are creating the entire reality that is being experienced by everyone. Because that's just a total selfish, ego-inflated notion that there's nothing but you. And I understand the concept that we're all one, but this is not what it means. It does not mean there's no no other individuated units of consciousness having an experience here on the earth. In the physical domain, which is no different than the spiritual domain, to understand what it is and to learn and grow. No one individuated unit of consciousness is creating the shared experience. This is total nonsense. 
and it's called solipsism. The idea that there's no such thing as truth and that your perceptions are generating everything and that there's nothing else that's outside of perception. There's no objective reality. This is total nonsense. Solipsism is defined as the, ide- as the ideology that only one's own mind is sure to exist. Solipsists contend that knowledge of anything outside of one's own mind is unsure. Hence, there is no objective reality and nothing is known. Nothing about the external world and its workings can truly be known. Think about that. You can know nothing about the universe. You can know nothing about law that exists in the universe. You can know nothing about natural law. You can know nothing about morality. You can know nothing about the difference between right and wrong. You can know nothing about anything except whatever your perceptions happen to be at the time. I mean, the arrogance, the utter, the unmitigated gall and ego of anybody to believe this total ludicrousy. This total ludicrous information, this ideology that has absolutely no bearing on reality. There is nothing objective outside of your perceptions. And what you're saying is, you are God. I get to make up what everything is. I get to make up over whether anything is true or not. doesn't make a difference what actually is. doesn't make a difference with what actually is occurring. There's no such thing as what is. No such thing as truth. I'm making it all up as I go along. I mean, imagine this. This totally discounts every other person. You're basically saying, I'm the only one here. You're not real. You don't matter. What's that going to do about people's belief of rights or understanding of rights, I should say? It's going to throw it right out the window. Because, hey, you're not even real. You can't possibly have rights. There's no such thing as the difference between right and wrong because there's no such thing as truth. And if right and wrong are supposedly based in truth, they can't exist because truth doesn't exist. Therefore, you don't matter. Anything that happens to you doesn't matter. I mean, people say there's not, you know, there can't really be any such thing as solipsism. I, I tend to agree because then you believe you don't matter. You know, start doing something harmful to to somebody who says they're a solipsist. And watch how much they say you have no right to do this. Well, hey, I don't exist. There's no such thing as right and wrong. I'm unsure even to exist in your mind. It's just, it's, it's, it's infancy. This is spiritual infancy. Spiritual infancy. And ultimately, what it is, is total bullshit. (coughs) It's total bullshit, ladies and gentlemen. Anybody who believes this has been bullshitted. Into accepting something that's total nonsense, isn't real, is never going to be real, and it's just, it's there to keep the mind in chains and shackles, so you can't actually perceive what really is, and learn the truth. See, I'll move into slide 51 here. This is the correction to this idea that there's, you know, uh, you can't really ever really know anything. Truth exists independently of perception. Perception and truth are two different things. Contrary to popular belief and the, the, the asinine saying that perception is reality. This is completely untrue. Perception is not reality. Perception is just that, a viewpoint. That's what it means, to see through. See through the windows of an individuated unit of consciousness. You're seeing through the lens of an experience. That's perception. That doesn't mean that reality does not exist independently of perception. That which actually does occur is what we're talking about as truth. Truth is a collapse of a wave function into a point, an an actual event that does occur, that does undergo what has been called, has been referred to as the formality of actually taking place, of actual occurrence. 
And that's all I'm talking about when I talk about truth. I'm not talking about the underlying reasons for existence and the totality of the mind of God or any such super abstract concepts. I'm talking about what has occurred. The truth is that which has occurred in the past and is happening now. There is no such thing as the truth existing in the future. Truth is what happened 100,000 years ago, 100 years ago, last week, two seconds ago, because it occurred. All the possibilities that could have happened in the, the wave function eventually collapsed on the present moment and created the reality that was experienced in that time, called the past. And all that those possibilities are being collapsed in every present moment as we move through this construct that we call time. So the truth exists in the past and in the now. And nowhere else. The future hasn't been created yet. I could make something different happen that might not have occurred if I can make a different decision. If I choose to pick up this book and throw it across the room, that's what will have occurred in the future. If I don't choose to do that, then it will not have occurred and that will be the truth. Truth is that which has occurred. And we stop, need to stop looking at these outrageous, overblown, attempted definitions of what truth is. We need to take it down to the simple. Truth is that which has occurred. That's it. It's real simple. The truth is simple. It's knowable. We're not talking about anything more complex than that when I'm referring to the term truth. Okay? So if you have this notion in your head that I'm talking about some wildly extravagant notion of what I'm calling truth, uh, get that out of your mind and understand I'm taking it down to a very simple understanding of events which have occurred, which have taken place. So when we, our task as a human being is to align our perception to the truth, to align it with. Truth is like a line that does not waver. It does not waver. It's that which is. It's steady. What wavers is our perception. So looking at slide 51, and a, a few people told me that they really liked this uh, allegorical or uh, modeling, this, this way of modeling truth versus perception as a wave function, because that's what it is. Truth is not a wave. It does not waver. It is a line. It is something that is the way that it is at all times and places. That's it. It's what is. Perception wavers. It comes into accordance with truth at certain place, places as the wave moves, and it goes out of alignment. Now, when you have a low frequency wave, it has a long wavelength. So it hits the line that represents the zero point axis very infrequently, meaning it has low frequency. The less frequently it hits the line means it has a low frequency. Well, this is what inaccurate perception is. It's low frequency. When we talk about perception being related to frequency, where someone is at in consciousness, they're at a low frequency or a high frequency, it means their ability to align their perception with truth, with reality. And that is our work. Our work is to align our perception with reality so that we raise our frequency. And in doing so, you can see that this middle wave is a higher frequency, a shorter wavelength. Therefore, it comes into contact with the line in the same distance, in the same you know uh, uh, amount of time. It comes into alignment with the truth much more frequently, the places where the line hits the axis, which represents the truth. Then when we go up to the highest frequency, it comes into alignment or touches the line the most frequently. Therefore, it is the highest frequency. And I hope that's clear to people and they understand what I'm talking about with this model. And that's the best way that I think that I can explain it. So perception isn't reality. What our work is, is to come up to a higher frequency so that we're open 
to receiving truth and therefore aligning our perception to that which is. The next part about this correction that I'm offering related to that you can never really know anything and that you know perception is reality is uh, explaining what solipsism really is. Solipsism is a defining hallmark of spiritual infancy, as I said before. This is slide number 52. Departing from this diseased ideology is a surefire sign of the beginnings of human maturity and true spiritual development. Solipsism is spiritual infancy. We have to understand that there is true objective reality. And that's what we have to strive to understand, to grasp the truth about what is, regardless of how scary it may be, regardless of how uncomfortable it may be, and regardless of how much we may not want to face that reality. Objective reality does exist. This is on slide number 53 now. The truth can be known. Rights are inherent to creation itself and are based in truth and natural law. Those who don't know what rights are will never say no to those who attempt to take their rights away. This is the concept. If you don't know, K-N-O-W, you won't know, N-O. You won't say no. The lost word, which we'll get to. Those who don't know won't say no. You have to know what rights are. Slide number 54. Know your rights. Don't think you know them. Don't believe. Know what they are because you know the difference between right and wrong. And once you know that, you will be in a position to say no. I don't know how many times I used the word no in that altercation with these criminal thugs from the federal government thinking that they're God. I must have said no a hundred times to them or more. That's the word that drains them of all their so their illusions that they're in control and that they're in power. When people say no, the lost word, the word of all power, you take all your power back, you stop externalizing it, you internalize power when you use that word. And they need to be, that word needs to be said to them in a big way. Every time they ask me, do I understand? No, I do not understand. Just like that. All right, so that's the correction to the idea that nothing can be known. You can never really know anything. Nobody has any knowledge. Next, deception. New Age deception number five. Accept accept, accept, but never resist. Never resist anything. Resistance creates more of what you're getting. Yeah, just sit and accept it. Take it. Accept. And again, this is all hallmarks of right brain imbalance. Right brain imbalance is about acceptance. And they're not talking about acceptance of what is. They're talking about acceptance of the world in its current condition. And many of them will be very honest about that. You have to accept the world as it is. No, I need to accept the truth as it is. The world as it is is a completely different thing because that is changeable. And that's what we're going to get to here. What should be accepted and what should be rejected. What should be resisted. What should be changed by our power to change it. And the difference, knowing the difference between those two states, those two things, what can be changed and what cannot be changed, what should be changed. So we'll talk about that in the solution part to this fifth deception. But the fir- there's different parts to this deception. And again, on slide number 55, I put a picture of George Bush Jr. and Dick Cheney as the Borg saying resistance is futile. You know, and that's ultimately what sick psychopathic control freaks, by putting out all this new age nonsense, want people to believe. Resistance is futile, when in fact resistance is, resistance to tyrants is obedience to the creator. Resistance will ultimately lead the way to freedom and victory in this spiritual war. It is not futile. Resistance is everything. And anybody who doesn't know that knows 
squat about real spirituality. So there's different components to this particular deception because it's such a big one. Getting people to stand down, to accept their lot in life. There's different components to getting them to do that. The first is the total abuse, the improper usage, the abuse, abuse, meaning not using it, you're abusing it. The wrong usage of meditation and yoga. And I want to touch on this for a while. The New Age movement has been twisting these spiritual practices of meditation and yoga into means to take people's minds off the fact that they have been enslaved and to make it easy for, the, for them to accept the current condition of the world as their lot in life. And anybody that isn't looking at meditation and yoga as it's being used and so-called practiced in the New Age community and says that that's not exactly how it's being used, you're not paying attention. Because this is exactly the reason they're using it for. Come and meditate. It'll help you deal with your job better. It'll deal, it'll deal with your slave job a whole lot better. Because you, you won't care about how your soul is being insulted you won't care about how you're following other people's immoral orders. You won't care about how you're being used as a tool and your place of employment doesn't give a shit about you. No. Go and meditate on it for hours and hours and hours until you finally accept. This is your lot in life, slave. And that's what the New Age version, the New Age variant of meditation is largely about. And there'll be people who will deny this and say, no, that's not what they're using it for. Nonsense. That's exactly what they're using it for. Yoga is the same way. Oh, go do yoga just to trim up the body, to look attractive, you know. Uh, and it's also to help you to just accept things, accept things that they say you can't change. I know that's nonsense. It can be changed if enough will is developed. There are things you can't change and no amount of yoga or meditation will ever change those things because they're inherent to creation. They weren't set into motion by man. They weren't created by man. Man is bound by them eternally and you're never going to change those things. That's what you have to accept. Meditation and yoga isn't going to help you accept those things. They're what are regardless of what you do. And those th that's called natural law. So, the second part to this deception of stand down, accept, 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 never rebel, never resist, is don't react to anything. How many people in the New Age movement have I heard this from? Oh, you're, you're getting angry about that. That's reactive. You should never react to anything. You should just watch it. Just observe it. Which is a totally irresponsible teaching of the observer principle and observer effect. Whereas observation is very critical. But you have to be observing that which is true and real. Not what you want to be there. Not what you are comfortable seeing or hearing. That which actually is. When people are saying don't react to anything, what this is translating to in the minds of most people who follow the quote-unquote new age teachings is never take any action to try to change the things that are wrong with this world. That's what people are really hearing. Because they're not hearing don't react. They're, what they're really saying to people and the message that's being received is don't act. Don't take action. Again, taking out the sacred masculine out of the equation. Don't take any action in the world to try to change it. Accept. Accept. Again, this is the total bastardization and the total irresponsible use of the, the feminine, the right brain energy. It is about acceptance of truth, not acceptance of what's wrong and saying you should never strive to change that by your will. I mean, that's a disgrace to the concept of the sacred feminine, a disgrace to it. So what they're telling people is don't act. The third part of this deception, this multifold deception of stand down and never resist and accept everything, is the concept of what you resist persists. 
How many times I've heard this? How many times have you heard this from a new ager? What you resist persists. Which is a complete misunderstanding of the principle that was originally be trying, trying to be taught. Okay, It means when you resist truth, you're going to get more of what you don't want. So what you don't want is going to persist. When you refuse to look at what's there, when you refuse to accept what is actually happening and taking place. And this is what so many New Agers are doing, ignoring the truth. What this translates to is don't resist evil, just let it run rampant and destroy everything that is good. Because resistance is wrong. You'll get more of the same when you resist. Absolute total nonsense and bullshit. And I put on here this slide to, you know, let's even out the, the dynamic here. We put some uh, psychopathic Republicans who are, you know, satanic in the first uh, uh, aspect of this. Let's balance it out with, uh, you know, this communist who's in the White House now, who's also a psychopath. Definitely not a dark occultist. He's just one of their puppets, you know. So... Uh, it's Obama dressed as the Borg saying resistance is futile. Freedom is irrelevant. The Constitution is irre irre irrelevant. Your culture will adapt to service us. Surrender your weapons. Yeah. And how many people believe this nonsense? It's all to cut out the sacred masculine component of the consciousness and get people to accept slavery. To accept slavery. So, the last part of this deception is that you, there should never be any confrontation. Okay, so we had the abuse of meditation and yoga. Don't react to anything. What you resist persists and no confrontation. So there's never a time for confrontation. You should never confront anyone else on their nonsense. You should never rock the boat, create confrontative situations. Oh, that's bad. That's always bad. You know? You should just let people think what they think and that's it. Let them think all the wrong things that they think even though that's directly causing harm to other human beings. You should never tell them that they're wrong. Never say you should, you shouldn't. And of course, there's never a time to physically rebel to physically resist and use force against an oppressive, violent attacker. Oh no. No, that's what the police are there for. We don't have the right to use that natural, inherent human right to defend ourselves. I ask these people, you think what the American revolutionaries did was not right? You think they somehow engaged the wrong by beating the British back? And you think somehow it would be a wrong if we ha it had to come to a point where when rights are totally being oppressed and usurped, that people would use physical force? No, that would not be a wrong. You are wrong. You don't understand that there is, is a time to use defensive force against an oppressor. Because you have been brainwashed into the notion that there's no such thing as a difference between violence, which no one has a right to do to other people, and force, which is a defensive capacity that is a natural right of humanity. And this is what New Agers don't understand. And, you know, I'll tell you what. I mean, I've met people that have come out of that brainwashing as well. I want to even say, I want to even acknowledge and say someone's name. Um, someone who I felt in the past did not quite understand the difference between violence and force. Now I feel fully does. And he's given great talks on this. And, um, you know, I've heard, uh, you know, talks that he's given about the non-aggression principle and the self-defense principle hand in hand uh, is Darren Wolf. He works with Truth, Freedom, Prosperity. He actually spoke at uh, a past uh, end the Fed rally. He spoke at a, a gun rights rally in uh, Norristown a while back. And I think he's come to a great understanding of not only the non-aggression principle, which he already had a good understanding of, he's come to a good understanding of the self-defense principle. And more people need to develop that understanding. You know? 
Because if they continue in this new age mindset, they're never going to be willing to stand up for themselves, even when they're being thrown into a gulag or a prison camp. Because what this all boils down to is this idea that you should just accept, 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 never try to create change, never do anything uh, to take actual physical action, uh, it just continue to accept something because resistance is somehow making that continue to happen, and that there's never any time for confrontation. What this whole deception boils down to is one big crock of bullshit. <coughs> That's exactly what it is, folks. And it stinks to high heaven. And we need to recognize it as such. To recognize it as such. Now let me offer the correction for this part number five. And I'll take them in order. Because we, we broke down this deception into f basically four parts. The first one was just generally acceptance or you could say it's f five parts so accept everything is the main part the main thing just accept and never never try to change anything never rebel never resist never use the will to create actively create change this is all left out of the new age movement oh don't try to be an influence on other people you can't change anybody else yeah, I understand. I can't make that change happen, but I can influence another person to change themselves. And not only can I do it, I have done that. And sometimes I get so totally down and depressed over what's going on in the world that I think that I have not done that. I know that I have. I haven't done it in, in the scale that I would like to see it happen at or uh, because I can't do that myself. And I'm admitting that I can't make that influential change start to happen in other people by myself. I can't be that influence alone by myself. It's impossible for one person to do that. I can speak it into the world. I can put it down in different forms of media to try to preserve it for people. But I do not have that power to do that myself. No one does. The only way that's going to start happening on a mass scale is if enough people start to use that power, start to use that influence by speaking to other people and influencing their behavior to change and helping them understand what they need to understand to make that change within themselves. So the first part about this, I want to just talk about the difference between acceptance and creating change by an act of will. And I'm going to use the Prayer of Serenity to illustrate this. This is by Reinhold Niebuhr. And this prayer is given in a very distorted and diluted form, a watered-down form. We don't hear the original of this when you hear it in 12-step programs, Alcoholics Anonymous, Gambling Anonymous, Gamblers Anonymous, and all these other programs, self so-called self-help programs. They give a watered-down version of this prayer. I'm going to give you the original undiluted version. And here it is. God, give me the grace to accept with serenity the things that can not be changed. Notice already how different that is from the common everyday variant. God, grant me, give me grace to accept with serenity the things that can not be changed. The courage, courage to change the things which should be changed. Now, let me ask you something. But before I even finish this, okay? Why have the terms cannot be and should be, why have those two terms been sanitized from the new version. You just think about that for a moment. And let me let me finish the prayer and then we'll go back to talk about that. Give me the grace to accept with serenity the things that cannot be changed, the courage to change the things which should be changed, and the wisdom to distinguish the one from the other. Now we don't hear that as the 
modern day variant of the prayer of serenity. We hear it as, let me try to paraphrase it, grant me the serenity to change the things I can change, accept the things I cannot change, and the wisdom to know the difference. Now, you see how much less powerful that is? It's based in the ego. I, the word I is not in the the prayer. It's a give me, give to me something, okay? But it's not saying the things I cannot change, meaning little things that go on in my life. It's not saying those things cannot be changed. That that which cannot be changed is natural law. That's what has to be accepted with serenity. We need to accept with serenity that which we are incapable of changing because they are inherent natural laws that act as boundary conditions to behavior in creation. You're, You're never going to change that. It's going to exist eternally for as long as the universe exists, which will be eternally. The things that cannot be changed, and then they sanitize that to the things that I can't change. It's a watered-down, sanitized variant of something that is very powerful if it's properly understood. The courage to change the things which should be changed. It says nothing about what's going on in my life. This says nothing about my immediate situation, meaning my personal life. The courage to change the things which should be changed. That means on a grand scale, change injustices that are taking place. Change consciousness. Help other people to change consciousness, which is what the real great work is and why nobody wants to get involved in the real great work, why there are so few people doing it. The wisdom to distinguish the one from the other, mean, meaning, do you know that which cannot be changed, natural law? And do you know which, that which should be changed and can be changed in an act of our will? Do you know what is capable of being changed? And this is what people think, that this condition of slavery, the human condition, cannot be changed. They believe that. They've been conditioned into believing that. Well, a human condition can be changed. It is a matter of will. Will it be changed? That is a function of the human will. What will you do? See, that to change it, it lies in the, the changed state lies in the future. Hence the word will. Have you used the will to create change? I have. And I've created change. I, I've been doing this since years in the past, and as a result, pe- people have changed and in, in an act of will, meaning as I spoke information over time into the future, into the future state, what will be was changed. And, I, you know, you can say, I influenced that change. I wouldn't say I did it. I didn't make it happen. I influenced it by putting information that is true out into the world. And as a result, other people change themselves. That's what an alchemist is. Somebody who can give people the tools, to help to give people the tools to change themselves. I shouldn't say give people. It doesn't come from the alchemist. It doesn't come from the practitioner of the great work. It's, it's a, let, let me try to accurately phrase this. The alchemist helps to show people the tools with which they can use to change themselves. He, he, he will show them that tool set that's there that he used to change himself. And then in doing so, say, hey, you can do the same thing. You just have to know how to use these tools. That's it. Now you can do it. And he can't do it for them. It's an impossibility. He can only show them the door. They have to walk through it. He can show them the way they have to set foot on that path without fear. So, very important distinction to make between acceptance and the will to change something. 
not just accepting what should be changed. You're using your will to actually change it. So, in the next slide, slide 63, I put like a little, simple, um, modern variant of it. Accept what you can't change and change what you can't accept. I think that summarizes it nicely. And what I would say should never be accepted, which is injustice and wrongdoing and violence and slavery, should never be accepted. So change them. Use your will to change them. They can be changed. The will has to just be developed enough to change it. And that's done by speaking the truth. That's where it starts. Accept what you can't change. Understand natural law. Accept it. What I would say is, yes, you do have to accept that without resistance. The more you resist that, because again, that's not a condition of mankind. That is put here by a force that is the boundary conditions of the universe. You are not going to change those laws. You can rage all you want against gravity, against magnetism, elect, against electrical forces, against how the, 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 the physical matter in the universe operates and works and moves. You are not going to change the laws that govern those things. No more than you are going to change the laws that govern behavior. That are not written by man. That are unseen occulted forces that exist in nature. There are boundary conditions to the universe which the intelligent, dynamic, creative force of, of creation itself set into motion and put into effect and put into uh, conditions that are binding in our life. No man is ever going to change those things. Get over it. Accept it. And that doesn't make this universe a prison. These are the guiding boundary conditions that will guide us to our highest evolutionary progression if we accept them. Because that's the truth. We have to accept the truth, accept what is, accept natural law. And the, the condition that we're currently in, because we've rejected that, can be changed. We need to understand that's the wisdom to know the one from the other. That condition is capable of being changed. It's not it's something that's eternal. It's not nat The human condition of slavery is not natural law. God did not make us eternally into slaves. Sorry, wrong. To just hint at some things I'm going to talk about in the future, maybe the gods, with a little g, did make us into slaves, but that doesn't mean that that has to be the eternal human condition. The true creator did not make that condition. We are capable of transcending it if we understand the boundary conditions known as natural law. So the right use of meditation and yoga. Let's get into this as a new age correction. Meditation's correct usage is for balancing the brain when it has been chronically left brain dominant. The word meditation actually means to take to the middle. To come to the middle. And that's what you are doing if you are chronically left brain imbalanced and you're using a right brain consciousness modality called meditation in its proper usage. You're attempting to balance the brain hemispheres. You're not sitting there meditating endlessly because you want to ignore the world, because you want to get high on the endorphins that meditation often creates, or because you want to be able to put up with other people's bullshit better, like at your work or your family, or anything like that. These are abuses of meditation. The proper use is to help to heal the polarity that has resulted as a result of all the different mind control techniques and the, the crap that's in food and air and water that has imbalanced and, and the media, the, the, the sick you know, conditioning forms of media and all the propaganda that has imbalanced the, left bra the, the brain toward the left brain hemisphere. Meditation can help to bring the brain to balance if it's used properly. Similarly, yoga has a proper usage. Yes, okay, part of it is to make the body healthy, but it, its true usage is to help us to discover what our true work is. 
That's what yoga means, is work. What the, the physical, getting all the physical endorphins and the physical you know, energy flowing in the body is to put us into a proper balanced bodily state so that we will go and do the true work to motivate us to do that work. And speaking of which, um, I just want to tell the listeners, uh, because I've been saying the term great work, uh, you know, over and over, and I'm going to talk about it later, too. Uh, I just want to say thanks to a listener named Gary, who made me a beautiful plaque, a wooden plaque carved in the labor of love. Uh, I just want to say, acknowledge this publicly, that this is one of the nicest gifts I've ever received, and I understand that this gentleman made it because he really values the information that's being put forward on this entire series. And um, uh, it's the symbol of the, the great work that I talked about in the symbol, you know, symbolism section and when I went into Freemasonry and things like that, uh, that says, One great work, truth, love, freedom, with the all-seeing eye uh, prominently in the center of the, of the seal. And he carved this... It, it, looks to me like it was hand dremeled, if I'm not mistaken, uh, out of uh, a light wood and then painted beautifully. Um, just a, a, a beautiful gesture, and I just want to say thank you publicly uh, to this gentleman for doing this, because I could tell it was a tremendous lab labor of um, love for the great work itself. So, um, I'll... I'll uh, uh, display a picture of it with the podcast as well. So just wanted to say that. So there are right usages of meditation and yoga. They should not, you should not throw out the baby with the bath water as the saying goes because the New Age movement is largely use, abusing these things and they're making a lot of money off of them and they're not really teaching people what their true usage is. So uh, that's part of this correction. Another part of this correction is that this whole thing is always about the suppression of the masculine, which was the subtitle of this whole presentation, the suppression of the sacred masculine. It leaves out actions constantly. It tells people, don't act. Don't react. Don't act. Don't take actual physical action. Okay, It's all about your thoughts and your emotions. This is the, how the, the New Age movement paints the law of attraction. You, know, you just think about it and have the feeling and then it will be. Action isn't required. So many people believe we're going to come out of this situation that we're in, the condition that we're in as a species, and no real action is going to be required. It's all just going to be about doing some internal work on ourselves and magically becoming enlightened. And not, not even understanding the control system, not understanding the wrongs, not understanding the occult, not understanding natural law. You don't need to do that. You don't need to read. You don't need to pay attention. You don't need to listen to podcasts and, and internet radio, etc., and watch documentaries. It could all be skipped. Knowledge is, is not the way you're going to get there. It's all just going to be done through a feeling. And I cannot tell you what a deception that is. This is what's keeping people ignorant. They don't want to do the hard work of reading. Again, in ancient Rome, they had one word that meant two things simultaneously. The word was liber. Liber simultaneously in Latin means book and free, meaning not a slave, a free person. Think about that. That's how strongly they associated reading and knowledge with freedom. They understood, at some, and, that, and then Rome fell, because they fell into this ignorance as well. They could not maintain any, any aspect of real knowledge. Well, first of all, by the time the Roman Empire had even come about, these people weren't free. They had already pillaged the ancient mystery traditions of Egypt, you know, through the Ptolemaic period in Egypt. I mean, you know, it's just a disgrace what they did to the once, you know, rich mystery traditions of Chem. So it's, it's the same way. We think we were so enlightened at the height of American civilization, we were already going in and pillaging another civilization that had already existed here, largely in harmony with natural law. Not saying that that, was, that civilization was perfect either, but uh, we came in, took their land, you know, pillaged their civilization, gave them all kinds of diseases deliberately. It was a genocide. And that's the, the real roots of where, where we're at now. And so the sins of the father are visited on the son. 
You know, it's just all about karmic debt. We started this country with that kind of karma. What makes us think we're going to just have an easy time of, of being becoming free without understanding all the wrongdoings that have been done here? So, what this part of, of discouraging action by saying don't react to anything, just watch everything, just be an observer and never take action, is, is about totally dismantling the sacred masculine, the child of action, the male child called action that is the byproduct of our thoughts and our emotions. The thoughts can be looked at as the father, the, the, the sacred feminine component, emotions or spirit as the mother, and then body taking action in the real world to create change. This is the true trinity in consciousness. Mind, spirit, body. Father, mother, child. Thoughts, emotions, actions. The father, the thoughts, the mind. That's, that's that first component. The second component is the, the mother, the spirit. Those are our emotions, internal qualities. And then the external are, it's the masculine, the sacred child, the male child, which is done with the body, and that's our actions. Because it is the child, it is a masculine aspect, which is the child of the, the byproduct of our mind or our thoughts and our emotions, our spirit. That, those are the expressions of human consciousness. And in the New Age movement, they always leave out the action part. Again, it's there to suppress, this religion is there to suppress the sacred masculine. The next part of this correction to accept everything and never resist or rebel is a, a, a refutation of this concept of that which resists persists. When, when I'm... I'm I was trying to explain to people what this original teaching is about is resisting the truth. And if you resist the truth, you're going to get, you're going to continue to receive more of what you got as a result of resisting it. So the better way of saying this, which is more clear and true to the original teaching, is that which manifests as a result of what you are wrongly resisting is that which will persist, is that which persists. So you've been resisting this teaching. You don't want to know the truth. And you've been getting this particular result that is suffering. You don't want that suffering. Well, then you have to stop resisting what you have been wrongly resisting. And as a result of that resistance to truth, you've been generating self-inflicted suffering and it is continuing to persist for as long as your resistance to the truth persists. That's what was originally meant by what has come down in a totally watered down, nonsensical state as what you resist persists. It's, it's just total nonsense, that statement. That which has been manifesting as a result of what you have been wrongly resisting is that which will continue to persist. Understand that. Understand it. You may need to read it a few times or hear it a few times. That which has been manifesting in your life as a result of what you have been wrongly resisting, meaning the truth, meaning the understanding of natural law has been resisted and rejected and ignored. Okay, The result that you've been getting because you've been ignoring those things, because you've been resisting that truth, is what will continue to persist. That's what was the original teaching. All right? So I put here the example that natural law is like a huge locomotive. And what people are like is... You know, this futile moron who's going to stand on the tracks when this is getting ready to mow him down at, you know, 150 miles an hour. And he's going to try to put his hand up and he's going to stop that. Because that's what real resistance to truth is. See, we need to resist evil by accepting truth and natural law and the laws of morality. That's what, what, how we resist this great evil that is upon us. What we're doing, though, is we're saying, no, we don't want to learn that. We don't want to do the work that's required to learn that from the level of conditioning that we're currently in. No, we're just going to put our hands up. We're going to slap 
the gift that the Creator is offering to us through the knowledge of natural law right out of the Creator's hand. So let me slap that out of your hand, smack you in the face, and spit in your face. And we think we're not going to get run down. Once again, folks, good luck with that. Enjoy what you get as a result. Well, apparently you've been enjoying it. You want, it, you want slavery to continue. Most people. So my hint for people, my advice would be, don't be that guy who's going to stand out on the tracks in front of the locomotive with his hand out thinking he's going to stop it at full speed. You're going to get run down. And it's already happening. It's not going to happen. We're getting run down. We are getting steamrolled by a locomotive called natural law. The natural law express. So, the next part of this refutation to this New Age deception number five of accept everything and never resist, one of the parts of it was... Um, don't actually resist evil. You know, just let it run rampant. Um, don't ever physically do anything to stop somebody who is violent and has no right to do what they're doing. They're, they're a perceived authority figure. Oh, they have the right to do this. There's never a time to physically rebel. There's never a time to physically use force. What this is all about is a complete lack of understanding of the two principles of enlightenment, what I call the two pillars of enlightenment. Enlightenment is based on the blending or the synthesis, the coming together in sacred union of the sacred feminine energies and the sacred masculine energies. If either one of these principles or forms of energy are not understood, not worked with, not combined. You have imbalance, and therefore the structure cannot stand because it, it, it needs the support of both of these pillars. The sacred feminine principle or the feminine pillar of truth or the pillar of en one of the pillars of enlightenment and again, both of these have to be present to create the structure. The sacred feminine principle is called the non-aggression principle. This is knowledge that you should, that everybody basically should already have, but, but unfortunately don't. That it is always wrong to initiate coercive usage of force, to constrain, compel, or usurp someone else's rights when you have no right to be doing that. Do not initiate harm or violence against your other fellow beings. That's it. Real simple. And people say they inherently know this, but their actions betray them because they still support government, which is the initiation of violence against other people who have not done anything wrong. Anybody who would say government has the right to pass this law and these enforcers have the right to enforce this law like what was just done to us in Philadelphia don't understand the non-aggression principle. Violence was used against us when we used no violence against anyone. They were the aggressors. They were the initiators of force. We initiated no force against any other living being. No one can ever make that claim and make it true because it didn't happen. Therefore, we had every right to take that action, yet violence was used to stop us from taking that action. And what I would say is defensive use of force would, would have been a right. Unfortunately, we have so many brainwashed people that they would think you can never use defensive use of force. It absolutely would have been a right to exercise. I chose not to exercise that at that point because people's minds are still so controlled that they don't understand that's a right. But more and more people are starting to come together and understand the sacred masculine principle, which is what the New Age movement is trying to suppress in other people. And here's what it is. When I say the suppression of the sacred masculine, I mean the sacred masculine principle of self-defense. 
which is an inherent natural right of man, of, of humankind, of humanity. When violence is being conducted against you and the person is not in the right, they do violence means you're not in the right. There's no form of right violence. There's for, a form of something called the right usage of force in a defensive capacity, but there is no such thing as the right usage of violence. Using violence is always wrong. Because violence as a noun comes from the verb to violate. What you are violating when you are taking someone and, and, and putting them in under violence, when you are doing violence to somebody, you're violating their natural rights of life, freedom, and property. That's what you're violating, which you have no right to be violating. So people don't understand the difference between the self-defense, the self-defense principle, the usage of force in a defensive capacity and violence. And I'll tell you what, I'll say this statement and I, I guarantee you more people who are listening to this than not if they've gone this far. And again, like I said, this might go into eight hours. Okay, It's going to take as long as it takes. More people than not will hear what I'm about to say and totally reject it and say I'm wrong and they know the difference between violence and force. So let's look at the difference between force and violence. Uh, this is slide number 68. Force actually means the capacity to do work or cause physical change. Force is energy, strength, or active power. It's the capacity to make change happen, to do something to create change. We use this every single day in our lives. You use force to pick anything up, to move something across the room. You use force when you speak, you know, just to modulate the air, to create movement, to create force, to create energy. That wave energy in the form of sound. Force is action which is in harmony with morality and natural law because it does not violate others' rights. It is action which one always possesses the right to take, which includes the defense, the active use of defensive action against violence. That is within morality, that is within natural law. If someone is harming you with violence, then you have a right to defend yourself using force against violence. Violence, on the other hand, is always immoral. It is the immoral usage of physical power to coerce, compel, or restrain when you have no right to do such a thing. This is done in an immoral capacity, meaning without right. It is not done within rights, meaning you are initiating it. You are initiating a form of coercion against another. You are starting it. And this is what matters. Who started it is what matters. That's, the, that's actually the crux of the entire issue, is who started it. Violence is the initiation of coercive action which is in opposition to morality and natural law because it involves the violation of others' rights. That's the reason that it's immoral. That's the reason that it's in opposition to natural law. Because in taking violence, in, in exercising violence, you are violating someone else's rights. Rights have to be violated for violence to have taken place. And violence, as a result, is action which one never possesses the right to take. The right to take violence is never there. It's never present. You never have the right to take violence, against, uh, to exercise violence against someone else. And what matters is who started it. You know, we're, we're hammered in this notion that if a physical altercation takes place, that it doesn't matter who started it. And I would suggest that is absolutely, completely wrong. That is, that is total brainwashing. And there is no truth to that because all that matters is who started it. Because the person who started it initiated coercive action against another person. 
and the person who responded with force was defending their right to remain unharmed. So, I'll give an example. A couple walks out onto a street from their home. Let's say they're going to walk to a restaurant and have dinner. And a mugger stops them with a switchblade knife and demands all their valuables. Says, give me all your possessions. I want your wallet. I want your purse. I want your jewelry. I want your shoes, etc. Whatever they have. I want your rings. I, I, you know, your, a, a, everything that you have on you. All your money, etc. Now, that person initiated coercive action against this couple. They started the violence. That was an act of violence. You are initiating coercive force, coercive action, okay, which is the immoral use of physical power to coerce, compel, or restrain. It involves the violation of their rights. They have a right to remain unharmed in their person and to keep their property, which they acquired rightfully. And therefore, that person has no right to take that action. If, let's say, the woman reaches into her purse and pulls out a 9mm handgun and blows this guy away, that was not an act of violence. That was an act of self-defensive force that she has a right to take. Now, people will say, well, going right to that might be overkill, might be too much. And I would say that's within the right of the person that this event is happening to. If they want to take that action right off the bat, they have a right to do that. I would say <coughs> you could ask someone who's doing violent action like that one time to, to stop, to desist from doing it. And if they refuse, then I'd say, I would say you have a right to take whatever amount of force you feel is necessary to put them down, including deadly force. And the people who don't understand that don't understand the difference between force and violence and don't understand rights. They don't understand what rights are. And anyone who would say that that person used violence to counter violence doesn't understand that would not be violence. That would be the defensive use of force in a capacity of right. They're using a right that they have to defend themselves with force if they come under attack by violence. So only one instance of violence would have occurred in that whole situation. And that was the person who started the altercation by a, uh, brandishing a weapon and telling someone, if they, you don't do what I tell you, if you, you don't, your will doesn't conform to my will, which is coercion, that I'm going to hurt you physically. That threat is an act of violence that has that they, those people have a right to put down and to stop with whatever amount of physical force is required to stop it up to and including deadly force. They don't need to call a cop. They don't need to file a report. They have a right to take action. And this is how people are brainwashed. They don't understand this. Another example that I like to give is boxing. You ask people, and this highlights the, the obfuscation in language of how these words are used interchangeably when they're not the same. They're not, they're not absolutely not um, words that should be used interchangeably whatsoever. Okay? They are actually polar opposites. Force and violence are antitheses of each other. They're diametrically opposed concepts. When you, when you use the example of boxing, you ask people, is boxing a violent sport? Most people will say, yes, boxing is a violent sport. How about MMA cage fighting, you know, like uh, UFC? Is that a violent sport? And people will say, oh, yeah, absolutely, that's a violent sport. There's a lot of violence going on in that. Again, it highlights how we obfuscate the actual definitions of words by using a word that has nothing to do with with that activity thinking and, and that that by repetition that gets people to think oh that's what violence is that's not violent behavior 
Violence has to involve the violation of someone else's rights. That's why it's called violence. It comes from violation. So I ask people, where is a boxer's rights being violated? Explain to me how either boxer or either UFC fighter is having their rights violated. They agreed to this competition. They are there by an act of their own will. No one is coercing them to put them into the ring. Now, gladiatorial combat back in ancient Rome would have been violence because they were forced to be there. You know, if you threw you know people competing in the Roman arena for for the uh, you know sick um, entertainment of the of the crowd and the the Roman elite, they were thrown in there against their will and forced to compete. That's violence against them. When people are making a willful decision to do something, it's a mutual decision that both parties agreed to and weren't coerced to do. So they're both in the ring under their own free will engaged in a competition that involves force, the usage of force. But no violence is taking place in a boxing match. No violence is taking place in a UFC fight. Because the people are there with as as a result of exercising their own free will. Free will has to be coerced for violence to take place. Violence was done to me and Barb outside of Independence Hall. Our free will was coerced. We were peacefully exercising speech and giving people free information. And then someone violently stopped us, violating our rights, stopped us from proceeding on our way, stopped us from exercising free speech. That's an act of violence. Violence was done unto us. Because violation of rights took place. That's the difference between force and violence. And when people respond to an act of violence with defensive force, they're not responding with violence. That's what people have to understand. That's not violence. Because in taking, in doing an act of violence, the perpetrator of that violent act has abandoned their rights. That's, that's the way that someone abandons their right to remain unharmed. When you do violence to someone else, when you initiate violence, you have just abandoned your right to remain unharmed. And therefore, the person you're doing that act of violence to, or anyone else that wants to stop that act of violence, has a right to stop you by whatever amount of force is necessary to stop you from continuing that action. That is a natural, inherent right of every being and cannot be taken away from any being or abdicated to other people just because somebody else thinks they have a monopoly on the usage of force, which is what government is, and police forces are, and militaries are, standing militaries. These are people who think they have a monopoly on the usage of force. And they're not even using force, really. They're using violence to do what they want to do and what they're commanded to do. They're not even using defensive force. They've been turned into violent criminals. <coughs> the, poli the park police that did what they did to us are violent criminals. Whether anyone understands that or not, that's true. That's the case. So, the problem is that people are polarized and either understand only one of the pillars of enlightenment. They don't get them both. And therefore, there's no secure structure. There's no, there's, there's no stability to the structure, which is why people can still be controlled, misguided. They don't have the full picture. So on slide 69, I, I bring up the, these pillars again to explain you can't only get half of the equation. You have to get both. In this instance, it's both and. 
Okay, you need to understand both the non-aggression principle, which is do not initiate coercive violence against someone else. You have no right to take violent action against someone else. That's the non-aggression principle. Violence is always wrong to initiate. Don't initiate the usage of um, coercive action, coercion against someone else, against your fellow beings. And when violence is initiated against someone, there exists the self-defense principle, the right to defend yourself against that initiation of coercion with force, with physical force, which is the sacred masculine principle. And groups of people who are seemingly well-intentioned don't understand one of these principles or another. So moving on to slide number 70, I explained that halfway understanding will not accomplish true freedom. It will not get it done. Halfway understanding of both of these principles will not get it done. So the my freedom movement, you know, the people who are interested in my freedom, not freedom for everyone, just my freedom. Tea partiers often fall under this whole thing so-called patriotic Americans. You know, they, they understand the self-defense principle. Oh, they, they don't want anybody touching their guns. And I agree with that wholeheartedly. But they leave out the sacred feminine principle of non-aggression and compassion toward others. You know, they look at things in a separate way and don't understand it's about freedom for all. Oh, no, it's our group. We're special because we're Americans. <laughs> You can't leave out the sacred feminine principle of non-aggression and advocate for policing the world and forcing, forcing your way of life on everybody else and you know, um, saying we're going to go and start wars in other countries. They believe in preemptive aggression and support this neocon you know, usage of the military in many cases. Now, you look at the opposite dynamic of people who get the sacred feminine principle and don't get the sacred masculine principle at all, which, again, is about what this whole presentation is really about, which is slide 71. The New Age movement leaves out the sacred masculine principles of standing up for one's rights and the inherent right to defend oneself against violence with the defensive use of force. They don't want to ever acknowledge that that exists. They all talk about compassion. They all talk about the, the sacred feminine principles of non-aggression, the non-aggression principle. But when you want to talk about self-defense, when you're accosted with violence, the New Agers want no part of that. Because again, this is about putting down the sacred masculine. And therefore, ultimately destroying the possibility to become enlightened. Because you're not enlightened unless you understand both of those principles. So, it boils down to slide number 72. A totalitarian police state is being brought forward faster and faster. I would say it's not even being brought forward, it's already here. We're in a totalitarian police state. We are in something that is totally akin to Nazi Germany or Soviet Russia. Now. Not coming, but is here already. The occult controllers... <clears throat> need to propagate a religion to push people deeper into right-brained imbalance so that they will never stand up for their natural rights. And the New Age movement is that religion. That is the religion of pushing people into right-brained imbalance so that they will not stand up for their natural rights. And will watch this police state take over without resistance. And it... It really does boil down to that and the next slide, 73. I call this cutting through the bullshit. What's the real reason most people don't want to speak out against government? And it's inherent wrongness. It's inherent immoral nature. It's inherent illegitimacy. They don't want to speak out against it. The real reason that most people, including the New Age movement, does not want to speak out against government is because deep down inside, this is all it comes down to, deep down in the very 
deep core of their soul, they are cowards. They do not have courage. They lack the courage to stand up to a bully. They have not developed inside of themselves courage to stand up, to speak out, and to do what is necessary to stop a bully. That's it. That's all it comes down to. And anybody who understands how a bully operates is he's going to keep doing what he's doing until someone stops him from doing it. You're not going to reason with a bully because his brain is burnt. A bully's a dumb person. Their brain is burnt. You look at a bully's brain, you're going to see all kinds of neural holes in the brain. Neural activity is going to be deadened all over the whole neocortex. It's going to look like craters on the moon or Swiss cheese. The holes in Swiss cheese. You know, and I tell people, just go look at SPECT scans of people's brains who act like this. Go look at SPECT scans of people who have you know, outrageous post-traumatic stress disorder. Go look at people's scans, brain scans who are psychopaths. Go look at people's brain scans who are raised on shit food and television their whole lives. And you'll find out real quick what a, what a, a damaged brain looks like. And a bully has a damaged brain. Whether they know it or not, or anybody else understands it or not, it's true. They're not going to be able to listen to reason. They just know what they want. They're acting like an animal. A bully is an animal. They're operating from the R complex of the brain like a reptile. Like a lizard would act. Instinctual response only. Survival only. Take what I want, doesn't matter whose rights I violate. And a bully is going to keep doing that until somebody makes it clear to him that he's not going to do that unchallenged, without consequences. When a bully gets his face smashed and his nose broken and blood dripping down his, into his mouth, he thinks twice about going and doing that to another human being. Because that person exercised defensive force because the bully had no right to do what he was doing. And it does matter who starts it. If a bully comes up to me and says, give me all your money, and I smash his face with all the force I can muster and bust his nose and blood is splattering everywhere, he thinks twice about continuing to come at me. And I had the right to do that. The problem is not enough people understand that. And they'll say you did something wrong for smashing in the face or the head of a bully. When in fact, that person initiated the violence and all that was responded with was defensive usage of force to stop the act. People need to understand that this is a right. This is a right. No one has the monopoly on being able to use defensive force. And people need to build the courage to start to understand we have this right. And that when we are accosted by a bully, that that right has to be exercised. Of the bully first, I feel, needs to be told no, first and foremost. And that their action is wrong. And then if they don't stop, then the option to use defensive force has to be looked at. So the, the point here is, in slide number 74, is we need to start saying no, first of all. Get ideologically involved. That's the first step. Make it clear, this is wrong and I'm saying no. And I'm not going to listen to your coercion. I'm not going to accept your coercion. The word no is the lost word of Freemasonry. That is what Freemasons have called the lost word. They call it the lost word because this is something that people aren't using. They're not saying it. It's not something that is being used. The right to say no. When, you're, when somebody is telling you, I'm going to coerce you and make you, your will conform to mine, you have to say no. You're not going to coerce my will. You have no right. This isn't a human right for you to do. And if you don't have that right, no one has that right to do that. I don't care how many people you get together and call it government. And do whatever kind of a, 
you know, mystical ritual you're going to do to, you know, and sign paperwork and say, now this person is bound to do what I tell them. No, it's not true. No, it's not true. Rights that don't exist for an individual don't exist for a group of people. You cannot create a right out of a wrong. Coercion, the initiation of coercive force is a wrong. You can't turn that into a right by writing it down. See, and that's why it's called writing. Writing. I'm making this into a right. People don't even think about the words. I'm writing this. You're saying the same thing. The word right. When you're saying W-R-I-T-E, you're saying R-I-G-H-T. Phonetically. The sound is the same. I'm writing this down. So you know, what somebody's hearing is I'm making this into a right because now it is written, it is right in, it has ma been made into a right. People don't even think about the simple usage of words with the same sounds and how that goes into the subconscious mind. That's how lawmakers play their word magic. They want you to think that they're making this into a right. It's a wrong and no one has the right to take this action individually, but we're writing it. We're making it into a right. We need to develop the courage quickly to use the lost word before it comes down to a small group of people who are going to have to use the last word. And the last word is, or the last words, I should say, are Molan Labe. Come and take it. Because the whole thing is, these people think they're going to keep coming and trying to take our rights. And at some point, the people who do have the courage, like they did in 1775 and 6, are going to have to stand up and say, no, you're not going to take our rights, even if we have to use defensive force and possibly even give our lives to stop you from doing it. And once again, I say this over and over, all my work is to try to avert that disaster because it will be a disaster for both sides, not just one side. And the people will win. The people will win that confrontation just like they have before over and over and over again in the past. The police and military who think that they're going to win that confrontation should just look into past history and find out what happened. Because you've always, p police have always been on the wrong side of history. They don't understand that. They're all, they've always been the bad guys. They've always been co-opted by the state to do immoral activity. And then eventually that gets put down. And these people get put in their place. Physically. At some point. And then history always records that these were the people who were the immoral people who did immoral acts against their fellow human beings and had to be stopped. And they don't understand that. They think they're the good guys. They think their institution is the good guy. And it's not the good guy. It's always been the bad guy. It's always been the villain throughout history. All you have to do is read history. And you'll understand that. Again, that's why it is called a police state. And not a politician state, a banker state, a lawyer state. It's not called any of those things. It's called a police state. There's a reason it's called a police state. Because police, once again, are the people who are on the wrong side of history who make that eventuality occur. Police are the ones who are ultimately responsible. It, it is them who take the action. The people themselves wouldn't take that kind of coercive action. They want to be generally left alone. Unfortunately, ideologically, they're so messed up that they are supporting violence. Most of them would never do that themselves, but they're supporting it unknowingly, thinking that that's necessary. But the police are always the ones who are ultimately responsible. They share the lion's share. They take the lion's share of the moral culpability. Because they're the ones who are actually taking the action. The person who is the most morally culpable is the one who takes the action. So I don't want to see it have to come down to the last word. Or the last words, as I've called it. But... You know, slide number 76 shows that I'm getting prepared if, that, if it comes to that. I will be ready if that's what happens. I'm not going to be caught with my pants down and not have the ability to defend myself. 
And I would suggest that everyone should prepare. Everyone should have some level of preparedness for if a situation like the first American Revolution happens and it goes hot. I don't think it should have to do that, though, because we need to we need to influence other people's mind and behavior by continuously speaking the truth to them so that they will stop doing this immoral behavior that they're taking under orders. We have to reach the minds of the order followers to prevent bloodshed from occurring in America. And once again, I'll say it over and over again, that's what this entire show has been about. Trying to avert that nastiness that is guaranteed to happen if these people continue to follow their orders. It's guaranteed. They're the ones who are making it happen. They will be the ones who are making a, a forceful altercation have to take place because they're initiating the violence. And people are only going to take so much violence before they rise up and act in a defensive capacity. And then once that starts, it's going to be very difficult to stop it. And they all know it. They're all running scared because they don't, they're, they're backed into a corner because they look at it, their lives are so meaningless to them that they have just put everything, they're so identified, they're so attached to what they do, they think this is all I can ever do, that I can never stop doing this and do something else because they, they know how uneducated they are. I'm not trying to say this even as an insult to police. But they know, deep inside, they know how stupid they are. And, and um, uh, actually, let me take that back. They're not stupid. They're ignorant. There's a difference. Stupidity means that you don't have the capacity to understand. You actually are, something is inherently damaged and broken inside the, the brain. And there's, <coughs> the actual capacity to learn is not present. And I would say that isn't what police are. They're just ignorant. They're ignoring all the information that is out there about the truth, about natural rights. They don't want to learn it. They look at that as hard work. And that's harder to them than doing all of this coercive, you know, compelling, restraining stuff that involves all this physical activity. They'd rather do all of that work than actually do the work that would be required to read, to learn to understand something philosophically. They look at that as scary and frightening because somewhere along the line they got into their mind that they're incapable of understanding that stuff. And that's traumatic to them. They've always been looked at as... You're, and, and look, there's some people who have a modicum of intellect in the police departments, obviously. But the whole point is they don't have true intelligence. They don't have big picture thinking. They have not integrated the feminine part of the mind, which involves creativity and intuition and, and deep understanding of patterns. That is, doesn't come from intellect, as we've already seen earlier in this presentation. So these aren't intelligent people. They have the capacity to reach intelligence, but their brain right now is not functioning properly. They're so in left brain imbalance that they're ruled by the R complex of the brain. And from the R complex, you're not going to do any higher order thinking. They need healing over time by taking in proper information. It's no different than getting off of a crap food diet and over time generating health by putting the correct nutrients into the body. The same is true for the brain. You need to get off of the poison information and the brainwashing that you've been receiving and get on to positive and truthful information about what actually is going on around you and within you, in your own mind, in your own brain, what's going on. That's what real intelligence is, being able to understand those patterns. That's what consciousness is. And they don't have consciousness. They are unconscious. And in their unconsciousness, they will be making the unpleasant situation. They already are making it. They're generating it and don't even know it. They're creating something that is going to be extraordinarily horrific for them and everyone else 
in their unconsciousness. They are unconsciously creating that situation and don't even know it. Which is why it is up to us to forcefully speak this to everyone. Use the force of voice and speak this to everybody that you can, especially police, because them and their family are going to be particularly at risk if they continue to push and push and push and push and push. And I don't want to see that eventuality occur. But that's what they're going to be creating. They don't understand that they are not going to win a war against the American public. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. <clears throat> and the people who are so thinking that, oh, the police and military are so big and bad and that they would, they would put down a rebellion, you don't even understand where the sentiment is. I'm telling you, just go to, go to some gun shows and just listen to what the sentiment is. It's terrible. It's just terrible where people's heads are at. I mean, the people in this country are armed for war. Believe it. Believe it. It's a, America is a powder keg right now. Especially after all this nonsense that went down with Sandy Hook and then them subsequently trying to pass all that gun legislation. I mean, people's tempers are at an all-time high. <laughs> It's not a good situation in America at all. And the police are not making it any better. They're, they're exacerbating it, completely exacerbating it. So let's look at some ancient examples of these two principles combined, the sacred feminine and the sacred masculine principles combined. In the Mayan and Aztec tradition, there was the concept of the feathered serpent. I'm on slide number 77. He was called Kukulkan in the Maya tradition. He was called um, Quetzalcoatl in the Aztec tradition. And um, he was a feathered serpent, a serpent with the feathers all over him, like a bird. Okay, because Kotal means <clears throat> serpent, and the Quetzal was a bird. So you combine those, Quetzalcoatl, it's a feathered snake, or a snake that like flies like a bird. Okay, so this concept of the serpent combined with the bird is the sacred masculine principle, the serpent that will be ready to strike if necessary, combined with the bird, which flies high, free. It's the sacred feminine principle like the dove. Okay, it's feathered. It's a gentle surface. On the surface, it's very gentle and soft and, and smooth and soothing, like feathers. So that's what is displayed to the outside world. You're completely covered in the feather of the bird or the dove, okay? If you want to look at it as a dove bird. The Quetzal wasn't a dove, but I like to look at that as the, the sacred feminine symbology, which is the dove, as we'll see. I think the Gnostics uh, uh, impressively portrayed it, as I'll show in the next slide. But... Um, in the uh, Mesoamerican traditions, uh, you know, this represented the sacred masculine principle of self-defense, the serpent, being completely enrobed and covered in the sacred feminine principle of non-aggression. And it's a beautiful symbol, if you really understand what the symbol means. This means at all times and places you're exercising the non-aggression principle unless violence is, is used and then the whole being is a snake, is a serpent that is poised and ready to strike. Because you will exercise the self-defense principle if accosted with violence. The concept of the two pillars and having to hold on to both pillars was expressed in the South American tradition at Tiwanaku. This is an ancient civilization far older than even the Mesoamerican traditions in Central America and Mexico. Um, and I, I believe it's in uh, Bolivia, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I could be incorrect about that, but I think that's where Tiwanaku is. Um, and here you see their sun king, Viracocha, and he has the two pillars the two pillars, one in the left hand, one in the right hand, he's bridging them, he's standing in between them, because he's the enlightened one. You have the rays of the sun coming out of his head. 
the two pillars of enlightenment. He's the sun, the light, the so solar deity. And he has the pillars, the sacred masculine and the sacred feminine pillar. That's what enlightenment consists of. Understanding both of those principles, the sacred feminine principle of non-aggression, don't initiate coercive force against your fellow man and woman, and the self-defense principle. If coercive violence is used against you, you have a right to defend yourself with force if, if necessary. So, great symbols that illustrate the very concept that I've been talking about in this section. Let's look at image number 78. The Gnostics also portrayed this symbol in a form of a yin-yang. You have the serpent and the dove. The serpent and the dove. The serpent is the sacred masculine principle, the right to self-defense. The dove is the sacred feminine principle, the non-aggression principle. And they're formed in a circle like a yin-yang. This is my favorite depiction of these, this dual concept of the sacred feminine combined with the sacred masculine. So the dove is the symbol of the spirit and the snake is the symbol of matter. And it's showing that they are intertwined. They are together. Neither one is, you know, in superiority. The serpent, uh, the dove, represents, again, the sacred feminine non-aggression principle. Do not initiate harm. He flies in the sky. It's a high consciousness. To understand the sacred feminine principle is a high form of consciousness. Therefore, that's why it's depicted above. The serpent is a practical matter of fact philosophy. The, the self-defense principle is about keeping your feet on the ground. Don't fly off into such a spiritual daze by being so right-brained and balanced that you will not defend your physical body, which is the vehicle for the expression of consciousness. Your thoughts, emotions, and actions take place in and through the body. Therefore, it is the vehicle for the expression of consciousness. And as such, it's the vehicle for the growth and um, experience of the spirit. So that should not be ignored. And therefore, the serpent is included in that, in that sacred union and that sacred dance because it represents the sacred masculine principle that should not be abandoned. The ability to defend, to defend yourself when you are accosted with violence. In the Hermetic tradition, uh, this is a movie picture on the right-hand side of a movie called The Man from Earth, which is a great movie, by the way. Um, but um, I chose this to depict the Hermetic concept of the stellar man. The stellar man in the Hermetic tradition is the awakened and enlightened being. And it doesn't mean just man, men, woman, the stellar being, let's call it, okay? The stellar being has their head in the stars, in the high consciousness, but their feet on the ground. They have not abandoned practicality. They have not abandoned common sense in the real physical world because they understand there's no separation between the physical and the spiritual domains. They are one. And they act as a bridge between the two. And I think that's, you know, whether that's the intent of the makers of this movie picture, I think it illustrates the concept. The stellar man stands upon the earth, but his head is in the stars. Once again, he's grounded. He's practical. He understands the physical, the importance of the physical world and the physical body. And doesn't look at them as inferior to the spiritual. But he has his head in the spiritual domain. Because he understands that this is, that we are actually all one. That everything is an expression of the one. You know, so he gets that, but he doesn't, he operates on the ground. He does his work on the ground. In the physical world. And doesn't ignore the physical and say that, oh, it's, it's, you know, subservient to the spiritual. No, it's about taking the spiritual knowledge and bringing it down to the earth, where it can be used, where it can be put into practice, where it can be put into effect in our lives. So these are great symbols that illustrate these points of 
the sacred masculine and feminine principles coming together and um, also the, the physical world and the spiritual world being one and the same. So let's move on to New Age Deception number six. The watered-down version of the laws of attraction. This is slide number 79. The watered-down version of the laws of attraction. As propagated by things like the secret. That tells you you have to just think about it and hold an emotion and oh, it'll come to you. You know? It's all removing the sacred masculine component of action. That action is required in the real world. To, do, to do, make happen, to manifest what you're going to manifest, what you w- want to manifest. You know, it's all based on service to self, too, as I talk about in slide number 80. It's about what do you want for you? Oh, you want that new job, you want that new car, you want that new house, you know, you want that new relationship. It's all about self-service, largely. Overwhelmingly, I really should say. Not even just largely, but overwhelmingly. You know, it's about looking at only your microcosmic situation. It never talks about how do you want to influence people's mind and behavior in a big way so that they will stop acting in a capacity of coercion and violence and supporting that. And thinking that that is okay to allow to just continue on unchallenged. Never gets into anything like that. It never gets into how we are creating our reality on a mass scale. In the aggregate. No, it talks about it trying to give you this notion that you're creating your reality individually. That you're attracting violence to you. No, I'm not attracting. Someone actually had the nerve to tell me I was a, I had, that we attracted that situation to ourselves. Really? Really? No, ignorance attracted that situation to us. Not our ignorance, because we know what our rights are. The ignorance of society, of other people who abandon common sense and morality. That's what attracted that situation to us. Make no mistake about it. It was not us. We're doing what is right and doing a duty to inform people about what is wrong. And how they're being taken. So don't give me the bullshit, which is exactly what it is, that somehow I attracted that situation. No. The ignorance of other people attracted that situation. And its prevalence in society. The prevalence of that ignorance in society. Okay? That's that's like saying the Jews attracted the situation that happened to them in Nazi Germany. Yeah, they attracted the gas chambers to themselves. I mean, people who think this way are total dunces. Total dunces. And and, and that's that's just how it has to be said. Because they've bought a total lie about how the laws of attraction operate. A total lie. That's put there by dark occultists to get the you to get you to think of as the victim as the perpetrator. And there is such a thing. There are victims and perpetrators. There are people who are doing things that are bad to other people. Get over it. It's not an, just an experience. No, it's a wrongdoing. It's an injustice that does not should not be allowed to stand and continue so get over your new age bullshit of it's just an experience and those people bro- attracted that to themselves whatever whatever people i mean uh, r- really this is how destroyed someone's mind is that they accept this nonsense really I mean, you know, uh, hopefully there's people out there with a little bit of common sense still that can understand how much total trash that these teachings are. Trash. 
and they have nothing whatsoever to do with the real laws of attraction. The real laws of attraction are natural law, which are never spoken of once, once, in any aspect of the teachings of the so-called laws of attraction in the New Age movement. It's never mentioned. You want to know why? Because that's the deepest occulted information, and the New Age movement has no idea that it even exists. Because they've bought the occultist's agenda unknowingly to hide the truth about natural law as the real laws of attraction and they're peddling this total, utter, bullshit version. Which is exactly what it is. Total bullshit based in ego. As I show on slide number 81. It's all about the self. Service to self. That's it. And ultimately it's bullshit. So, let's offer a correction and try to get people to understand how the real laws of attraction operate. And again, this is what the whole New Age seminar, new, uh, uh, the New Age seminar, the whole natural law seminar is going to be about. I guess this is the New Age seminar right now, teaching people what the New Age movement really is. You're, you're, you're in the New Age seminar right now, you know? a mini-seminar on the deceptions of the New Age. The Natural Law Seminar is going to explain about what the, how the real law of attra- laws of attraction operate. So, let's get into this. Of course, the, the New, Age's, New Age movement's variation of the laws of attraction do not include action. They leave action out of the equation. Once again, this is the suppression of the sacred masculine. They all constantly talk about thoughts, holding a thought in your mind, a vision in your mind, and then feeling an emotion about it. But they leave out the action part. That alone is not going to make anything change in the, in, in the real world. Get over it. Sorry, that's not how it works. You need to take action to put into effect what you're holding in your mind and in your emotional self. Action is required to make change happen in the world. It doesn't just automatically happen because you want it to. The real law of attraction is natural law on slide number 84 now. And my working definition for natural law is the universal, non-man-made, binding and immutable conditions that govern the consequences of behavior. We've talked about this endlessly on this show. I'll just briefly go over this. Universal. It exists everywhere in creation. There's nowhere it is not operating. It's non-man-made. That means it is inherent to creation itself. Man didn't make up these laws. Creation made these laws. They're boundary conditions to the universe. Binding. That means they're operating at all places, all times. You are bound by them. Whether you understand them, agree with them, know about them, or are ignorant about them, it doesn't matter. Belief is irrelevant. They are binding. It's just like gravity. doesn't matter how much you know about gravity, whether you believe it exists, you're bound by it. The end. Same thing with natural law. Immutable. That means they cannot be changed. They weren't put into effect by man, therefore they cannot be changed by man. They're not negotiable. They are. You're bound by them. It's unchangeable. And that's it. The they govern the consequences of human behavior. These are boundary conditions that govern what actually occurs as a result of what free will decisions we make and then what actions we take as a result of those decisions. That's how natural law operates. And again, the seminar will be going into this very in-depth, giving many examples and many um, related um, works for people to study as well. So the expressions of natural law, which we've talked about, and I'll go through these quickly, are a positive expression and a negative expression. When we work with a certain polarity, and again, this is on slide 85, when we work with a certain generative polarity, either the positive one or the negative aspect, we're going to eventually create a specific result in our lives. If we work with the positive expression of the generative polarity called love, We will seek truth and acquire knowledge. This is how the expression begins. It's what I call the initiative expression in the positive sense. Seeking truth and acquiring knowledge. 
When we do that, we move toward an internal expression within ourselves of natural law. And this is called sovereignty. We already talked about what sovereignty is. It's the recognition that you are not a slave, that you own and rule yourself. And it's, it's even more than that. It's about coming into internal harmony with the self amongst the expressions of your consciousness, unifying your thoughts, emotions, and actions such that you are a being that as you think, so you feel, and so you act. And you're not internally divided. You become an individual, non-divided. This is the state that I call internal monarchy, being the one ruler of the self, monarch. Mon meaning one, and archon meaning ruler from Greek. And we'll look at that, that word soon. Sovereignty is the truth about what everyone is, what all beings are. We are sovereign. We don't have a ruler, a master. Nor do we have slaves. When you understand sovereignty, you understand the inherent legitimacy of slavery. The inherent illegitimacy of slavery. There is no legitimacy to slavery ever. Ever. You are already sovereign. You are not a slave. It's just the problem is most people don't know that. Don't understand it. They don't even know what the word sovereign means. When we have that knowledge within, when we've taken in that knowledge and we've actually unified ourselves from within, an an external expression flows in the external realm or in the society that we live in called freedom, which is called external anarchy, what I call external anarchy. Real freedom is external anarchy. Anarchy means no rulers. And we'll break down that word later. No rulers. An meaning none or not there, not present. Archon meaning ruler. When we develop that true condition in the world, there is order. That's the result. That's the generative expression, the result, the manifestation. It's what we would call good in the world. If we use the opposite Polarity, which is fear. Fear makes us close down. See, love is the expansive force of consciousness that opens our mind and our heart and allows us to seek and accept truth and therefore acquire knowledge. Fear is the force that shuts down consciousness, keeps us not wanting to know, and therefore refusing truth and staying in the initiative expression of natural law in the negative sense called ignorance. Ignorance, as I like to call it. We are ignoring that which is there, thinking that we're going to prosper by ignoring the truth and saying we don't care, we don't want to know. Impossible. There is no such thing as a free people that are ignorant people. Impossible. Those two states cannot exist simultaneously. Ignorance and freedom. It's impossible. When you're ignorant, you're going into a cage. You're going into enslavement. Because you've refused truth. That's the reason. When you refuse truth, you cannot be acting rightly. And there's a reason. Because inside, we're in a state of confusion. In ignorance, when you're in a state of ignorance in the mind, inside, you're confused. You don't know what the reality is. You don't know what the truth is. You don't know what's really going on, either inside you or in the world. And this is internal anarchy. That means inside of you, there's no ruler. And that's a bad thing. We don't want internal anarchy. We want external anarchy. Internal anarchy is a really bad thing. You can never get external anarchy if there's internal anarchy. You can only get external anarchy if there's internal monarchy amongst the population, which is an understanding of their sovereignty. When there's internal confusion, external control follows. The external expression in the negative. It's called control. Externally being controlled by others. Violence being done, in other words. Control is the same thing as violence. Freedom is the same thing as non-aggression. 
So when people say, I want non-aggression, I want there to be non-violence, the only way you can do that is with these positive expressions. You can never create it with refusal of truth. You're only going to get violence by refusing truth. That's why we have the situation we have. The majority of our society refuses truth, and so we're getting violence in our society. Because we don't know the truth and we're not teaching it to others. Control is what I call external monarchy. Somebody wanting to rule over others. Monarch. One ruler. When it's external, it's very bad. And it's based in violence. So when that's, <clears throat> when that's the external expression, <clears throat> the result, the manifestation, the generative expression at the end is chaos. It's the opposite of order. It's what we would call evil. We say we want order, we say we want goodness, but we're not using the polarities that we need to to get those things. Nobody's going to tell you I want chaos and evil in the world and I want to suffer. I want violence done unto me and I want to suffer and I want there to be evil and chaos all around me. Not one person is going to tell you that that's what they want. But they think that they can get the absence of that Okay, they think they can get the opposite of that, which is order and good and freedom, by continuing to stay in fear, which is having a shutdown consciousness, and stay in ignorance, which is the refusal of truth. And, and it doesn't work that way. If you are using the polarity, uh, the, the generative polarity at the top, you can never create anything on the opposite side. So if you're using love, you can only create knowledge, sovereignty, freedom, order, and goodness. If you're using fear, you can only create ignorance, confusion, control, chaos, and evil. They never move into the opposite column. It's a straight down mechanism. Understand that. More people need to understand how this process works. They don't get it. They don't understand that that's how natural law functions in the world. This is, again, the most occulted information. This is what dark occultists do not want people to understand. And more people need to be talking about this dynamic. Forget all the other things. All the things that are going on in the world are actually distractions to make people not understand that very dynamic about how we are collectively in the aggregate co-creating our reality. Not individually creating reality. So many people actually believe each individual is creating a separate reality for themselves. No. You might be creating your own individuated reality in a small sense in your personal life, like your relationships with other people, your job situation, uh, your health situation. You're in control of those things. You're creating the, the dynamic there. Okay, about what you're doing on a daily basis, you know, how your the state of health that you're in. You have you still have a large amount of control over those things to create that type of a of a personal reality. You're you individually are not creating the reality that's going on across the whole world. This is a total misunderstanding of the laws of attraction. And the New Age movement propagates this belief. That each individual is creating the whole reality. They actually believe that. People actually believe that. And that's solipsism. That's what, it's what it comes down to. It's the propagation of solipsism. That you're everything. That, that just you, your individuated consciousness is everything. You're God. You're the arbiter of truth. You're making everything up. It's just such nonsense I mean, just looking at it with common sense disproves it. Just, you know, that these people think you're generating the entire reality, that there's no one else there doing anything. No, there's 7 billion other people who are thinking thoughts in their mind that are largely erroneous, and they're creating a situation, and you're going to be tied up in that even if you do understand the non-aggression principle, because not enough people spoke about the truth to get other people to understand it, and it's still going to affect you. You're not going to magically escape the police state because you think you're creating your own reality in your own mind. I mean, just 
People are just so naive. And again, this is the hallmark of a right-brained, imbalanced person. They're naive. They will accept and buy anything that they want to hear that's comforting to them, like a child. You tell a child, everything's going to be all right. You're the one who's in control of all of it. And the child wants to believe that because they're naive. They want to believe everything's just going to magically be okay and they're going to be insulated from it. Hey, the monsters aren't going to get you. You're special. You, you, you're creating your own reality. No, it's you're going to be affected by what happens in the aggregate. The aggregate consciousness. Because we're all in this together. Okay? So get out of the notion that you're creating your reality separately because it doesn't work that way. <clears throat> what the real laws of attraction are about is service to truth, as I've put here on slide number 86. Understanding and, and helping to propagate the understanding of the expressions of natural law is moving out of your own service to self mentality and getting into a service to truth mentality. This is how it actually does work. The laws of attraction actually do work this way, not the way that they're being portrayed in the secret. Okay? So, so it, understanding and expressing that, coming to an understanding of that and then helping to express that to other people is... Stepping outside of service to, to, to self, and it's, even, it's moving into service to others, but it even goes beyond service to others. It's moving into service to truth, which is what ultimately we have to be in if we're going to change this situation. <clears throat> so, continuing with this correction... To strike down the notion that a single individual is creating the shared reality by themselves, which is nonsense, we co-create our shared reality in the aggregate. Individual choices, which are either based in harmony to or opposition to natural law, influence the quality of the shared experience. We're all bringing a part of that energy to the table. This dynamic acts as a perfect expression of the principle of correspondence. As above, so below. As below, so above. Meaning, as all the individuated units of consciousness, the, the majority of them are thinking, feeling, and acting a certain way, that is what the totality of the society is going to be like. Because the society, <clears throat> as a macrocosm, is comprised of the microcosmic units of consciousness. So that society is going to be a reflection of what's going on in the mind, heart, and, and behaviors of the individuated expressions of that society. Called the individuals, the people. That dynamic is created in the aggregate, meaning in the total, taking together all the individual units together. And that's what you're going to be getting as a whole. If you don't change it in enough numbers sense, it does have to do with numbers. So this is the second part of this slide. Conversely to what the New Age movement will tell you, for a quantum shift to take place, numbers are required. There is requirement for making a mass change happen, and that means you have to get enough people, numbers of people, which is what quantum means, an amount of something, the word quantum comes from Latin, surprisingly, and it means amount. So when you're saying a quantum shift needs to take place, yeah, that means an amount, a shift in the amount of people that think a certain way. It doesn't happen by just a small amount of people. This is a lie. It's an, a, a very small amount of people do not create change on a mass scale. The people who think a certain way and comprise the majority are who are ultimately affecting the overall quality of the shared experience. You have to get the majority of people understanding the non-aggression principle and self-defense principle together for there to be a true shift in awareness in this society. And ladies and gentlemen, anybody that thinks that's happening on a mass scale, I mean, you, you know, I think you're delusional. We need millions of teachers of this information. Millions. Not hundreds, not thousands. Millions. 
And we are nowhere near that number. Nowhere near it. Because people are still staying silent with what's going on in society that they can see with their own eyes they're afraid to speak. They're still cowards. You're going to see a shift in this dynamic when enough people develop courage. Courage is ultimately what is required. Courage is required even more than knowledge is required because you're going to need the courage to even know the truth and then you've got to have developed the courage further to speak it. And we don't have enough people doing this, which is what I continuously harp upon. I don't want to be the person just doing this amongst all the other few people who are really understand this information and are speaking it to others. It can't be a handful of people. The fact that I'm on the like cutting edge of this type of information is disgraceful. It's, it's sickening to me that I, I think, I sit there and think, wow, I'm the person who's bringing information about natural law forward perhaps more than, than most anybody else. How could that possibly be? I mean, it's crazy to even think that. I don't hear anybody. You know, there, there are a few people that really talk about this. A handful of individuals who know it deeply in their own mind and are really speaking that to other people. An understanding of how the real co-creative laws of attraction and natural law work and how we are co-creating the reality, the shared experience that we are under, undergoing needs to be deeply understood by more people. And it needs to be taught by more people who understand it. And again, this is why I'm hosting the Natural Law Seminar. It's not just to get people to understand. I want to move people into the dynamic of being a teacher of this information. We need more teachers of this information. Millions of them. That will speak it completely, truthfully, and unapologetically to anybody that will listen. Maybe if we have millions of people doing that, we'll start to see a change, a real change in behavior in the world. Maybe. New Age Deception number 7, moving on to slide number 88 now. A false notion of forgiveness. Forgive people even if they are not sorry for what they have done. And people think that forgiveness only operates in the person who's offering forgiveness. And this is a false notion of forgiveness. This is not how real forgiveness works. I'll explain what real forgiveness really is. And I'm all for forgiveness. I am all for real, true forgiveness. I'm not for the fake, new age, wishy-washy, nonsense version of forgiveness. Which has nothing to do with forgiveness. It has to do with being a naive person. Which again is what right brain imbalance will make you into. Slide number 89, I put what the false notion of forgiveness will get you more of. Turning the other cheek is what people look at as true forgiveness. Uh, and uh, uh, the little um, subtitle there says it helps even out the scars. Because that's what continuing to turn the other cheek will get you. When the bully wants to hit you and you turn the other cheek, the bully's going to keep hitting you. You know, just get over the notion that this is somehow a virtue to turn the other cheek. It's not a virtue. It's total naivete. Again, there's things in the teachings of, you know, the New Testament that I wholeheartedly agree with, and there's things I think were totally added in there. And, you know, this is one of them. First of all, it's it's maybe it's not something that was added in there. It's it's totally misunderstood. It's misconstrued. It's mistranslated in its original context. It meant offer people other chances to do the right thing. But it doesn't mean if someone is doing violence to you, continue to allow them to do violence to you. That's not what it means. It's symbolic. It was metaphorical. If someone slaps you in the face because you're trying to give them the truth, continue to give them the, another chance to understand the truth. Keep speaking it to them. Uh, I do believe this was about the dynamics of people that you care about that are close to you, around you. 
And it didn't mean just let a bully or an attacker continue to do whatever they're going to do to you. That's not what it meant. So this is the false notion of forgiveness. And what the false notion of forgiveness will get you if you keep practicing it is George Orwell's vision of a boot stamping on a human face forever. And this is what we're really moving into. Because we want to say, oh, these people, you know, they're the authorities. Oh, they're, it's just a bunch of, uh, you know, uh, it's just a, a few bad apples. And we got to give them a chance to get their stuff right, get it together. While they're killing people every day. Killing people with so-called non-lethal weapons. People's lives are being taken when they have, these people, these people are murderers. The thugs in the police force are murderers. Killing people. How many people have been killed with tasers? How many people have been, been killed or maimed with water cannons? To disgrace. This false notion of forgiveness is bullshit. <coughs> Let's make the correction to this. Let's make the correction to the false notion of forgiveness and explain what true forgiveness really means. Because it's important. And true forgiveness should be practiced. True forgiveness does not mean continuing to excuse the willful commission of wrongdoing an infinite number of times. We're on slide 92 now. That is naivete at best and cooperation <clears throat> with evil at worst. And you know what? I find it very interesting that the numbers would work out the way that they do. This is slide number 92. And slide number 93 is where I explain what true forgiveness really is. I mean, I didn't plan it that way, folks. That That's not... that's. You know, that's just how it worked out. I didn't deliberately say, I'm going to make slide number 92 this and slide number 93 this. That's just how it synchromystically worked out. For people who understand <clears throat> the numbers 92 and 93, 92 being the failure of will and higher consciousness and true love, and 93 being the expression of higher consciousness, true will and love. Okay? So 92 is the failure of the true work, 90. Three is the accomplishment of the true work. And it's just amazing that things work out that way synchromystically. So 92, the false notion of forgiveness, is people think it means excusing the willful commission of wrongdoing an infinite number of times. That's not what true forgiveness is. What that really is, is naivete at the very best, and that comes from right brain imbalance and cooperation with evil at worst. So what is really true forgiveness? On slide number 93, it's being able to admit those three words, I was wrong. That's where forgiveness has to start. Forgiveness has to start with somebody acknowledging their wrongdoing. It's a two-way street. Forget, contrary to what the New Age movement and other idiots will try to tell you, that forgiveness only operates in the person offering the forgiveness. You are wrong. Sorry, it does not work that way. That's not true forgiveness. There's a difference between release of what you may be holding, of anger that you may be holding on to, and forgiveness. Release from attachment to anger in your life over something that occurred and saying, I'm not going to be angry about that because it happened in the past. That's not simply forgiving somebody. True forgiveness is a two-way street. There has to be an interchange, for there to, an exchange for there to be forgiveness. Okay? So the exchange that happens is the, the person offers their apology. And then you give them something. The apology has to come first. The person has to admit that they were wrong. A sincere apology starts with the willingness to tell the truth. The person is going to tell the truth that their action was wrong, that their action was violent, that their action was based in taking something from you that they had no right to take. Hurting you, harming you in some way. And then they have to be willing to cease their engagement in that action. See, 
there has to be sincerity on the part of the person that did it. If, if true forgiveness is going to be offered and exchanged in their lifetime, they have to say, I was wrong, a, tr- a sincere apology, I'm willing to admit the truth, and to stop doing what I was doing. That's where forgiveness and reconciliation begin. Until that's done, there can be no true forgiveness. There can be tr- no true healing, no true reconciliation. Once someone says, I was wrong, I admit I shouldn't have been doing that and I won't do it anymore, I don't think you have to then take, de- you don't have to take defensive action against them. You have to give them a chance to prove that they were are sincere and that's what forgiveness is you're saying okay if you're willing to accept that responsibility I will not take any action I forgive you for what you've done don't do it again when a person doesn't do it again they've proven that the the, the um, apology was sincere they continue to do it again then I think you understand that that's basically a person who's not it wasn't it wasn't a sincere apology, and the person is just going to continue to do the action because they don't have any real respect for themselves or anybody else. And then I think action should be taken against the person because they've proven that they're not sorry for what they're doing. I'm all for giving people other chances. I'm all for real forgiveness, but I'm not for a false notion of forgiveness. We need to understand the difference between those two concepts. Let's move on to slide 94, New Age Deception number 8. Chaos should be feared. You know, everybody looks at chaos in a bad way, and the New Age propagates, oh, we should be afraid of chaos breaking out. This is why many of them are archonists. They are statists. They actually believe that government should exist. I can't tell you how many people I asked the question at the last New Age Expo in Philadelphia. Uh, do Do you believe government should exist at all? Oh yeah, absolutely. I vote Democrat. I mean, I can't even believe how many people at this so called spiritual expo actually accept the notion of government and think that they're spiritual. They believe that they are spiritual people. Or everybody's a spiritual person. They believe that they have an understanding of what higher consciousness is. True spirituality. Higher consciousness understanding. They believe they have that knowledge. And again, they also believe I'm one of the good guys. I'm one of the good people. They believe that. You say, do you really understand the difference between right and wrong? And they'll they'll be offended. How dare you even ask me that question? Of course I do. And they're supporters of violence and slavery by supporting government. And it's all because this notion is continuously propagated. Oh, there could be chaos. We don't do this, there could be chaos. You know, and this is what the whole idea of the terror state is about. Slide ninety-five. Let's let's make lev- levels of terror alert. We'll keep people in fear. We'll keep them thinking: if I give up my freedom, I'll be safe. I just got to give up my rights to the government. They'll protect us. They're they're concerned. They want to keep us safe. The fear of chaos. It all, it, that's how it works. Through fear of chaos breaking out at any moment. Oh, people, there could be death. There could be harm to other people. Yeah, it's called living in a physical world. There's always going to be the potential for harm and chaos. Get over it. This notion that chaos is something to be feared is total bullshit. And I'm going to explain why. I'm going to give you specific examples, or I'm going to give you, uh, try to give you an, an understanding of why chaos is not something we should be afraid of. I should say the possibility for chaos is something we should not be afraid of. We shouldn't be sitting there in fear of what might happen. We should be honestly looking at what has already happened. 
and how this is used as justifications to promote endless fear and therefore taking more and more rights away from people. In the ancient world, there were two goddesses, and they come from different traditions, and they had many different names in different traditions, okay? But essentially, these goddesses were the two teachers of humanity, regardless of what their names were, what anybody wanted to call them in, in each individual culture throughout time, throughout history. They were teachers. They were considered teachers by the people who understood what these concepts meant. These aren't real people. This is the other thing people have to understand. When I talk about the goddess, when I talk about the goddess of this culture or the goddess of that culture, I'm not talking about a real being. It's not a su real supernatural entity or a real person or being in the flesh. This is a symbolic concept. It's an allegorical concept to get people to understand something about moral teachings. So in the Egyptian tradition, and again, she had hundreds of different names in many other traditions. In the Egyptian tradition, the first goddess that I'm talking about was called Isis. And Isis was the mother of Horus. And here you see them depicted on the left in slide number 97. Isis was the mother goddess. She was the goddess of truth, wisdom, love, um, she was the bearer of the light into the world. She was the bringer of the light, the sun, the solar deity Horus. So here she's depicted holding Horus and he's uh, ready to, to breastfeed from her. She's offering Horus sustenance. She represented the night sky that gives birth to the solar deity at dawn. So she's the bringer of the light at dawn. And this represents that the sacred feminine... In other words, the emotional qualities within the being, the internal aspect, the heart and care that exists within the individual or the spirit of the individual is what would give birth to the sacred masculine child of right action, right action in the world is what Horus represented. And this is why the goddess was depicted in this image as having a green hue. You see, she's green because she's the heart. She's the color of the heart, of love energy. The heart chakra, nature, you know, the energy of nature, natural law. The understanding of natural law. Balance. She's the color of balance and love, which is green. The center, the balance point of the visible spectrum. She would give birth to the golden child. Horus was always depicted as gold. He was all often depicted as a golden hawk. The sun is the golden hawk that makes the journey across the sky each day. So he was depicted as a gold child. There you see he's gold sitting on the lap of the green mother. Because he is the sun. He is the enlightenment that is born out of care. He is right action that is born out of the care and spirit and heart of a person. It's a beautiful allegory if it's decoded properly, if it's understood correctly. <clears throat> Most people don't understand it. They want to literalize it. They want to say these are actual people. No, they weren't actual people. They're con conceptual ideas. They're allegories to teach a moral lesson about what's going on inside the individual or what should be going on inside the individual. So, Isis represented the teacher of truth. The easy way to do it. <clears throat> open up your mind, open up your heart, learn the truth, take in the knowledge, accept that which cannot be changed, natural law, understand that, and then change what should be changed, the injustices that are going on in the world. This is the easy path. You could call this the right-hand path, or you can even call it the middle path, really is what it is. It's the easy way of doing things. It's the most direct route. I would say yes, it is the middle path really. Okay, so Isis would open her arms to all that would want to come into the truth. She is the goddess of the truth. Its truth is always there, always there waiting with open arms. It's us who refuses it. Eris, on the other hand, was the goddess of chaos. <clears throat> So in the Greek tradition, 
she was called Eris, and she was the chaotic teacher. When Isis's lessons, or you could just say the the goddess of love and truth, you could look at that in the Greek tradition as Aphrodite or Athena or many other names, okay? The goddess that would teach truth, that would bring truth to people and open up their mind and heart, when her teaching was refused, then natural law would come in the Eris form, in the chaotic form. So you might know this in the uh, Indian or Indus Valley tradition as um, Kali. Kali is the mother that is in that, that is the, the chaotic aspect of the the goddess. You know, you could look at this in the Egyptian tradition as Maat. Maat would come and it was the forces of nature and natural law wreaking havoc if necessary if the people became immoral. And this is what Eris is. Eris is the teacher in the negative aspect. It's the same thing. It's natural law. We're talking about natural law and whether it is accepted and understood and lived by or whether it is rejected, not understood, and people live in opposition to it. This is how they depicted these, this boundary condition of the universe called natural law as Isis or Eris, and again, by many other names. So when natural law was n- not understood and it was refused, truth was refused, the lessons of truth was refused, were refused, and people were living out of harmony with morality and natural law, then Eris would arrive to teach painfully through chaos. She was the bringer of chaos. She was the bringer of suffering. Suffering would have to be the teacher. People would have to suffer and they would have to lose things and they would have to be harmed and and violence would have to be done to them until they understood that that was not how to truly learn and grow and progress in consciousness. That you have to open up your mind, open up your heart and learn and take in knowledge and take in truth. That really the only true real teacher was Isis. And Eris would just be the disciplinarian who would send, who would whip your ass and then send you back to the real teacher. You could look at Eris like that. And that doesn't mean she's a bad thing. Again, it's the boundary conditions of natural law going into effect when people start to be to live in an immoral way in the world. So chaos is not a bad thing. Moving to slide number 98 now. Chaos is a teacher. Eris was not a bad thing. She is a teacher. She teaches you what not to do. She's the apophatic teacher, you could say. She teaches you through the negative. Now, if you're going to put your hand on the hot stove, on the hot range top, it's going to be burnt. This isn't a tragedy. It's learning what not to do. It's saying, this is a law. This is how this law operates. You're not going to be insulated from trying to break this law. If you try to break this law, you are going to be held accountable and there are going to be consequences for breaking natural law. What humanity, unfortunately, appears to be is retarded. We are retarded. We're a retarded people. We're slow to get this lesson. That's what retarded means, having been slowed down. And I'm going to get into future episodes how we were slowed down. There's a reason that we were slowed down. We are literally retarded. We have been deliberately slowed down so that we don't get this understanding that if you put your hand on the stove, it gets burned. We're the retarded child that keeps putting their hand on the stove over and over again until the flesh melts off the bone. And then we're putting a skeletal hand on top of the burner until the burn bones turn to ash. That's how far we want to take it. Only someone who has been slowed down, made into someone, uh, made into a being that has been retarded or slowed down, would do this. No truly intelligent species would act like this. 
because this is a metaphor. This slide, exactly what you see here, is a metaphor for what humanity is. We are the child who does this over and over and over and over and over and over and over again and never gets the lesson. And there's a reason that we can't seem to get the lesson. And ultimately, it's such a horror story that we really need to, to learn it and we need to address it and we need to take it seriously and we need to understand, well, since this is the condition now, what are we going to do about it? One of the things that could help is really bringing the truth to as many people continuously over and over because while genes have to do with an expression in the physical domain, there are epigenetic conditions, meaning the condition around the expression of the genetic aspect of the being that will affect the genetics of the being. Epigenetics means that the, ex the experience that the being is having and that the culture that the being is living in is having as much of an effect on the expression of genes as, as any other aspect, as any, as any heredi as heredity. It's, having, it's just as important as the physical interactions of you know, the, the, the genetics of the being itself and arguably even much more important the concept of nurture is much more important than what's there physically. The culture, the, the surroundings, the, the conditions that are around the being, that's epigenetics. And that affects the expression even more than just what's there physically in the genetic condition. So I'm going to be talking about stuff like this in the future regarding how did we get to this condition. But that's for another presentation. And believe me, it will be many episodes that we go into that, not just one. So, continuing to correct this ridiculous notion that chaos is something to be feared, this is what holds the whole slavery system in place. It's held in place by the fear of chaos. Okay, so this pyramidal scheme that is our world... <clears throat> With all of the slaves holding up the structure, you know, then the aristocracy, you know, s supporting the structure because oh well we're, we got a little bit more than than the rest of the slave class. They're they're the house slaves, and also the house slaves are the um, police and military who who are keeping all of the slaves underneath them, you know, in physical coercion, and then you have the priest class above them, t giving people religion, and I would say that's the exoteric priest class. Then you have the kings, royalties, bankers, politicians, etc. above them, and ultimately you have the occult force that's ruling the whole thing. The real priest class. The esoteric, dark priest class. And I, I think that's a great infographic there that explains the story of what humanity ultimately is. A, sl a slave species. <clears throat> control and the control and slavery system is about the limitation of free will through the destruction of possibility. That's what the, sl the control and slavery system wants to do. Limit the possibility of what can occur, not only in the external world, but what can occur in people's minds. They have to limit your imagination, what you can think about, what you can conceive. On slide number 100, I talk about possibility and how it's related to freedom. True freedom includes infinite possibility, which by definition includes the possibility of chaos. Infinite possibility means you have to be open to the possibility of chaos occurring. This possibility must be embraced without fear if we are to tr be truly free. You cannot be free and be in fear of the possibility of chaos. You have to, uh, you have to get rid of that fear. That fear must be held in check. You can't be saying, oh, I'm so afraid that this might happen. You're not free if you're afraid that something bad might happen. Something bad might happen at any given time. A comet could be on the way to the earth right now as we speak. You wouldn't know it. You're going to live your life in fear of that? Well, chaos might happen. You're going to live your life in fear of that and say, I want to give up all my rights because chaos might happen? You're not free. You're right in the mindset they want you in. 
the controllers, right, right in the mindset these archons want you in. People who think that they're masters of other beings. Slide number 101. The fear of the possibility of chaos is the same as the fear of true freedom. If you are in fear of the possibility of chaos, that means you are in fear of true freedom because true freedom includes and incorporates the possibility of chaos happening. And once again, chaos isn't something that should be feared because it is a teacher. It is there to show us what we are doing wrong and to not do that anymore. To align our free will with truth so that that potentiality does not manifest. When people say, I can't, I can't think of a world without government, how could that work? How could that work out? It would never work out. This is what you hear. This is the death of possibility. And most of all, it's the death of the imagination. As I put forward in slide number 102. When somebody is saying, I can't conceive of how that could work. I can't conceive of how human beings could live without government. Well, your imagination is dead. That's why. That's the ultimate expression of mind control. The ultimate form of mind control is the, de- the, the destruction of the imagination. That's it. When the, anni- when the annihilation of the imagination has occurred, the person is in perfect mind control, whether they know it or not. You're never going to get out of your current condition unless you can envision something being different than how it is now. You have to be able to envision it, hold that in your mind, know that that's where it should go in your heart, and then make it happen with your actions. Not just think about it and say, oh, that's a good idea. You have to get involved and take action to make that happen by talking to other people, by organizing, by giving information to others, speaking the truth to other people. So, The death of the imagination is when somebody says, I can't imagine how that could work. You're admitting it right there. I can't imagine that. Because you don't have an imagination. And that's the actual beginning essence of the great work is the power of the imagination. It's the only way that the great work can actually come about of truth, love, and freedom. If, If we have an imagination that can spur us to be able to envision a better world for ourselves and those who come after us. When people say, I can't imagine a world without money, how would that work? Well, there's the imagination being dead again. People have to understand, this is mind control. You are still under mind control if you can't imagine something being better than what it is. Infinitely better than what it is now. If you think this condition and the, the, the institutions that exist now have to continue indefinitely, forever, that's the death of the imagination. And ultimately, it's the fear of the possibility of chaos because you're saying, wow, if that didn't exist, there might be chaos. I can't, I can't even let my mind go there. How could that possibly, how could anything work out for the better? Well, it can if people have the imagination to make that better world happen because they're holding it in their mind they know that it should come about and then they take the action to make it happen so continuing with this correction in slide number 103 through people's fear of the possibility of chaos which again we've already equated which is the fear of true freedom most people advocate the legitimacy and continuance of quote-unquote authority and government and therefore are actually actually advocating are are therefore actually advocating the legitimacy and continuance of violence and slavery which is what authority and government are once again Authority and government is the notion that some people are masters who have the moral obligate, the moral right to rule others, and other people are slaves or servants or subjects that have the moral obligation to obey the masters. And if they don't disobey, then the masters have the right to do harm through physical violence to them, or taking things from them that they have no right to take. 
taking their property or taking their freedom and putting them in a cage because they disobeyed orders by the elite class. And people have to understand, we're still under slavery. It's called free-range slavery. Chickens on a free-range farm are still slaves. They're being kept by other people. Okay, They're going to the slaughterhouse even though they're ra- ra- roaming free in fr- a free-range farm right now. It doesn't mean that because they're walking around eating some feed on the ground and, and, and they're in a relative condition of freedom in the moment because they're not physically bound in a cage or in a coop right now that that means that they're free. They're still on a farm. This is the problem. People think that the only form of slavery is shackles. is chains, shackles, ball and chain slavery. That's not the only form of slavery. As a matter of fact, the more insidious form of slavery is free-range slavery because it's more difficult for people to see and recognize as slavery. And then they support it. They become unwitting house slaves who support the continuance of slavery when they support the concept of authority and government. So, slide number 104. Statism, the belief in government and authority, is the most dangerous religion in the world. It itself is a religion. Like I said, everything I'm talking about in this presentation boils down to religion. Those who believe that authority is necessary and that it must continue have actually been duped into believing that human slavery is necessary and must continue in order to prevent chaos. That's the deception. The people who believe that authority is necessary and must continue, meaning the state is necessary and must continue, actually have been duped. They have been, and they don't want to admit that this is what they've been duped into believing. See, that's a hard thing to admit that I was wrong and I got duped into supporting slavery, including my own slavery. See, that's the thing. This is why it's so hard to take people out of the notion of statism out of the religion. It's abandonment of a religion is what you're, you're asking to happen. It's very difficult to make that happen because the person has to admit, I bought into a cult. I was a member of a cult. That's what statism is. It's a religion. It's a religious cult. It's very difficult for people to admit to themselves, most of all, I got duped into a cult. This is what I had to admit. When I had to abandon the, the ideology of Satanism, I had to admit, I just got reeled into an ideological cult, whether I recognized it or not. They don't, they don't try to call it a religion. See, Satanism doesn't want to call itself a religion, but it is, because it's something that holds us back from progress in consciousness. By the, by the true definition of a false religion, that's what religion is, religare, to hold back, to tie back, to bind. And when I was in that form of consciousness, I was held back. I was retarded. I was bound. My progress had been slowed down. It had been thwarted. I was thwarted from moving forward. That's what religion means. Statism is a religion. The belief in authority and government is a religion. It is a cult. The cult is based in violence. It is a cult that says we have a monopoly on violence. We can do violence to other people unchallenged. We also get to rule people. You see, the state is just a replacement for the king of old. You're just saying this group of people is the ki- are the king now. That's it. It's no different. You took one form of monarchy and you replaced it with something that we call an oligarchy. There's a ruling class now. It's a few people who have this magical power of having rights that other people don't have. And that constitutes a cult of violence. That's what the state is, a cult that is based in violence. And all the people, whether they know it or not, who believe that government and authority are real and should continue to be believed in and practiced whether they know it or not, are supporters of slavery. So, moving on to slide number 105, uh, you know, because people think, who believe in authority and government, they've been duped into believing that 
slavery is necessary and must continue in order to prevent chaos. In slide number 105, I answer that and I say, violence and slavery can not prevent chaos. And there's a reason for that, because violence and slavery are chaos. Violence and slavery are chaos. You go back to the expressions of natural law, and you just look at the negative expressions. Violence and slavery are born out of fear, ignorance, confusion, and control. As a result, they are chaos and evil. I don't think anybody in their right mind would debate the notion that violence and slavery are evil. But that they, they don't equate that that's what the state is. That's what the government is. It's evil. It is saying that evil can exist and not nobody can do anything to evil. We can take action and do things to p- other people, but you can't do anything to us. I mean, that's the best example of slavery and evil at work in the world. The, the difference, the only difference that exists in people is a difference in consciousness. We are all one, but that doesn't mean we're all the same. There's one true difference, and this is the level of consciousness that people are operating at. This is a real difference between people. Race is an illusory difference between people. Age is an illusory difference between people. Sex is an illusory difference between people. Okay? I understand, yes, there is gender. There is man and woman. That doesn't mean that makes... That's, that involves anything that's truly different when you're considering the person as a being. I'm not saying that there's no such thing as gender. Of course there is. And of course there's differences between gender. And those differences should actually be celebrated. Okay, I'm not that's, I'm not advocating for androgyny when I make that statement. Okay? There there's no difference between people in economic class, geographical location, nationality. These are all just ways of people to divide themselves and look at it as an uh, look at the world as us versus them. There is, however, one true divide between people that is based in consciousness, based in their understanding of truth and the knowledge of self that they have. And this divide, this difference is truly real. It is true, it is real, it is operating in the world. And for people who say that this isn't a true difference and, oh, that's just being divisive, that's being, uh, you know, dualistic. No, it's not. It's, it's saying the truth about what is. This duality does exist here on earth. It is real. It is a real duality. And it is the difference between one who supports statism and one who is an anarchist. Who doesn't believe in the legitimacy of violence and slavery called statism. I put this graphic, this meme, statism is the brilliant idea that we give a small group of people the right to kidnap Kidnap, imprison, harass, steal from, and kill people so that we can be protected from people who kidnap, harass, steal from, and kill people. Yeah, great idea. You know, because, oh, these are the first people who will tell you, oh, it's human nature that's so fundamentally flawed that we have to have government. And government is made up of human beings with that same nature that in their mind is, is fundamentally bad. I'm not saying human nature is fundamentally bad. I think the human condition is fundamentally bad and we got into that situation as a result of deep trauma. And we have to bring that trauma to the surface and understand that what we're doing is wrong and can never create order or goodness and heal that trauma at a conscious level. An anarchist, I looked for graphics of what an anarchist might look like. Uh, I was going to just take a picture of myself and put it there, but I said, no, I found this in this little meme, which I thought was infinitely better than taking a picture of, of anybody I knew or, you know, that was uh, in the freedom movement or anything like that and saying, oh, these are anarchists. Here's what anarchists look like. Um, somebody made this meme of Jesus saying, I'm an anarchist, but most of my followers are statists. And this is exactly true. Any person who's a real Christian and is really 
looking at the teachings of Christ would understand that there's no legitimacy to violence and there's no legitimacy to slavery. And if you're being honest with yourself, that's what statism is. It's the perpetuation of violence and slavery and believing that certain people have rights that other people don't have. There's no other way of putting it. That's what statism is. Regardless of whether you admit that or not, you want to admit that to yourself, it's a cult of violence that most people have been duped into joining and supporting. That's what statism is, a cult of violence that most people can't recognize as a cult of violence because their consciousness is too low to make that understanding, to develop that understanding within themselves. They don't want to look at fundamental principles. All they want to look at is the possibility of chaos. And that's why we need this. No, oh, we, need, we need violence and slavery to prevent the possibility of violence and slavery. <laughs> I mean, it's so asinine on its face. It's so logically inconsistent that people can't even hear how ridiculous it sounds. They're not even stopping to listen to what they're advocating. They're, 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 they're in 1984 duck speak, quacking out a bunch of nonsense that makes absolutely no sense thinking that they know, thinking that they have it figured out, when they haven't invested one moment, one second of deep philosophical introspection into what government really is, which is violence and slavery. Not one philosophical moment of deep introspection has occurred for anybody that still believes in the state. They bought the whole cult line, hook, line, and sinker. They bought the whole cult sale. The the the, the, the whole, um, uh, you know, uh, pitch that the state is giving them. The sales pitch. They bought it, hook, line, and sinker. This is the only true divide in humanity, and I'm going to call these people different things. Instead of statists and anarchists, I want people to understand a better way of looking at this that explains it even better because it uses the root of the word archon. It uses the word archon in the word, which would be a much better way of explaining what statism is and what someone who knows that statism is inherently illegitimate what they understand. When, when, when you use the terms I'm going to replace these two terms with and help people to understand the meaning of those terms, they get statism a little bit better, they get anarchism a little bit better. Okay, So anarchy is what an anarchist knows is the real, true human condition. This is the true way men and women are meant to live on this planet or any other planet for that matter in a state of cooperative spiritual anarchy. Anarchy does not mean without rules. This is what people think it means. They equate it with chaos. You play word association with people. You say, what does anarchy mean to you? They say chaos. Because through the mind control technique of the obfuscation of the real definition of words, if you repeat a wrong definition enough, People will accept it as the definition of the word, when in fact that has nothing to do with the definition of the word anarchy. Anarchy does not mean chaos. In fact, it is the exact polar opposite of chaos. Anarchy is order in the world. True anarchy is order in the world. Let me repeat that one more time. True anarchy is order in the world, not chaos. It is the opposite of chaos. The word anarchy comes from Greek. Okay, It's one of the words that comes out of the Greek language as opposed to Latin or, or, or any other older language. The Greek prefix an, a or an, means without or the absence of. Not present, in other words. The Greek noun archon, archon, A-R-C-H-O-N, in Greek, this would be Alpha, Rho, Chi, Omicron, uh, Omicron um, Nu. And 
That's how you would spell archon in Greek. It means master or ruler. Master or ruler. So, we put them together. An archon. Without master. Without ruler. The absence of masters. The absence of rulers. So if you give people the phrase, no rulers, no masters, the absence of rulers, the absence of masters, what would they write down? What, what word would they come back with? They would say freedom. No rulers and no masters is freedom. You don't have a ruler. You don't have a master. You're free. Well, see, there does need to be a ruler and a master, just not external. The ruler and the master needs to be inside. We have to be our own ruler. We have to be our own master. We have to govern ourself. Self-control is what needs to be learned and exercised. The reason we're in the situation we're in at, with external rulers and external masters is because we're not doing that internal work of exercising our own self-control over the one being that we have a right to control ourselves. We're not self-governing. Therefore, external governance is coming in and trying to take us over from without. Anarchy does not mean without rules. It does not mean without rules. Anarchy does not mean without rules. Anarchy does not mean without rules. That is not what the word means. It literally means without rulers and without masters. Which means there's no masters and therefore there's no slaves. Wow, what a novel and crazy concept to introduce to the world. That there should not be masters and slaves. That a master-slave relationship is inherently immoral and illegitimate. Wow, what a criminal that makes me for advocating that. What a criminal. And imagine that there are people in the world who believe and think and continue to believe and think that it's okay for there to be masters and slaves. And don't even understand that that's what they're advocating when they advocate for government. For external government. They believe that there should be masters and slaves. Unbelievable. Unbelievable at the inherent immorality of the people of this planet. They're sick. Human beings are extraordinarily ill. Now, what I like to call anarchy is depicted on slide number 108. I like to call it anarchani. Anarchani actually keeps the word archon in there. It doesn't take off the O and N in archon. And the word on in ancient Kamishan was the word for light. I mean, just think about that synchromystically for a moment. We're putting the word for light in the word because this is the light. This is the knowledge that makes one ultimately enlightened. The recognition that there's, there's no inherent legitimacy in slavery. That's, that's what real coming into true enlightenment is about, recognizing that you are sovereign and that there is no inherent legitimacy in government. That's what enlight, spiritual enlightenment is about that process of recognizing and living your own sovereignty and being not a slave. And when you put that word into the word anarchy, that keeps the light in the word. The w on means light. That's why when we turn a light switch up, we're turning it on. That's why the word on is even used to represent bringing light into a room, turning it on. So instead of anarchy, I like to call the knowledge that there is no inherent legitimacy in statism or violence and slavery, uh, that that should not exist, and that it's immoral to even advocate for the continuance of its existence, let alone help it to continue by supporting it with your action. I call that understanding anarchani. Anarchani is literally the absence of the state of rulership of external control that's what it would mean 
externally controlling other people or keeping them as slaves is not present. The word anarchy, the best definition I could give for, uh, I'm sorry, the best definition I could give for the word anarchani is the absence of slavery. Now let me just say that one more time. The best definition that I feel that I can give for anarchani is the absence of slavery. And the reason that slavery is absent is because there would be no rulers. No one is attempting to rule anybody else or prop themselves up as someone else's legitimate master because that's immoral and it's illegitimate. It's not true. No one is actually a slave to someone else, including government, including a group of people. Anarchani is the absence of slavery. Anarchani is the absence of slavery. Anarchani is the absence of slavery. So let's look at the true divide between humanity in a different sense as far as the words are concerned. On slide number 109. Statism, the believers in statism are archonists. They're archonists. They are those who advocate for the archons or the masters. They're people who are saying slavery is legitimate because mastery of other people, externally keeping other people as your subjects and you claiming to be their masters is legitimate. That's what an archonist believes. That's what people who advocate for the state, for government, for external rulership of other people, for man-made laws, are actually advo advocating. They're saying master and slave relationships are legitimate. The master-slave relationship is legitimate. That's what a statist or an archonist believes. Whether they know it or not, they are supporters of slavery. Archonists are supporters of of slavery. One who is a statist, or in other words, an archonist, is a supporter of slavery. An archonist is a supporter of slavery. Conversely, an anarchonist, one who recognizes the inherent illegitimacy of government, the inherent illegitimacy of a master slave relationship, could be called instead of an anarchist, an anarchonist. Let's put the word light back into the equation. On. Their light is on. Their, the light within their heart is on, as you can see in the picture of perhaps the world's greatest anarchist, whether it's a real individual, a group of teachers, a single teacher, or just an idea. Doesn't matter. Does not matter one iota. And I, I'm not going to get bogged down into the discussion of the historical uh, existence of Christ. Because the energy of Christ is, has moved through many, many people throughout human history. Throughout, since the beginnings of humanity. So I would say that the entire consciousness is not one being. This is just an archetypal image for what we call a higher level of consciousness called Christed consciousness. So that image to me, here on the right side of this equation, speaks volumes. The sacred heart. You know, someone who's truly come into an understanding that is heart-based. This is an anarchonist. Someone who understands there's no legitimacy to slavery. That's what an anarchonist knows. They don't support the masters of other people. They support internal mastery. They have achieved internal mastery. They're the ruler of the kingdom of self. The only kingdom we have a right to rule. And that's exactly where the teachings of Christ say that the, the, the kingdom of heaven is within. 
Because when you develop that understanding of sovereignty, the world will change and become a paradise instead of a prison. When we can get enough people to understand that on a mass scale, that there's no legitimacy to slavery. An archonist is one who knows that there is no legitimacy to slavery. Let me repeat that. An ar- an an anarchonist, I'm sorry, an anarchonist is one who knows that there is no legitimacy to slavery. Once again, an anarchonist is one who knows that there is no legitimacy to slavery. That's what an anarchonist knows. And they live their life like that. An anarchonist. Put the light back into an, 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 an ar, um, anarchist. Anarchonist. I am an anarchonist. There is no legitimacy to the archons, to the masters. Their claim is illegitimate. They are not our masters. We are not their slaves. So let's move on and finish this correction of the idea of chaos should be feared as a big new age tenet. Not only a big New Age tenet, it's a big tenet that's propagated throughout all of society. So what I say to all the archonists or the statists of this world is I, for one, and this is on slide number 110, willingly choose true freedom. I will willingly choose true freedom, even if it meant that roads may no longer exist in a post-slavery world. Oh, how would the roads be built? How would we maintain the roads? The roads! You hear people screaming about this. And why do you hate roads? Because you don't want to see government go. How would people ever possibly pave roads? Well, guess what? One, I don't care how people would pave the roads. They either would do it and figure out how to make it work or roads wouldn't get paved and they'd fall into total disrepair. I, I'd personally rather be free and not be able to move on roads with a, with a car than uh, have a car and have active roads and be a slave. I don't know, maybe I'm just weird like that. That I don't think I should give up my freedom and accept slavery for there to be roads. That's a, I know that's a really extreme out there idea that uh, uh, I shouldn't accept slavery to have roads, but, you know, I'm one of those crazy people, you know? Yeah. Secondly, the other, uh, just to not belabor this, but the other thing people, that shows the death of the imagination is that people think we actually need roads at this time. You don't think that there's anti-gravitic propulsion technology that has existed since the days of Tesla? I mean, give me a break. This is totally suppressed technology that has existed for over a hundred years. Over a hundred years. No, they don't want to get. They don't want to let that out to the public because, and so it's tightly controlled by the military-industrial complex and the private sector for you know uh, compartmentalized projects that have really taken over that level of secrecy. And. You know, they don't want to let that out because, oh, we're so afraid of national security. Oh, if anti-gravitic technology comes out and you have a craft that can hover above the ground and take people from New York to Paris in five minutes, oh, that's going to be a new weapons delivery system. So there, once again, the fear of the possibility of chaos turns into we are going to keep people enslaved. We're not going to let something that could be liberating and freeing to humanity come out to the world to better humanity. No, because we're afraid people are going to use it this way. And therefore that freedom keeps that that fear keeps people enslaved. The fear of the possibility of chaos is the fear of true freedom. I'll willingly choose freedom even if it meant that roads may long, no longer exist in a post-slavery world, even if it meant that murderers and cannibals might lurk around every corner, like the zombie apocalypse, even if it meant that I might drown in human waste because there would be no sanitation, uh, even if it meant that my home might collapse because of unsafe building conditions, or that it might spontaneously erupt into flame at any given moment and no one would come to put out the fire. Moving on to the next slide. Yes, I would rather live my life in total danger and be truly free than to exist in so-called quote-unquote safety and be a slave. Maybe I'm just weird like that, but I think uh, that safety is not nearly as important as freedom. 
I'd rather take my chances on being hurt and be truly free to make my own decisions than be a slave, than be a kept animal, a kept pet in a cage, okay, and be kept completely safe. I'm not interested in safety. I'm interested in freedom. Safety will come when people truly understand what freedom is anyway. You'll be truly safe when you understand natural law. That's what brings safety. Not anybody going out and policing the world telling me that you're, you're protecting my freedom. You ain't doing jack shit protecting my freedom. How's that? You're actually making more chaos in the world through violence. And that can never generate freedom because that's all based in fear. That's all based in ignorance. That's all based in confusion. And therefore can never create freedom. An ignoramus telling me you protect my freedom. Really ignoramus. The only thing that protects freedom is adherence to natural law. That's why we're losing it. Because there isn't any adherence to natural law in the world. We are abandoning the teachings of truth and natural law and therefore collectively we're going into a prison and we're already there collectively. So don't give me the nonsense and the bullshit that you protect people's freedom by going over and oppressing other people's rights and taking their natural resources as a paid henchman. No military individual has ever protected freedom. You want to protect freedom? You learn the truth. You learn about how natural law operates and then you teach that to other people. That's how you're helping to protect and grow freedom. Let's move on to... Oh, I'm sorry. Let's finish slide number 111. An understanding and acceptance of true freedom means letting go of the fear of the possibility of chaos. If you are still in fear of the possibility of chaos breaking out, then you do not understand or accept what true freedom is. You don't get it. Without that fear being let go of, you cannot know what freedom is. It's impossible. And if you think other people are fighting for our freedom by going off overseas, you're insane. You don't understand what freedom is. You don't get it at all, at all, at all, at all. You don't understand the expressions of natural law and how they generate freedom based upon our choices of the polarities that we work with. You don't get it. I can say that about you because I do know how that dynamic works. Because it is not about what I believe. It is a law that exists in nature that is there to be discovered. I can tell you that you don't understand freedom if you fear the possibility of chaos. As surely as I can tell you, if you walk off the edge of a cliff, you will fall down to the ground. Because that is governed by law. The movement, the, the expansion or contraction of freedom is governed by law. As long as people stubbornly cling to this fear of the possibility of chaos, they are ultimately enslaving themselves. Not only don't you understand true freedom, you don't understand how you're putting yourself into a cage through keeping that fear present and active inside of you. This is done because slavery is generated and perpetuated through fear. And again, go back to the natural law chart earlier in the presentation and study it. When you're working with the polarity of fear, it leads to um, the refusal of truth, which leads to ignorance. Then it leads to internal anarchy, which is conf confusion within. And it leads to external monarchy, which is control and enslavement, slavery. And that creates chaos and evil. Only when we stop being afraid, meaning getting out of that polarity of fear and getting into the polarity of love, acceptance of natural law, true understanding, understanding the truth because our mind and our heart is open to it because we're not in fear anymore, which shuts down consciousness, can we ever, ever even begin to imagine what it means to truly be free? You can't imagine what it means to truly be free if you are in fear. It's impossible. Only when we stop being afraid can we begin to imagine what true freedom is. 
So that's the end of that correction. Let's move on to New Age Deception number nine. Enlightenment is only about changing yourself. How much do you hear this in the New Age movement? Just worry about yourself. You know, the whole process of enlightenment, it's only about changing yourself. That's it. That's all you can and should do. And what they'll tell people, moving on to slide 113 now, is the end goal of enlightenment is to feel good all the time. The whole process is about you feeling good all the time. Never having a negative emotion. Never having a negative emotion. It's about feeling good all the time. You should never feel bad. Feeling bad is bad. There's no role for feeling for bad feelings in the body, in the emotions. There's no rule. Ro- there's no role for anger. There's no rule for being upset about injustices taking place. No, we should purge all of that because, oh, it's just an experience. There's no real right from wrong. These are judgments. These are dualisms. Yeah. The goal of enlightenment is to feel good all the time. You know what that is? That's total bullshit. (coughs) Total bullshit. Okay? Because all this is is an appeal to ego. An appeal to ego. Telling people what they want to hear. Enlightenment is only about changing yourself and the goal of it is to feel good all the time. And don't tell me that's not what the New Age movement is teaching. Don't try to tell me that's not what they're teaching because I've heard this from I've heard this from at least a hundred New Age gurus and people who propagate this notion, who, who accept these teachings and are followers of these idiots. That is exactly what they are teaching enlightenment is. And enlightenment is nothing even remotely about that. Enlightenment is about learning what the truth is, taking the truth into yourself, and then helping other people to understand it. The work begins when you take it into yourself. Then you have a moral obligation to share it with other people. And help them make that same transition that you made because they are, you are one with them, we are all one, we are all in the same situation together. So don't give me this nonsense that it's not about helping to change other people. Of course you can't change them yourself, only they can change themselves, but it is your responsibility to assist in that transformation by sharing the knowledge that you've learned and the tool set that you have learned to change yourself. So it is about taking that information to other people. And it is not about feeling good all the time. It is about feeling the emotion of anger when injustices are taking place to spur you on to right action. That is the role for anger as we've already talked about. Most of all, what real enlightenment is about is responsibility to the truth. It's about more than responsibility to yourself. It's about more than responsibility to other people. It's about, it's about more than responsibility to a whole civilization, a whole planetary society. It's about responsibility to truth. That has to come above all else, above any other allegiance. Allegiance to truth has to be first. And the truth of the current human condition, moving on to slide 116 now, The truth of the current human condition should make you feel uncomfortable. Where we're at is not pleasant. It should make you feel uncomfortable. In the movie The Matrix, Morpheus was offering Neo a choice between two pills. One represented continuing to buy the deception and the illusion and staying asleep, the blue pill, and the hidden truth that would wake him up and explain to him what had been done to humanity and where they were really at which was horrible. And he says, before he gives them to them, remember, all I'm offering you is the truth. I'm not telling you that it's going to be pleasant and that you're going to like hearing it and that it's going to feel good to know the truth. I'm just offering you what the truth actually is. Which I think is a beautiful allegory. If For people who understand the allegory, who can decode it, one slide 117. We should use that discomfort to motivate ourselves to create real change in the world through our actions. Use that discomfort of how unpleasant the current human condition is. It 
shouldn't be that way. It should be changed. Know the difference between that which cannot be changed, natural law, and that which should be changed, the current human condition, because it is based in immorality and violence, and it should not continue the way that it is going. It should be changed. We should use all of our will to change it. So we do that by seeking the truth first and taking it into ourselves and then speaking the truth to other people. It is about influencing change in other people. Slide number 118. Seek the truth, then speak the truth. We don't have enough people speaking the truth to others. They're still in fear of what other people think about them. They're still in fear of what will happen to them if they get involved and take action. They're sitting with their thumbs up their ass, doing nothing, doing nothing, because they're afraid to get involved. It isn't about listening to someone else. It is about doing something yourself. Once you get what I'm saying, I don't care if you ever listen to another word I say, get out and get involved and and teach this to other people yourself. It isn't about listening to anybody. It's about putting the word out there for other people that need to get this. More people need to be doing that. Slide 119. It is our shared responsibility at this time to help to awaken others by continuously speaking the truth unapologetically. Even if we feel burdened by this task and even if it makes all of those involved feel uncomfortable. It is about rocking the boat. It is about making waves. It is about getting up in other people's face. They're asleep. Shake them awake if you have to. Do something that totally shakes them out of their comfort level to make them see it. People cannot unhear something. It doesn't matter how closed their mind is. It's a seed that goes into the subconscious and it might sprout at some future point in time. It is your responsibility to plant that seed if you do know the truth about what's going on. And this next slide, I think, is, you know, this quote is one of my favorite quotes of all time by Carl Jung. Slide 120. One does not become enlightened by imagining figures of light, but by making the darkness conscious. Making the darkness conscious. The latter procedure, however, making the darkness conscious, is disagreeable. It's disagreeable to most people. They don't want to do that work and therefore not popular, Carl Jung. He is describing the great work, the great alchemical work to help transition people out of darkness and into light, out of ignorance and into knowledge, out of slavery and into freedom. This is the true great work, and it is done by forcefully and unapologetically putting the information of the truth before people's eyes and before their ears, whether they want to hear it or not, whether they want to see it or not. It is about making, influencing the darkness, those who are in darkness, to become conscious and awakened. That is what the great work is. It is an act of will. It is an act of will. It will not happen automatically. It is not an automated process. It is not a process that just automatically occurs with no work. It requires constant work, constant effort. It requires sustained willpower. Sustained willpower. And above all, it requires courage. Getting out of fear, courage, is what it requires above all else. That is what the true great work is. And all you need to do is look around and find and you'll you'll be you you will absolutely know that most people are not doing that work. I put the words the true great work over this quote in slide number 121. This is the true great work. And this is what most people in the world look like who are doing the true great work at this time. 
they look disillusioned. They look like they're ready to give up because this is what the people around them look like. They're totally asleep. They're totally asleep. They're not really conscious. They're not really getting the message because enough people aren't doing what the person there with his head in his hands is doing, trying to speak the truth to other people. He's awake. He recognizes other people are asleep. We need more people who are awake speaking the truth. There's a lot of people who are awake and are doing nothing. They are doing nothing. You need to get involved and speak the truth in whatever capacity that you can. This doesn't just mean to other people in your family. It means to strangers. It means to anybody that is capable of listening and hearing the message, which means do you have eyes and ears? Well, well then speak to them. Something cannot be unseen and something cannot be unheard. It is up to us to put the truth before people. It is their karma as to whether they accept the truth or not. Our work is to speak it, to learn it and speak it. New Age Deception number 10. And this is the last one. The truth does not need to be defended. You hear this constantly. Oh, the truth doesn't need to be defended. It speaks for itself. Oh, really? You want to explain to me how that works when so many people don't know what the truth is? They don't know the difference between right and wrong? Truth doesn't have a physical voice. We are the people who truth works through. Those who know it. So, you know, they say since truth doesn't need to be defended, don't ever confront anyone on their bullshit. Slide number 123. Never confront anybody on all the things they're doing wrong on their total bullshit. You know, don't confront them. No, that's confrontative. We don't remember we don't want that in the new age movement. We don't want any confrontation. We don't want people saying unapologetically, what you're doing is wrong. You should not be doing this. This is wrong because it causes harm to other people and explain how it actually causes harm to other people. No, that, that would be calling someone on their bullshit. We can't have that. That's confrontative. You know, we don't ever want to talk about the negative. Remember, never talk about the negative. Truth doesn't need to be defended as it's being totally destroyed in the world. It doesn't need to be defended. No one needs to come to its defense. It's just dying. It's being slain. It's being murdered. But don't come to its defense. Oh, uh, yeah, it'll, it'll defend itself. So never confront anyone on their bullshit. This, ladies and gentlemen, in itself is bullshit. <coughs> The correction to this nonsense, this new age nonsense, is that which can be destroyed by the truth should be. A quote by Hodgell. Okay? So, if truth is a destructive process, it's not an additive process. Truth strips away the lies. It's an acidic process that eats away at what is false. It's apophatic. It works through the negative, through the dissolving process. It takes away, it chips away at the stone like a statue that's inside of a stone. You chip away all that is not part of it. It's not additive, it is subtractive. And we are the vehicles by which the truth operates in the world. We are there to break down the lie. The lie needs to be broken down. People's ego needs to be broken down. They need to understand that they are doing something that is immoral. Not only by supporting violence and slavery, I mean, by doing the, the, the physical tasks that lead to violence and slavery through the state, through government, through the police, through the military, but by supporting it at all. Ideologically saying that you support any of that. You are supporting slavery. We need to break down that ego by continuously putting the speech out into the world that that is morally wrong and unacceptable. doesn't matter who's ready to hear it or not. It, the idea cannot be unheard. We need to create a bullshit-free zone where we do not apologize for any inconvenience that we are creating by speaking the truth. The people who currently don't understand the truth are the ones who need to offer an apology and say that they were wrong. Not us. 
I do not apologize for being vitriolic in my speech against immoral people. Immoral people. I am going to tell them at every opportunity that they are wrong. And they know deep down inside they're wrong. At a soul level, they know they're wrong. They know that they're immoral. And they want to offer justifications for continuing their immoral behavior. They want to say, oh, i got to do this for money. It's my job. This is all I know. This is all I can do. No, no excuse. I don't accept it. No one should accept that as an excuse for the continuance of immoral behavior. Wrong. If we don't put that idea out there, it will not take root. We are the vehicles by which the truth operates in the world. The truth does not have a voice itself. It is a concept. It is a law in existence, but it doesn't have a human voice. We have to be its voice. Slide 127. The universe is spoken into existence. Once again, those who are speaking... Are, that's how the world's going to become. The media is speaking the lie constantly, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 and a quarter days a year. It ne- the propaganda and lies never stop being spoken. This is why they're kicking our ass, ladies and gentlemen. We have to become the voice and the defender of truth. Yes, truth will exist. It will still exist whether we do that or not because truth is always true. It doesn't matter whether people are here or not. We can be destroyed and truth will still be. So yes, it is true that truth can never be destroyed but we can be destroyed and that destruction will happen when we refuse to be the defender of truth. When we refuse to take the truth into ourselves and then defend it against the monumental lies that are being spoken every moment of every day. We have to become a louder, more forceful, more powerful voice than the voice of those lies. And until we do that, not one thing is going to change here. We have to take up that mantle. We have to take up that sword and be a defender, a knight in the service of truth. And that is becoming a serve that is becoming a defender in the service of both the sacred feminine and the sacred masculine. You are defending the sacred feminine principle of truth and the non-aggression principle and you are exercising the sacred masculine duty of taking up that mantle and, and being that defender. Slide number 128. Never, ever, ever, ever give up. This is about sustained willpower, as I've said before. Rage against the dying of the light. Be that holder of that torch, of that flame, of knowledge, of truth, and a beacon of freedom. No matter what is happening, continuously exert your will. If you know what the truth is, you have a responsibility to continuously speak it, to continuously defend it, and to continuously bring that message to other people, whether they want to hear it or not. It does not matter whether they do not want to accept it. And and people will say, well, that's violence, continuing to try to bring something to somebody that they don't want. No, wrong. That is an obligation. An obligation. If you know what the truth is and other people you know by what they're saying to you, you know that they do not know it, you have an obligation to continue to speak it because the universe, the quality of our experience is spoken into existence. And this is why it's in a tragic mess of a state because we are not taking up that sword of truth and, and putting it into and swinging it by using our voice. That's why words and sword are, all use the same letters. People don't even look at simple things like that. That's there. That's synchromistic. It's there for a reason. The sword of truth. It's it's wielded through words, through speaking the truth into existence. 
speaking the acceptance of the truth into existence. Like I said, truth will always exist. We need to get out of the New Age religion cul-de-sac. Slide number 129. The New Age religion cul-de-sac, which is what this has all been about, shutting down the, the masculine, shutting down the sacred masculine of action. A different reality can be spoken into existence by us if we care enough to learn the truth and then develop the courage and the will to defend it at all costs. And once again, this is done by speaking the truth into our daily lives. When we do that, that's when more people will become awoken. When we, they will recognize their sovereignty. We can create a new reality. It can be spoken into creation by us, the vehicles of the truth. But we have to care enough to, to learn the truth for ourselves, to know it, then develop the courage and the will to speak it to others. That, when we do that, that's when we're going to change internally, as depicted on slide number 130. And as a result, when we understand that sovereignty and, that, and we have come into that level of enlightenment, then the chains that are binding our whole world are going to crumble, as depicted in slide number 131. Only when that happens. Only when that occurs. When we develop that courage and will to speak the truth into existence. When we do that, we'll see a world emerge that we can scarcely even imagine right now. A world based in truth, above all else, a world based in love, higher consciousness, and a world that is truly free. That's on slide number 132. And that process can only happen when we ourselves, in slide number 133, free our minds from the illusions that we have been led to believe our whole lives. When we free our mind, that is the beginning of that process. When we come out of the illusions that we have been taught, the shackles that have bound the mind for millennia, the mind of humanity for millennia, that is an internal process that is a choice. It is a choice that is based in opening our heart love do you want it do you want to know the truth is that desire present within you because that's where it has to start it has to start with that desire and that is born of the heart which helps us to free our mind and expand our consciousness that's what love is the expansion of consciousness and being open hearted and open minded enough to take the truth into oneself only when we engage in that process and in doing so free our mind from illusions will we ever break our chains and become truly free externally as depicted on the last slide slide number 134 so that is the end of the presentation I want to thank everyone for listening this far if in fact you have gone all the way and um I hope that you've enjoyed it. I hope that you've gained some understanding from it. And if you see fit, share this presentation with as many other people as will listen to it. Break it up into many parts if you have to. Listen to a little each day. I wanted to go through it and do it in one podcast. But, you know, take it at your pace. That's the whole point. So, I want to thank everyone for their patience. I know this was a really long one. And I want to say that we have to really become motivated to take action ourselves. Forget about what other people are doing or even what I'm doing. Get involved. Get motivated. Speak to other people. Most of all, speak to people who think that they're the controllers and that they think they have to do this. Because they can understand this if they simply apply themselves a little bit and stop doing what they're doing. And get out of the fear that leads them to believe that this has to be done. It can be changed even at this late time. It can be changed without even going into the horrific levels of suffering that are going to be required if these people keep pressing and pressing and pressing 
to do what they are doing. Them above all else, this message has to reach. So anybody who knows people in that position, please take this message to them and help them to understand it. So that's all for today. And remember, everyone, there are only two mistakes that one can ever really make on the path to truth. And that's not starting and not going all the way. Thanks for listening to What on Earth is Happening. We'll see you next time on the next podcast.